A few notes on our, uh, we have a few housekeeping items before we begin. Um, when we get to the public comment portion of the meeting, um, we're going to ask everyone to sign in on this form. It's, it's a housekeeping issue. It helps us keep accurate records of our meetings. Um, you'll see the, there's a yellow pad there with a pen. Please put your name, print, please, your name. I think it asks also for your address or your company affiliation if you have one. Thank you. Um, we're going to begin with the minutes. And we have an addition to our minutes. Um, everyone here at the, uh, the board, you should have in front of you the minutes of July 15th, 2013. No. You didn't get one? Oh, no, I did send you. OK. Um, has everyone had a quick chance to look at that? Yes. All right, so we're going to add that to our um, minutes to be approved. Can I have a motion? Move we approve the minutes. Second. 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 All in favor? Aye. Um, I abstain because I was not at that meeting. Thank you very much. Um, and for the minutes of November 27th and December 3rd, 2013, uh, first I should ask, is there any comment on those minutes? Can I get a motion? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. <clears throat> um, we're going to change the order on our agenda today um, from the one that you have in front of you. We are first going to see... 213D10, the renovations to the Villanova train station. And then we're going to go right into the must ordinance. That is our charter for tonight to get that done. Um, so I wanted to ask anyone who is here um, representing any of the other items are on our agenda, if they would like to willingly postpone so that they don't have to wait um, to next month. We will try to get to everything, but we're going to definitely do the must first, and that could take quite a bit of time. So if anybody wants to postpone, let me know. Okay, thank you. Julia? Yes. Uh, before you start on that, I would recommend, I, you know, it's the first meeting of the year. You probably should uh, nominate and elect uh, the chair and vice chair for the, for the year 2004. We do that at our December meeting. I th did we did do you, it again? Did, I thought you just had nominations, and did you actually vote to? We, we voted, yes. Okay. Was that taken? Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes. Thank you. Is there anything else we need to do at the beginning of the year? No, not at all. Okay. I did. But you're fine. We didn't let it start yet. Um, great. So can we have the um, applicant who is representing SEPTA? Are you back? Back. <laughs> Tell us why you're back. <laughs> so uh, Dave Falcone with Saul Ewing here on behalf of SEPTA. I'll just do a very brief intro, and then I'll turn it over to our engineer, Julie Rents from Urban. She's met with Roger, and they've discussed um, some of the issues in his letter, so I think she'd be most qualified to go through it. I will just represent that uh, since our last time here, we've been to the zoning board to seek um, zoning relief from a couple of issues, and we've obtained that. There's a decision that's been issued by the board. You all should have that. That was um, a while ago. But just to summarize, generally, we received the required relief that we asked for to adjust the space, the parking space size, um, for the most part, to the size that we requested, which was 9 by 18. The board asked that we keep some at 9 and a half by 18. Those were the spaces that we were asking for above the spaces we were losing as part of the uh, project we have here. So that was reflected on our plans. We also discussed the impervious coverage issue, and the board issued its decision that we design the um, stormwater management um, so that the runoff would be attributed to a 45% impervious surface. So they set a threshold for us to meet for our impervious coverage. We will do that um, and we'll work with Roger on that process. And then there was also one other issue that comes up in the review letter that wasn't a zoning issue but they opined on in their decision and that's the drive aisle 
which is required to be 22 feet by the saldo. Um, based on the adjustment of the parking space size, which they've approved, it creates the 20-foot drive aisle that we requested the waiver from you all. You were all, were all in favor of it, but their approval allows for that from a zoning perspective as well. So unless there's any questions for me, I'll turn it over to Julie, who can speak more to Roger's letter. All right, thank you. brought the, the revised plans with me today as well. Um, uh, as you can see um, in Julie, hang on one second. Sorry. Sue, do you want the professionals to sign in or do you already have their information? Okay. As you guys do your thing, can you also sign yourselves in? Thank you. I'm sorry to interrupt. That's okay. Um, as we go through, went, as I went through uh, Roger's letter based on the project here at uh, Villanova Station, um, the first uh, I think it's nine items, uh, eight items are, are more or less reiterating the fact that we were um, requesting various waivers. Um, and I can go through those eight individual waivers, but in interest of time, yeah, I think you guys have seen the waivers before. Um, you know, we are, the ninth item is, uh, I'm sorry, the eighth item is re uh, regarding the regulatory signs, which we are more than willing to show, add any regulatory signs that you guys would like to, to see <clears throat> added to the plan, excuse me. Um, and then the, the street lights, we have a couple uh, locations for the street lights. Um, as we are still in preliminary design, we wanted to get the parking layout finalized before we spent a lot of time on the parking spaces. However, we are looking to put street lights um, in these three islands in the new parking in the new parking stalls or parking area so that the um, new parking area can be adequate, adequately lit. Um, under the general items the or the saldo items that's I don't see any other comments from Roger. Um, the major major comment that I would say is under the stormwater, which is the infiltration testing, which I understand we need to provide infiltration testing. Um, we are, we have a, um, a firm on board. We had to get our uh, right of entry permit renewed through SEPTA or through Amtrak. They are ready to go out and perform the infiltration testing. We're hoping to have that result back within the next month um, so that we can move forward. The design that we have presented at this point is more or less what I would say is the worst case scenario that if we cannot meet the um, infiltration requirement, which I believe is a half an inch per hour in Radnor, um, then this would be the design that we would present um, as the final design. If we can establish the um, half inch per hour, I am confident that we would be able to reduce the volume um, beyond what we are already doing, which is in accordance with what the zo zoning board asked us to do, which is to get it back to a 45% um, cover, 45% uh, impervious cover um, runoff rate. rate. Thank you. Great. Um, so, how, Roger, are you then um, finding it there in compliance with your concerns? Yeah, they've indicated that they can meet the ordinance and comply with my letter uh, should the board move forward with granting all of the uh, waivers that they're requesting. Okay, Amy, did you have anything else? Um, I, there were a few comments in there. I don't think that they're, um, I, I haven't heard any response on them. So I don't know if they're all will comply or. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, as far as the, from Gilmore Associates. Um, yes, we are, but the, I believe there are six items here. There are, um, and we are will comply on all of them. The only thing that I would like to clarify is on item number four, um, under the Saldo section 255.29A 12B, that references the um, entrance and exit drives as 25 foot. Is that what you were 
were meaning there and not necessarily the drive aisle? I think it's the internal. There was probably, I'm not looking at the plans right now. Um, I can't tell the numbers on them, but I'm wondering if it was into the parking area. The, the, sorry. Is it okay to let it go? The areas over here okay. and here are both 25 feet. Yeah, Roger just alerted me that um, that's sufficient. Okay. What you have. So that one doesn't need to be resolved. Okay. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Are there any other staff concerns? The Board of Commission, uh, do the commissioners have any um, comments or questions? Yeah, um, then we, if I remember correctly, we, we had asked um, to see what the water flow was, if you, comparing that to what it had been just plain meadow. Is that correct? Pardon me? We had said that we wanted to, to um, see what the, water, what the water infiltration is if that had just been meadow as opposed to the partially covered. What, what we did is we, we went back and we looked at the, um, the infiltrate or the, I'm sorry, the, the coverage as if it were 100% meadow. Um, and we just did not have enough room to put a basin in that would handle that much volume. So what the zoning board requested that we do um, with the impervious, increased impervious coverage, currently we are at about 66%, I believe, impervious coverage. They asked us to get back to a minimum, um, the net effect of a 66% impervious site. Um, what we did is we went all the way back down to 45% impervious site, which is the maximum allowable um, by the code. And yet, what I, if I understand, she was saying is that because it was already 66%, they were willing to let them do that, but they actually went back and made it only 45% impervious. They still haven't come up to the pure meadow is that correct that that's right so the way the zoning board uh, attacked the issue was they said they did not think it was um, feasible to maintain the parking lot as a functioning parking lot and take it all the way back to meadow it, the, the disruption would be too great so they actually believed maybe even getting it back to the 45 might be too great so they set our floor at 66 which is the existing condition before we did any work but then they encouraged us, if we could, without creating too much disturbance, get it as close as we could to 45, which would be a compliant um, condition under the ordinance. So that's what we've, we've done. We've taken it as low as we can get it um, while meeting Roger's standards. That's the, the threshold was 66 or as close to 45 as you can get and to satisfy Roger. So that was how they handled the impervious coverage variance that we sought. So I guess I'm, I just want to repeat back so we're both yeah. on the same page. So what you're doing here is you're designing for a proposed condition of 45% impervious? No, we are controlling stormwater on the site as if it were only 45%. <gasps> That's what I mean. Your, your design will make it appear as if you have a 45% coverage, even yes. though you have more than that. That's correct. So the we're, difference between the 45 and what you have we're at almost eight. is mitigated. Right, so where we're going to almost 80, it's 66 now um, without our improvements, and we're going to bring it back down. I think we're 82. Yeah, 82 is proposed, 66 is current, and we're going to try and bring it as close to 45 as we can. So for your design calculations, you're assuming an existing condition of 45% impervious? For our design calculations, we are assuming an 82% impervious, but controlling the water as if it were 45 Regina, what they're doing is they're going over and above what would be necessary to do to control the 82%, and the net effect of stormwater runoff from this site will be like it's 45% impervious when it's actually 82%. So they're, they're catching more water than they need to at, at the request of the zoning board and this board. So what are you considering your existing conditions as? The existing conditions are... Um, Based on our model, we took the existing conditions as 66%. What I did is I also ran a secondary model that was 45% impervious coverage. We have exceeded the 66% and we have 
Um, I believe we have met the 45 and in most cases exceeded the 45% condition. So it's, in essence, it's like we are um, discharging water as if it were only 45% covered as opposed to it actually being 82% covered. Does it, we're discharging less water than we should be or that we could be, I should say. Okay, so let me see if I'm following this. So your proposed condition mimics what you would see if it was 45% impervious currently? Is that right? The discharge. That's not your existing yes. conditions. It's your proposed condition. The, pro the proposed... Controlled site, condition. Yes, the, the proposed discharge of, of stormwater will mimic a 45%... Uncontrolled. Contr uh, impervious covered. Right, at 45% yes. if it was uncontrolled, like it is now. Correct. No? No. It, <laughs> it appears to okay, me... Okay, let me take a it, shot at it. I'm going to take a okay. shot at this. Okay. Right now, the site is covered 60%. It's going to go to 80. When they're done, it's going to work as if it only had 45% of it covered and the rest was grass or meadow. That, is that's correct. Said. Correct. So it's going to, their numbers have to end up as if, if you didn't know how much building was on there, you'd think that there was a meadow there. But really, there's not. It's actually pavement, but they're going to make the stormwater system work so that it seems as if 45% is built, is impervious, and the rest is meadow. Correct. 45% is 45% uncontrolled. What would no, run off from an uncontrolled 45% site? The 45%? Yeah, yeah. I, 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 let me take another stab at it. So if, if this is just a normal development, our, someone comes in, and by code, they're allowed 45% impervious coverage. Okay, so that's, it's, I guess it's uncontrolled. I mean, but it's, it's 45, it's still controlled. So 45% impervious coverage, they're allowed, and they have to meet the stormwater requirements for 45% impervious coverage. Yes. Under ordinance, correct? So they're going to meet the stormwater requirements for 45% impervious coverage on this site post-development, after they're developed. And it'll therefore be in compliance with our code. I guess why I'm confused is I, I think of it as in like a delta, the change from before and after. So if you are... It's more about what your existing conditions that you're using are. So if you're assuming existing is 66%, condition just right. as it is that's what you're yes so that's your current runoff correct and you're moving up to say 80 percent yes but you're reducing it down to 45 percent that would run off without a system is that correct no it's still controlled it's just the, it's the method of calculation you use but i'm uh, saying that your your output your your output is what would come off a site that's 45 percent without stormwater management no with stormwater management. But what is the stormwater management that you're, it, you're, you're, you're looking, reducing you're, it to what? I you're, don't. you're looking at it the wrong way, Regina. The, what's happening is they're going to collect all the stormwater off the site. But the ba it's the back end of the system that's changing. It's, but, it's what is being retained in the basins and the facilities and how that's being released over time that's different. What, what's different here than what would be if they were you know, not doing this extra control. It, 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 you know, they're, they're building a larger system to retain more water and releasing it slower than if they had, if they were just designing a system to deal with the 82% 80, coverage. I understand to a degree, but I'm not 100% there. You're designing as if existing conditions are what they are, proposed conditions are... We put two, two different pre-development design criteria down. One that we had to meet for the zoning zoning board. One, the second one, which is the 45% coverage, is the preferred. That, it, that would basically be our stretch goal um, to get to the 45% impervious coverage. So if, it was we, a, if it's a 45%, then there would be no, it would be as if the other 55% was just taking the water and just going to the ground, correct? Correct. And then the 45% would just be straight runoff without any other kind of retention system. Is that right? No, no, no there is a retention system but as 40, part of this. It's not uncontrolled. Uh, uh, let me see. I think I could do this real quickly. If the site was built, they're designing for a site that's going to have 80% impervious, 
and let's say that at 80% impervious, there's 500 cubic feet per second runoff, and that's what they're going to get. That's what would come out of the site with a system in. But they're saying we're going to have 80% impervious, but you're not going to get 500 cubic feet per second. You're going to get half that. We're going to you're going to get 250 because the stormwater management system is designed to take it down. So the out the outflow will be that of a site that only had 45% impervious. So there is a reduction. So maybe if we, and those numbers obviously I just made up, but I think that shows you. So they're taking the site. Normally that site would put out, we'll say a 500 CFS, but they're designing their stormwater system so that it's gonna put out that of a 45% impervious site, which would be like 250. If that helps. But we're collecting all of it. We, we, so we have the pipes and the, the system that we have collecting the water can't distinguish between 2% impervious and 100% impervious. It's going to take as much as it can and then distribute it, as Steve said. So our system is going to collect everything. It's the rate of distribution after that. It's either going to infiltrate or it's going to be... Um, or it's not, and that's what we're waiting for our perk tests. But it's still going to collect it all. It has to. It, it can't make the determination at 45% to say, okay, well, now I'll start collecting, and the rest will come off. It's going to kind of gather it all. We're going to over-design that basin so that it can handle more. And then, it, it, again, it'll either be detained or it'll infiltrate into the ground. So it really is, has to do with the size of the basin that we're designing to collect the water that it can hold longer as it, as it then does whatever it's going to do after that. You know what the difference is between what's required and what's being proposed as far as sizing or rate? Yep. Do you so, have those numbers? Well, what is required would be, per the zoning ordinance, would be exactly what we have there today. We'd have to collect and distribute as much at the current rate as we have with 66% impervious the parking lot as it is today. The ordinance requires that you can't exceed 45%. So the zoning board said to us, well, can you get it, get it as close to, if not better than 45? We know it may not be possible. We just don't want it to be any worse than it is today with respect to runoff. So if you can make it better, that's great considering you're adding additional impervious. So because we have relief for this criteria, the requirement is really 66%, which is what we have today. But they've encouraged us to go lower, and, and we're going to take it to 45, which would be what would be required under the ordinance if this were a brand new development with nothing there. Okay, let's let that sink in for a second. Is there any other topics that anyone has concerns about? Um, I was going to then ask, um, did you take into account anything about the, the, the stormwater that would come off the, the, the law school parking lot, or that's completely separate and independent? That is right adjacent to it. That is adjacent to it, but it is um, it is not captured by the existing uh, captured by the existing system in the um, the SEPTA parking lot. Doug, that's the key. It's SEPTA, not Villanova. They they shouldn't solve Villanova's problems. They're just SEPTA. Okay. Susan, do you have something? I had a, just a couple of brief questions. Um, Could you, did you guys look at using a pervious, a porous paving there to just, to the extent that it's all impervious, little things would go toward helping with the overall imperviousness of the, of the site. I assume you're going to be repaving that. I drove it today. I had, I had a different question about that, but did you guys consider doing things like that? We did consider um, the pervious paving. We are not um, repaving the entire parking lot. Um, really, the, the area of the parking lot that we will be repaving, um, sorry, I keep wanting to show you the existing conditions. The area of the parking lot that we'll, we'll be repaving is generally down here where we're adding the new parking. Um, we'll be repa repaving p parts, uh, this, this part here, but nothing in the back portion other than the new handicap spaces. And that back portion that you're going to pave, um, there's a bunch of equipment there, construction equipment, trucks, uh, plows. Is that all SEPTAs or is it Villanova's? What's happening with all that stuff? I'm, I'm not sure what equipment is there right now, but um, uh, over here, 
I believe that that's Villanova's. That is not SEPTA's equipment. Okay. Um, and the and this three percent grade that you can't meet the um, the parking lots shall not have a grade exceeding three percent. Where are you exceeding three percent? Really, right um, in the connector. Of the, mo most of the area is going to be at about one and a half percent. I ran mm -hmm. the numbers this afternoon, um, just to to verify. In this area right here, because this inlet is sumped down so low mm -hmm. that okay. just this area leading down to there is is going to exceed the three percent. So Would, that's that's what the waiver is okay. requesting. Little problematic there because it was full of ice in, right in that very area, leading right down into that inlet today. Right. I um, the the plan is to raise the inlet slightly so that okay. it's not quite such a divot. Okay. Um, but there still we, will be a, de a depression because that is the low point of the site. That's where all of the water wants to get to, and we need to accommodate that. But okay. we can we can raise that inlet um, a little bit. And and the waiver about not putting in the trees. It did seem like in that, that there's a long strip where you, there are a few trees, and I don't understand why you couldn't put in more to try to green this up some. In uh, that long, there's a long grassy area. Right. Right between the two lots from what right I- Right in, in here. Yes. Um, I think the, the intent at this point is to put trees in each one of the new islands. Um, and then if there are, street lights in that island. Um, I don't know if, um, I'd have to check with my, um, my uh, and mechanical engineer or my electrical engineers to see if trees would, um, the trees in between the lights would interfere with the photometrics of the, the parking light and not provide enough lighting in the, okay. in the parking lot. But right. in the islands, we do intend to um, put the trees where we, where we can. My only final comment is that I, I went looking for this today. The signage, I think, Amy, you mentioned it in your traffic, right, about asking about existing signage and what's the new signage going to be. There's actually, I couldn't find any signs indicating that this SEPTA station is there and that the lot is there. And um, so, I mean, I, I don't know Villanova very well, so I had trouble finding this and how to get in there. Um, I saw the lost school signs and all that. So, you know, when she mentioned signage, I would say, yeah, you need to in, in, improve your signage. That, okay. Those were my only comments. Anything else? Is there any public comment? Thank you. Thank you, Julie. Thank you. Um, so tonight we would be making a recommendation um, for the preliminary plan, correct? Will this, we then not have to see this again? or? <laughs> You would see it again at final, but this is, they're here for preliminary But approval. this is still preliminary. It's yeah. not one of those preliminary final things. That's correct. Okay. It's purely preliminary. Can I get a motion? I make a motion that we approve it with the changes that were suggested by staff. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. Thank you. Happy New Year. Julia, did, I'm, yes. I'm sorry I didn't hear, but did that motion include the waivers or not? Yeah, she said with staff's Thank you. items. Um, I have one more housekeeping item I want to bring up now. Um, I noticed that in our packets this month, we received a lot of legal documentation. Um, we don't need that. <laughs> if there's a problem with the legal documentation, documentation, excuse me, we will ask staff to review that and give us their opinion on it. We won't be making those decisions ourselves. So you don't need to mail us the deeds and, and those kinds of things. I think that'll save us all some paper. Obviously, if there's some unique situation where it's pivotal, you know, that's fine. Okay, thank you. Actually, if I could just mention one thing, even sure. though we probably won't see the plan tonight. The Radnor Chester Road Investment LP, I think it's Peel 2911. I vaguely recall there being, uh, that being before the zoning board a couple of years ago, was it? And uh, could we have the information from what came out of that zoning board hearing if it was? Yes, I think the application that's in front of you is for them to go back to the zoning hearing board. So you're there as required by our code, 
any application that involves potential land development that is going in front of the Zoning Hearing Board, the Planning Commission has the opportunity to comment on. But didn't that go before the Zoning Hearing Board several years ago? Kathy. Hi. <laughs> uh, Julia, may I? Please. Um, it went before the Zoning Hearing Board for the parking structure in the rear. That was okay. approved. That, that was, that's the, why it went before the Zoning Hearing Board. Okay. The parking, current parking structure in the rear regarding the setback, and that was before the Zoning Hearing Board on that. And this matter, Wasn't it regarding the two houses there on the corner? No. Mm, I don't know. I wasn't involved in that if there was. I thought it was. Well, maybe it, if we don't see this tonight, the staff could look into it. Uh, but, Kath, yes. um, this is on the Zoning Board agenda for this month. Oh, okay. And we can't... Uh, I have a wedding. My daughter's getting married. The, the next Friday in the now what kind of excuse Thursday. is that Nick? I know terrible yeah. excuse. I didn't get, I didn't get my invitation, Nick, in the mail. Uh, yeah. They must have gotten lost. <laughs> all of you, all of you. Um, and then um, Mr. Gross, the owner of the property, is going to be away in Australia during March. So we really, you know, if you can get to it to make your recommendations, that would be great. Okay. Okay, we're going to move now into um, the must ordinance. We must move into the must. We're not going to do that later. Well, you were late. <laughs> sorry, Doug. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, Kevin, could you start us out and just let us know where we are in the process? That's always helpful. And um, I don't want to go through everything line by line yet, but if you could give us the highlights. Absolutely. If you recall, uh, in November, this, uh, an ordinance was in front of you. Um, I think we had a meeting the day before Thanksgiving, and we started to get into um, not this version, but a, a version that was in front of this version. Um, we saw that there were a lot of issues that were being addressed, um, concerned from a variety of different places. So we. Okay, took, what are we going to call this version? Well, we have it dated at the bottom, so. It's the should be the 12-4. The 12-4 um, version. Okay. 12-4, 2013 version. So what we did is um, we endeavored to make changes that were um, addressing those concerns that we received both verbally from this board, from the board of commissioners, um, from property owners, um, and from residents that had submitted comments um, in a meaningful way. Um, and that's what this ordinance is back in front of you. We took those changes because they were substantial, um, took those back to the Board of Commissioners at their December meeting where they reintroduced um, the, I guess, the slimmed down version of what you previously saw. Uh, the context of the ordinance is still the same, it still follows the same format, it still has the same concepts, uh, the density bonus follows the same methodologies, it just applies to fewer parcels uh, with a smaller base density. So those uh, were significant enough that we wanted to get that back in front of the commissioners to see if um, we were heading in the right direction before spending more time, more of your time uh, at these meetings going over an ordinance if these other changes needed to be made. Um, they introduced the ordinance and it brings us back here tonight. Um, at the Board of Commissioners meeting last night, they did set a hearing date for uh, considering adopting this of January 27th. Um, so we would request um, that you provide um, a recommendation in some manner tonight with, with comments if you deem it appropriate to have comments. Um, I just addressed a few things and then I'm gonna kind of turn it over to Amy because I know that there's some concerns with traffic. Um, but I just wanna highlight a, f a few things um, that have been recurring themes. Um, the use of mass transit and how mass transit affects this ordinance. Uh, mass transit is a very small part of this ordinance. Um, it's really part of the ordinance because of the proximity to the regional rail lines. Um, because we had that proximity with two regional rail lines, two regional rail stations, um, we thought it was appropriate to have an ordinance that would allow a mix of uses. Um, the density of this ordinance, uh, as I mentioned to you in several emails, is less than what is currently permitted under the code. Um, that's nothing to do with any zoning determinations that I've issued. I'm looking at straight density, what's permitted under the PLO uh, in the district and what is permitted under the uh, must ordinance with full density bonus provisions being enacted. Uh, and again, that's less dense um, than what we currently allow in the ordinance. Um, we have less building coverage under this uh, than what is currently permitted and less impervious coverage. 
Um, so we really took to making this ordinance uh, a greener version um, than what we currently have. Uh, we saw the opportunity to take advantage of some best management practices, um, so we included those in this ordinance. Uh, this ordinance also looks at a variety of uh, multimodal um, uses of transportation, not just mass transit, not just vehicles, um, but pedestrians, uh, bike trails, things along that nature. Um, we do have good infrastructure in place. Uh, the ordinance then also provides incentives to the developer to um, improve that infrastructure and to expand it um, so that we're not just relying on cars and mass transit and the bus, um, but we do have bicycle facilities um, and pedestrian facilities that would be incorporated as part of this ordinance. Um, another concern that we had heard was that the alternatives, um, this is kind of something that uh, was in the Delaware County uh, Planning Commission's comments that the alternatives that the developer would install are not around the mass transit. They're not intended to be. Uh, we want to take a holistic approach, uh, look at things, take the opportunity to require developers to start thinking outside the box um, because clearly the history has shown if you don't require a developer to do it, they're not going to do it. Just look at the PLO now. Um, so that's where we get things in lead certification, alternative energy, um, reducing the impervious coverage, increasing um, stormwater management. Those are all things that we wanted to include um, that don't deal with mass transit, don't deal with traffic, but are good um, things to incorporate into an ordinance. Um, on that, uh, I know that we did talk about the, the traffic a little bit um, and that there was a traffic uh, study of some sort uh, that was submitted. I don't think it was a full in-depth traffic um, that was submitted. I know Amy had reviewed that um, and provided you a summary of that at your last meeting. I think uh, we can have her summarize her findings of that um, so that we don't. I know I see that the uh, applicant's biomeds engineer is here. Um, he could go on probably 20, 30 minutes with a uh, presentation on that. Um, we may be able to get the Reader's Digest version um, from Amy um, to help kind of summarize where we are at from a traffic standpoint, because I know that is a, a major concern from the Planning Commission and, and the board. Great, thank you. Amy? Um, I'm not sure if there's any direct questions that you would like to ask now, or if you would just like me to summarize the information that was submitted. Well, one question I have, because we've changed to a more a tighter ordinance uh, with a smaller area. Well, I'd like to get the highlight numbers in terms of um, trip generation and uh, increased tra traffic um, over what's existing and compared to what would be allowed under the existing zoning. Uh, I'm, I don't Does that make have, sense? I, well, I don't have any information for the reduced area. All I have okay. is the information that was presented. I believe it was from October, um, and we discussed it at length. Um, I know Kevin alluded that it was a summary, but that actually was a pretty lengthy discussion where we went through each of the slides uh, that Mr. Wichner had prepared. Yes. And um, then I discussed each of the different alternatives and compared what we have for the existing compared to, um, I believe it was by right, and then looking at mm -hmm. what would happen with the density bonus, et cetera. Um, and then I also prepared a summary memorandum that I don't believe that you have in your packets. It was prepared for the board. Um, and was presented to them just with a little bit less detail than what you had in yours. Um, so if you wanted to, to discuss that, we could do that. I don't have numbers, though, for the reduced area. Um, so by the reduced area, you mean the 12-4 version of the ordinance? Correct. Okay. Since we are now looking at the 12-4 version of this ordinance, I think that's what our concern would be, to see the, what the traffic impact of that ordinance amendment would be. So how do we approach that? What would you suggest? Well, the, the applicant did not submit. Um, the Planning Commission had previously asked them to look at the traffic from the entire um, district. And if you remember, um, the ordinance previously applied to all seven parcels in the PLO. Um, I think in summary that there was a general increase if the must was built out 100% across all the parcels that we were looking at seven part um, seven trips per minute, um, which averaged one trip per minute per parcel um, in the district. Obviously, we've um, scaled that back significantly, um, and I'll go through after we get off of the the traffic the specific changes that were done. Um, but one of the the significant changes was that we reduced the number of parcels that this ordinance is applicable to. 
uh, no longer is it seven parcels, but only three parcels. So if we were at seven, par seven trips per minute um, for the district at the full build out, reducing that intuitively would tell you that it's going to be a lot less than that because we're developing under um, different regulations. We're not building out this across the board. So if we just, worst case scenario, assume that the parcels that are now included in the 12-4 ordinance were built out in the, under, the, under the new ordinance, and we assume that the parcels that are no longer included in the 12-4 ordinance are built out under the existing PLO. That's what we'd be looking at as worst case, or, or, you know, largest capacity traffic. Is that correct? Yes, just for those three parcels. So you would look okay. at the, a comparison of um, the buy right under um, current zoning for those three versus under the must ordinance for those three. Um, I know Amy reviewed it from the overall standpoint, I believe, um, and John may want to talk on this issue, um, that he had a breakdown of the trips per parcel, um, but then he did the, the total sum, and that total sum was um, the seven additional trips per minute. Okay, so I am think it's, are you saying it's safe to assume that we'd be around half that amount? This, of the seven trips per minute, or are we not able to make that assumption? I, I couldn't take a guess on that. I would. Okay. It, it, it's all dependent on the size of the parcel, and you know, sure. not knowing the specifics of that, it would be hard to, to make a general statement about what the trip behaviors would be. But do you know the size of the parcels, right? Uh, not, I, I do know them, I, not off the top of my head. Uh -huh. So I couldn't say that we've excluded these parcels and they're this size, and that represents 75% of the entire site, do you, you follow where I'm going with that? That um, yes, and we, we can make it. We can make a guesstimation based on our gut reaction to that, but we don't have the numbers yet. Exactly. Okay. We went from 131 acres, uh, the entire PLO, to 48. Um, so more than half, not quite uh, a third. Right. And also, those areas that are now no longer included could just be developed more in future because they're not maxed out. Obviously. Correct. Correct. Okay. Kevin, I have a question uh, where you mentioned uh, seven trips per minute. Is that additional trips, or is that all trips once you add in the traffic? Would there, I don't understand seven trips per minute. Where is that coming from? It's, it's actually three to five trips per minute. Okay. And but where is that do, number coming from? That number is coming from the information that was prepared by Mr. Wichner uh, back in October, November, and I had reviewed it. And um, the calculations, although we had a little bit of a difference in the trip generation, it, it turns out that it would be about three or five Is that additional, additional trips? trips per minute for the entire site if it was all completely developed to the fullest potential. That's, that's I, what we, I hear what you're saying. I know you had numbers to support it. I can't believe it. Amy, didn't you also I'm sorry. say, oh, I'm sorry. Kathy, uh, didn't you also have a projection for increased use of transit in yours? I, and, and, I did. And okay. And just to go back to that, when Biomed first came in, they had a 7% number. Then I believe you said you used a 15% number? Uh, when they originally came in um, and they were just developing it as, a, as a, uh, an office site, um, we were basing the information on what PennDOT allows from theirs, and that's a 2% credit if you do trans, uh, transit demand management. Um, and so we were giving them a credit of 2% for that, and I believe that they, they were at around 10 or 12%. Um, then they provided uh, a couple of studies that showed that you can expect you know, depending on where the proximity of the transit stations are, what kind of reduction you could anticipate from those sites. And that actually showed it could be upwards to 50%. Now, I didn't believe that, so of course I did my own research to try and disprove it and discredit it, and I had some difficulty finding things that showed less than the ranges that, of the article that they had provided to me. So instead of giving them the full potential for the transit credit, understanding the socioeconomic characteristics of the area, I actually limited them to a 20% credit, I believe, for the transit. So we're looking at 
uh, significantly less transit credit. So there could potentially be less trips. I guess my question was, though, um, that basically you have plugged in a credit for utilization yes, of transit. That's absolutely and correct. And all those numbers that we're talking about, and including the numbers that the commissioner saw last night, were based upon a credit for increased transit use based on this development. Yeah, there were there was no traffic information presented last night at the board meeting. Um, we were just discussing strictly the entire uh, general discussion about traffic. But you are correct. There, there was an internal capture, which they could uh, take a credit up to 28 I think 28%, and we limited them to less than that, to 15%. So there were a lot of limits that I um, wanted to make sure that we were making sure that we were overprojecting what could potentially occur here, uh, just in case, as Kathy pointed out, that things don't progress the way we think they will. I, so. I guess my last comment on this for now is that well, if you're skeptical about 50%, I'm skeptical about 20%. Okay. Okay. Um, Amy, one of the questions I had asked you, I think it was last month, maybe it was the day before Thanksgiving, is do we have any data on the existing conditions with regard to the, um, whether, the whether the intersections in that area are A, B, C, D, E, or F, because the seven cars per minute, per minute? Per seven, Three to seven five cars per, per minute. minute. Right. Um, if we're already at F, just makes F worse. I mean, it doesn't, it's not like, oh, it's only seven. Well, if it's already F, it's bad to add anything. Okay. So, so but I never heard, heard information on any of the existing uh, uh, conditions for, there was with a, regard yeah. to the intersections. There was a study that was done back in, oh man, I think it was April or May of 2012, the data, I believe it was, may have been June even. Uh, when they came in initially and were planning on uh, doing the office. So we do have some existing things. I do not have that information at, at you know, the top of my head right now. Um, but what I do want to point out is that, it, you know, if we do have some failing conditions here, we also don't have mitigation for those failing conditions. Whereas if you uh, approve this ordinance and it moves forward, you may, you will have the potential for transportation improvements that would actually relieve that traffic that's out there right now. Okay. And just, I would like you to keep that in mind too. That, that makes sense. The, the one consistent piece of information that I can kind of wrap my head around about this is overall density. And it's difficult for me to digest the numbers about what the potential build out is under must in terms of square feet and what that might mean and the potential build out under <coughs> existing PLO. But um, Dennis Glacken, Glacken Panzac gave us a memo back in, uh, we saw it in November, beginning of November, where they talked about existing FAR. Now, FAR is a new concept for us in Radnor. I think we're all used to talking about building height and square foot imperviousness, and that's it. So the existing FAR, existing conditions, are in the range of 0.2 to 0.36 of the buildings that are there today. That's according to his memo, and it was presented to us as part of all of our information. And so now, and that the potential FAR under the existing PLO, according to, to Mr. Glacken's presentation, is 0.58. So for the base density that Kevin's proposing of 0.5 FAR, I would agree. I mean, he says the build out is less than what it could be. I was having a really hard time making that transition. But if I believe Mr. Glacken's numbers of 0.58 is what our potential existing FAR is under our existing ordinances, and if I, you know, and then Kevin is, is saying let's start at 0.5 um, with the must, he's right. There would be potentially less density, not overall density. It would all still be more than what exists today, but in terms of what they have by right. But that what that does say to me is that we need to really strongly consider do we want to let what, what we would want the bonuses, if any, to look like. Um, because at the end of the day, more density will equal more traffic if you are like me and Skip and Kathy and I suspect others who don't really believe that the transit incentives are going to have the result that we would all love for them to have, but I do doubt them. 
unless we restrict parking to less than what would be required under our ordinance. I mean, we put a cap on it and let market forces and market dynamics or whatever you call them, uh, incentives create the incentives for transit because they just won't have enough parking. They won't be provide, they won't be allowed to provide all the parking that they would be required to provide. And if we restrict parking, anything I've read about creating transit oriented development, if you restrict parking, that's what increases transit use. However, you're, they probably will not be able to rent it to the ideal candidate because we've heard it many times in office buildings that certain types of uh, businesses require generally more parking than what we require in our ordinance. Then we should be clear that we will have people driving to this site. Yeah, that's what's going to happen. I know. So that gives us more pause to think about what, what if any bonuses we should provide. And the other issue you'll see is uh, just go to Wayne uh, for dinner time, and see how many sept a lot uh, parkies or whatever do not have hang tags. In other words, there'll be some poaching and arrangements. I think in a, a prior meeting there was testimony that the. Uh, um, Radnor Surgical Center uh, had to rent additional parking because they don't have enough parking. So just because we deal with these three parcels doesn't mean that there isn't going to be traffic and there isn't going to be cars figuring out some other way to park in the district. Just to But if the overall density is still less than what is allowed by right, I mean, it could ha I mean if, if, it, if it were developed as a by right plan, we have all those same problems and none of the mitigation. Oh, well, I agree. I, you know, I, I think that there's value in creating the mixed use, and particularly given everything Amy's saying about, about the concept of mixed use. But Kevin said at the beginning of his presentation, this latest version of the, or, of the ordinance has moved away from mass transit. He, no, I, I, oh, that's I not that's what, what I said. said. I said that it didn't move away. It was never solely based on mass transit. Oh, okay, I apologize. It's, it's been associated with mass transit, and the county is linking it as a, a, a TOD ordinance because of the proximity to it, which is why we thought that the mixed use uh, was appropriate in this location. But the ordinance itself was never solely based on mass transit and the use of mass transit. It's one small component. I think we're responding to the fact that we've all read the county planning commission letter, and they were um, very unsupportive um, in, in several of their comments, but they all had to do with transportation development, train, rail, rail transportation. And we just want to make, or Kevin was making the point that um, this is not just rail transportation. It's any kind of non-automobile transportation we would be looking for. Of course, that's, the rail is going to be the main one. But um, I know we've, we've, in this ordinance, there are accommodations for bicycles. Um, uh, is the, what was it with the bus? Car van. We have the the car share program. The car um, share. There's pedestrian facilities improvements that would be um, required of the applicant, as well as um, improvements that the applicant could take as part of density bonus provisions. Um, you mentioned the the biking parking facilities, uh, so it it addresses all of those components. Not solely intended to be just um, offset traffic through mass transit that it was never never intended that's that's something that the county has planted in the reviews and people grabbed onto that um, but that's never what this ordinance was about it, it was when the applicant first came in because they were promoting special transportation and I looked at the applicant and said what's special about the transportation I mean I, I kind of was so initially from the and it has evolved greatly in many 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 good ways since then I, I think in an ideal world for me, we would just cap this at the base density, and if all of the multimodal transpe you know, and, and mass transit uh, things kicked in, then that would improve the traffic as it exists today, which I would be very proud of that if we could improve the traffic as it exists today around that part of the town. I think isn't that, isn't that the goal of the plan, though, if they kick in with the density bonus? that it comes back to us to tell them how to make those improvements? Uh, do I have that wrong? It, no, it does. I mean, that's the, the bonuses are supposed to work, but... I, but what? You, you don't have I, faith I, that we'll I, do that? Or? I, I want those bonuses to work more than I think the resulting traffic will be, but I'm, I'm not sure it's going to be the case. 
That's my fear, but, and that we will just so. But that's net, kind of traffic. us, though, right? I mean, that you're, so you want to protect us from us? Well, it's not just Radnor Township people who would be driving to this. This, this is no, no, no. But, I'm, but I, I guess my understanding is, if we pass this, and then they want the bonuses, then they have to do offsite improvements to mitigate traffic that we control. I mean, we control the direction of those improvements. Am I am I uh, oversimplifying? You're correct. And Peter, um, later this afternoon, did issue a memo on that that was emailed to you. I don't know if you have that up um, at your desk, but J John Rice, um, you mean? No, oh. Peter. Oh, it was you, Peter? Sorry, Peter. So, th those were were concerns yeah, yeah. Um, that Planning Commission had um, and right. the board had. And Peter's addressed that, that yes, uh, you ultimately, um, there's enough protections built in, have um, say as to what improvements are installed. In fact, some of the density bonuses actually require the applicant to come back to the township for the list of what improvements would be eligible for um, a density bonus. So if the dense, so if the increase in density causes additional traffic, which causes, you know, uh, intersections to you know get rated lower or whatever then we can deny that if they can't mitigate and we have right a right to deny that if they can't mitigate to our satisfaction is that no if they're coming in with a density bonus and are asking for density bonus they have to do off-site mitigation um, right. to mitigate that that's where we have the control as to what um, that off-site improvement is and something that this body would be reviewing and making a recommendation on, and that the Board of Commissioners ultimately would then be deciding, does that improvement um, pass the muster to uh, justify the, the density bonus that would be gr granted? And if it doesn't, then they deny the density bonus and the applicant either comes up with a new alternative, um, a new set of improvements, or they don't get the density bonus. Okay. You know, in the Oh, but well, just one more quick. What three properties? Are, were they, what are the addresses again? It's 145 um, King of Prussia, 175, and 201. I'll, as we get through the ordinance, I'll pull up an aerial and can, can show you those um, in proximity to the rail stations. Um, and before I get into that, I did want to address something that, that Susan touched on, with the floor area ratio. It's not a new concept. Um, it's not new to Radnor. Um, it's a new regulation that we're now regulating but floor area ratio is, is inherently built into the code. Um, comparing what exists out there now to what this ordinance allows is comparing apples to, to oranges, really. Um, you can compare uh, what exists now versus what ultimately is built. That would be a fair comparison. Or what you compare apples to apples, what the code allows to what this ordinance would allow. The code allows a floor area ratio of 0.9 this ordinance permits a floor area ratio of 0.8 at the maximum. 0.5 is the base, 0.7 with one density bonus, and 0.8 with a second density bonus. So the floor area ratio currently under current regulations allows up to a 0.9 floor area ratio. Kevin, where, where, where is that regulated? I've, never, I've just sure. never seen the term before in our Well, it's, it's not in the code, but underlying, you built, it's built into it. You have a building coverage of 30%, that's 0.3 you allow three stories. 0.3 times three is 0.9. But that's point, that's building that, area coverage of 30% of the whole property, right? Correct. And I that's what a floor area ratio is. It's, it's the ratio of the square footage of the building to the lot area. And the building coverage is the... Okay, 0.3, 0 0.3. Um, 0 .3. Do you all wanna go start now and just go through section by section and, and see where we are with the ordinance or would you like to have public comment first? I, I have a question first. I'd, I'd like uh, to get a feeling of the board whether or not we are for, as you know, the majority for uh, allowing bonuses. Can I ask a question about the bonuses first before we even. Uh, if the density bonus is taken, does that then increase the allowable parking, or is the allowable parking based on what's allowable without the density bonus? The allowable parking is based off the square footage of the use. So each use that you know it would be specific to the application. Um, and you would be capped at 105%, so there, there is a built-in cap. Um, it also allows a reduction, 25% um, or more, if um, it's so desired. Um, but it's based off the square footage of the individual use. But the individual use with or without the bonus? It would be the total square footage. So if the 
um, square footage of the use expands due to a density bonus, um, then the parking would be there to accommodate that additional square footage. I have a question regarding the density uh, uh, bonuses also. It's, it, it, maybe I'm missing this, but it, it appears that um, while the, the, the things that the applicant would have to do to qualify for a bonus appears to affect or, or to mitigate traffic, I, I don't necessarily see that this is directed to the area where we're most afraid that traffic is going to increase, which is this area that we're talking about. So at one point it says, <clears throat> I think it's a, under alternative three, subparagraph two, the applicant agrees to construct off-site road improvements at a specific location within the township, said improvements having been identified by the township. Well, they could be anywhere. They could, well, they could be a couple of miles away. I, what I'm, what I'm driving at is, shouldn't they be, if there's, shouldn't all of these things be directly controlling the situation immediately within the traffic issues that, that would concern the biomed site and that entire area right around the biomed site, not some other place in the township? This is how it would work. An applicant would come in um, and meet with staff and say, this is, you know, we want to do a project under this ordinance and we want to get a density bonus um, and we need to do these alternatives in order to be able to fulfill that. What we would then do is take a look at um, the impacts of what the specific use was and how to best mitigate that after looking at um, preliminary traffic studies and develop a list of improvements that then would be eligible um, that we would then provide to the applicant um, so that they would be eligible for that density bonus and the applicant would then be provided from that list. So we would be looking at the specific site being developed, the specific issues that we're trying to address, and then develop um, a list of improvements um, that would affect that immediate area. Obviously, the first application coming in, we're going to be in that area. Maybe the third application or in future years, uh, we expand this ordinance to include other parcels you're not going to repeat road improvements in the area that you've already addressed the traffic. No, so I that's where that. you start to then go out beyond um, maybe the limits of King of Prussia Road, maybe it's down Radnor Chester Road, um, maybe it's at the intersection uh, of the Blue Route and Lancaster Avenue. But there has to be a nexus, as I understand it, there has to be a nexus between the property that the applicant is uh, dealing with and the, and the proposed improvements that the uh, township wants. Not, not you can't, you the, can't go too far afield or you lose that connection. Not under the, um, the density bonus provisions under a base ordinance, which is why we, you know, the density bonus provisions were added so that we can get off-site mitigation. Um, under the base density, uh, even under conditional use, you cannot require um, off-site mitigation. Um, that's the um, importance of having the density bonus provision so we can uh, start to address these. Um, even under base density provision, there's only limited road frontage that an applicant would have to be able to do improvements. So then the density bonus provisions allow us to start to radiate out from the site. And obviously staff is most concerned of that area and addressing those areas. So we'd be looking at those areas first. And as we address those as subsequent applications come in, then we can start radiating out from there to address <coughs> further and further and looking at it more of a corridor approach as you get three, four, five parcels into this um, hopefully that we can, you know, in five years we're back expanding this out um, because you've all seen the wisdom of the density bonus and the off-site improvements that we were able to mitigate and improve the, the traffic that currently we, we don't have any opportunity to do. Well, okay, I think I get your drift, but my, uh, my point is, and maybe we're talking past one another, is the enforceability of such a regulation. I think you're making certain assumptions that may, maybe you shouldn't be making, but I think for the time being, as far as this ordinance is concerned, because it deals with a specific area, then perhaps the bonuses should be directed that they, that they will mitigate the traffic as affected by the proposed uh, uh, density bonuses let, that are being yeah, sought. I'll let Peter talk about the enforceability because it's addressed specifically in his memo. Um, regarding the area, obviously any improvements that um, or a list of improvements, alternatives that staff comes up with, the applicant would then start to develop. They're going to be in front of you, multiple steps. Um, you're going to have your say and give your recommendation. Ultimately, that recommendation is then passed up to the Board of Commissioners that would then be approving that. So we're not doing things in a vacuum. 
um, you would have a lot of input into that. And ultimately, staff's recommendation, um, this body's recommendation goes up to the Board of Commissioners. Um, you know, obviously, we have an idea as to things that we would like to see done. Um, Steve and his guys are out there at the police. Uh, and then well, our maybe consultants. I can just talk to Peter about it at some other point in time. I think we're, if Peter thinks it can be enforced, we're fine with that. You know, in terms of. Yeah, I mean, it, it, yeah, I can talk to Mr. Lord later. Uh, if he wants me to address it now, I can, or I, we can talk about it later. That's fine. Um, Kathy had had a question. Do you want to repeat your question bonuses. about the bonuses? Yeah, I, I was wondering uh, to get a general feel of the board how we feel if any density bonuses should be given at all. I'm sorry. Um, well, without having gone through our final look at what they would be, I want I could say that I'm not They're opposed pretty to, much the same as before. Then I, I'm not opposed to the idea of bonus densities. I have some other issues. But okay. the, the way it could work, I'm I'm not opposed to that. All right. Anyone else want to volunteer? I, I would lower the numbers, but if that's the way to get the traffic, you know, the traffic improvements and the signalization that Kevin's talking about, I, I think we're obliged to have them in there. Um, but I would lower what the overall numbers and could we'll get be. To that. Yeah. yeah. Dude, I'm kind of in the same position. I feel like we're whistling in the dark a little bit, but I also think, listening to what Kevin's saying, and, and I think we're, I think it, it has certainly positive aspects to it, but I, it's hard to envision its full implement, implementation. That's the issue that I think we're all having. But I guess we have to make a decision as to whether or not the concept is a valid concept, to try and tweak it from there and okay. there on. Mm -hmm. I would be more supportive of the density bonuses if they didn't allow for an increase in the parking. Right. I, I feel like that, you know, this was proposed to us very much, like you said, as a way to deal with traffic. So I'd love to see the bonuses have more impact on the traffic of King of Prussia Road and the impact of those of us who have to get to the Radnor school systems on a regular basis, especially, or to our homes or things like that. I my problem with this from the beginning has been the density and the traffic. Uh, I think a lot of the items that are supposed to be done for bonuses are not affecting traffic at all. For example, a green roof, which is very nice, and I could see that helping with, sure. you know, uh, impervious surface and things like that. But it's not going to do a thing to remove a car off of the street. We're still no, going to have the same traffic benefit, there yes. right. on there. Sure. So I think. If you're even considering density bonuses, and I personally am against density bonuses, because I think it's dense enough considering the traffic that's there. Uh, I'm looking at the road system as it exists and what could possibly be done to it other than tweaking uh, signalization and maybe putting an additional turn lane in. The bridge over the, uh, that carries the railroad tracks is there. It's not gonna be widened as far as I know, because. Most people are against it being widened. That's the bottleneck. You have basically two intersections, one at Lancaster Avenue and uh, um, where the hotel is currently, and Radnor Chester Road. Um, that's it. And all the traffic coming off the blue route and east and west on Lancaster goes through those intersections to get to this whole industrial or uh, business park area for all the properties. So I think we're really looking at a minimum amount that could be done to lessen the impact of the traffic, which is why I'm really against uh, allowing more people in there and therefore more cars. Yes, some will take public transportation. Maybe some will, you know, buddy up and ride in cars and so forth. But I think knowing what we've had there over the past 20 some years, 30 years, knowing what developers or what people who rent those properties want in the way of parking, and we've heard it many, many times in here from different developers, they're gonna want a certain amount of parking. And if you have parking, you're gonna have cars going to the site. If you don't believe that, I got a bridge in Brooklyn to sell you. But, um, I, I really cannot see how basic intersection changing is going to change the traffic there. Okay. Kathy, I, I just want to address that density bonus issue because it's, it's, not, it's a little misleading. It's an increase in density over the base density of the ordinance 
as it's proposed at the 50%, but it's still less under full build out with all the density bonuses, the density is still less than what currently can be built in the district. So we're saying it's a density bonus, but implementation of this ordinance provides for less square footage than what is currently permitted in the PLO. So you're, by adopting this, you're getting less traffic, less intense development than what is currently permitted. So the only way to get the density bonuses and why they're important is so that we can start addressing the off-site improvements. We can't do that under current regulations. The current regulations got us into what we have out there now, overdevelopment, development in accordance with the code that has gone unchecked. This ordinance addresses all of the sins of the past and allows development that is less dense than what currently we allow, but then requires off-site mitigation. Does it address all of the sins of the past? No. Okay. <laughs> Well, I, the seven I really like. May have, but um, I the like the mixed gonna... use, and I think that would help. Uh, I'm very much in favor of that. Uh, I just am very, very concerned about the traffic. So, have the traffic counts and all of the the amount of cars per hour been based on all of the properties being able to meet these bonus or get or receive these bonuses? In other words, you know, if we have seven cars per hour when they're at the base, are all of these traffic reports run? Because some of these things. Most companies, if they have the money to build, they're able to meet these without blinking an eye. So, you know, how the what, traffic reports What was done um, under the seven parcel scenario with the seven cars, seven additional cars per minute um, for the entire district was that they assumed the highest trip generation uses with all the density bonuses. So they maxed out the highest trip generation use, which I believe is office, um, at the maximum percentage that the ordinance allows. And then to achieve the total permitted square footage, then they went to the next highest trip generation, which was retail. And then they went, once they maxed out that use, then they went to the third required use, which was then, I believe, residential. So they assumed full density bonus provisions to be built out, um, but did not factor in any of the improvements and what that would look like um, to improve intersection delays. Um, they just looked at the trips that were generated um, to and from. And additional one trip per parcel I don't think you're going to notice it as you're driving through the corridor. Okay, Skip had something he wanted to say. You know, I do appreciate the fact that this version, the 12-4 version, starts the base uh, density out at 50% uh, or 0.5. Um, unfortunately, the first bonus is already 0.7, and the second bonus is the bonus that was before, which was 0.8. So the evolution didn't go much further than at base. Uh, I personally think that both the 0.7 and 0.8 are too high. And um, I still have concerns about um, how the trip generation numbers were calculated, as you've heard me say earlier. And secondarily, how we enforce the uh, traffic mitigation measures. One thought that just occurred to me while we were talking here is that um, a different way to do this would be to do a percentage of the cost of development as an additional fee that the township would then have discretionary control over those funds to make improvements as needed to fix the problems right in that area. And I don't know if that's something, Peter, that we could do or not. I mean, like 30 years ago, you had to do 2 or 3% of your development budget in the city of Philadelphia for art. So um, can we do a fee instead of a list of possible things? There's, there's actually an Act 209 that out, is out there would address something like that, but um, you don't have, uh, you haven't undertaken the Act 209 and followed through with that. Um, and, and I'm not saying that you would do that, but I don't believe that you can ask for fees. They can give you fees in lieu of, but I think what you're asking is no different than getting direction from the applicant on the improvements and agreeing or not agreeing to the improvements. I think the fact that you have control over what those improvements will be and where they are allows you that discretion to where those improvements are going to be. And they do not need to be adjacent to the site. They, they can be used I guess I'm solely to the satisfaction of the township. And, and it I'm just, concerned and it, about the gray area. Peter, from your memo today, you use the example, if they want to paint a crosswalk, you could reject that. And if they propose a quarter of a million dollar improvement and you say, no, I want 275, they can fight you in court on that, so to speak. So there is a big gap between the $5,000 event, or if it's that much for a crosswalk, and the quarter of a million. What I'm trying to suggest is we seem to be buying into a lot of gray, and the horse is out of the barn. The traffic will be terrible. 
and the, unless the mitigation is really on point, it's going to be worse than it is today. And but I just the, don't. The, at getting a fee, I don't think would address that. And furthermore, getting a fee and then having the township do the work is. It, it's going to be much, much more expensive because there's a lot of laws we have to have to deal with. I'm not saying it has to be that way, but I noticed that we suddenly have a park and rec fee for every development, and it just struck me that that might be a way to get it to be more substantial. Maybe you still have the developer do it, but they have to operate out of a budget, and then you direct the budget. You're, you're just Getting the fee or getting a, the, the the working kind, you're, you're, there's no difference. I'm trying to get a, a measurement. I'm trying to avoid five crosswalks and instead get three major improved intersections. If you know what I mean. There's I, I want to avoid the gray. If you had a percentage, but that's that's on our that's but that's on our that's that's, that's, up, that's up to, up to us. our discussion. Yeah. Yeah. I mean Let, our discretion. Let's conclude our general comments and. Are you going to answer the question? Right, yeah. You're going to talk about something I mean, else. If we don't control ourselves, yeah, I agree. We're going to conclude our general conversation because I will only get to public comment before we get into more of these details. Is that okay. all right? Yep. Okay. Thank I'm you. I'm not done. All right. No, the, you know, Doug wants to yeah, say something yeah, also. Yeah, yeah, just the last. So I'm in favor of the density bonuses. I'm okay with those. You know, maybe slightly less, maybe 50, 60, 70, or something to that effect. I don't think we should monkey around with the parking. And I mean, we either give it to them, we don't give it to them. I don't want to give it to them and then tie their hands. And if we do that, there's a lot of other issues we're going to run across because people will come with the cars. I agree. And then there's all kinds of other problems it'll create in the neighborhood, which I don't think we want to go down that road. So, plus, I guess I'm finally uh, seeing, I'm starting to see the light here that if we pass this, at a max build out, it's better than we would have now. Plus, we have controls, at least from the 50% part going for up. We have control, more control and more uh, mitigation, and it's better than what we have now. So uh, I'm concerned about the traffic, but it seems like what we're getting is, uh, is substantially better from a traffic control standpoint. It's no worse, plus we have control where we don't have any control now. So. My... my comment about here it, it, all of this I mean we're talking about traffic I, we're going to be dealing with traffic forever whether we have a lot of density bonuses or not eventually this stuff's going to get built up um, I would think that we would really want to focus on on what mitigation strategies there are in in the general vicinity I, I, to me I, I look at not just the must ordinance but the the area that that is currently by the the Radnor Financial Center and and over along the tracks and the Radnor Corporate Center behind all as being one kind of office business kind of area and the two are there's a blockade between them which is the right of way of the railroad tracks and to me I, that that is the single biggest obstacle in terms of dealing with traffic I don't know how we would go about doing that if our objective is to is to not significantly increase um, traffic on King of Prussia Road when it becomes president residential when you get past Matson Ford Road. I think we can do that, but and that's not this ordinance particularly, but that's that's something that that in a, in a in a more strategic perspective we need to talk about. And that's I don't know how the bonuses help that, but I don't know how they hurt it. Thanks. Okay, we're gonna go to public comment and then we're going to go to um my, my thought is we would then go through the ordinance section by section, and all, all the things we've discussed will come up again, but we'll be specific to um, making a recommendation of some kind to the commissioners. Okay. Um, you want us all to sign in? Yeah, please, would everyone sign in when they come up? Again, we're, doing, we're starting that to help with our bookkeeping and so we don't spell people's names wrong, which is rude. I'm going to ask everyone um, who is um, representing uh, the properties in this section to keep their comments at 10 minutes and for the general public to keep their comments to five minutes. Okay. That would be greatly appreciated. Sure. Thank you. Go ahead. Um, Julie, I have John Wichner here from McMahon and Associates Traffic Planner. I think he has some uh, information you have not heard before, and I would like to present that regarding traffic generation and what density bonuses mean and what the mitigation factors are. 
one thing to keep in mind is if we don't have the density bonuses, to be honest, I, I don't see a developer developing. Um, for instance, uh, under the 50 percent area that that's Kevin's drafted, the office space for Biomed would be 264,000 square feet. They currently have more office space than that, and we acknowledge that office is obviously the, the highest traffic generator. So even though the mixed use is a great idea, I think everyone's in agreement with that, if you don't have these density bonuses, no one's ever really going to use the ordinance. But John, if you want to step up and... Sure. I do have a quick PowerPoint uh, presentation just to get some information up on the screen. Did you sign in? <laughs> Thank you. This is my new job, to get everyone to sign in. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, McMahon Associates, John Wichner. So there is some information that, uh, and I know I've been in front of the Planning Commission numerous times, um, you know, some truncated uh, presentations, some lengthy presentations here. Um, trying to back up. But I, I do want to uh, discuss some of the key points that Amy was hitting on that the Planning Commission had questions about, um, that, that Kevin had mentioned about, and also some additional information um, uh, that we have uh, come up with since the uh, creation of the, uh, called the December um, must draft, which, which now brought the base density down to 0.5 uh, or 50 percent, with the bonus densities now being required for uh, 0.7 and 0.8. Um, there was a question uh, before, and, uh, and I don't want to go through every single slide here because I know time is of the essence here, um, but we took a look at the macro analysis for all three parcels and then a micro analysis for just the biomed uh, parcel here. And, um, so what I want to do is talk about the three, the three parcels. We have existing conditions um, where going through the typical uh, methodology, and <laughs> this slideshow is moving on me here. Um, so we go through the typical methodology uh, discussed with Amy Kaminsky, approved with, uh, by Amy Kaminsky, and talking about different um, uh, industry accepted uh, methodologies here. Existing trip generation for the three parcels uh, for the morning peak hour, 992 trips, 951 in the afternoon peak hour. Just trying to set some ba uh, baselines here. For the 50% baseline under the must ordinance, what this now does is it takes a lot of the office space, a lot of the office space out of the equation, uh, a lot of the office space out of the equation, and, uh, and starts to replace it with residential, with hotel, um, uh, with retail components that generate less trips than the typical uh, intense peak hour trips that office space generates. Now, as you can see here, uh, for the same three parcels, clearing the site, uh, complete raise and rebuild, we're looking at less than 800 trips in the morning, a little over 800 trips in the afternoon. Uh, going through that same methodology, a little over 1,000 trips in the morning, a little over 1,000 trips in the afternoon. And we're going to kind of summarize this toward the end. And of course, the 80% the uh, bonus densities are, are, are slightly higher than that. If you go into an overall uh, trip generation comparison, Again, if we look at the existing trips under the existing ordinances, uh, I apologize. I don't. I don't know why this is moving on me. I apologize. Um, but again, the fifty percent baseline trip generation is almost two hundred trips lower than the buy right under the ordinance today, and uh, over a hundred trips lower versus buy right under the ordinance today. What starts to coincide with uh, the, the revised must ordinance is now 
after you get past the 50% uh, baseline, you start going into the 70% and the 80%, that's where it starts to kind of align with where these trips are now uh, above the existing uh, ordinances. So under the under the 70%, now we're above existing in the afternoon and in the morning and the afternoon. At 80%, we're above existing, and that's, that's some of the basis of why uh, the bonus densities trigger beyond the 50% uh, that we talked about. So uh, what I want to do uh, again is is then take a look at a micro analysis of the biomed site. Um, and there's, there's some information on here um, that has been shown before, and I'm actually going to, uh, on the fly, kind of do some, addi uh, some additional um, calculations here just for the benefit of some previous conversations here. The previously proposed plan that we were talking about a year ago, and I know that plan is off the table, but, I, but there are some key points to that plan uh, that are shown here. Uh, the previous plan, 100% office, 875,000 square feet, generated almost a, almost a thousand trips during the morning and almost a thousand trips during the afternoon. Again, that plan is off the table, but the, it goes back to some comparisons I'll make pretty soon here. The next highest uh, trip generation, obviously, is the, is the future development at the 80% uh, with the bonuses, down to 667 in the morning, 643 in the afternoon. Then, uh, for this particular parcel, then comes the, the next highest trip generator, which, which is the buy right plan. 100% office at 475,000 square feet of office. This is where the conversation about density um, starts to maybe not match with the actual mix of uses um, that this ordinance uh, contemplates. We could have 2 million square feet, but if it's the wrong type of use with a higher trip generator, that's where you start getting into some problems here. So a buy right, 475,000 square feet, generates less trips than something that's, um, that, that's uh, I'm sorry, generates more trips than something that's 822,000 square feet. Beca yes? I just wanted to make clear that, to make sure I understood what we said before. Um, the future de development with the bonus is at 0.8. That's the highest number apart from the original plan. That's at 667. That's correct. The buy right would be 620. That's correct. But that 667 is going to come with all those mitigations. That, that's correct. Absolutely. So that's why we were looking. Okay. Right. And so, um, yes, so the, the, the point eight comes with more additional trips with uh, additional improvements. Can I ask a question? Because yes. I've been asking this before. Does that mean that the future development point eight has the transit factor in it? Well, I did some calculations while, while you were discussing, um, I think, some of your concerns about transit. I'm trying to make an apples to apples comparison now. We've now brought the transit capture back down to uh, 7%. We were at 15%. Um, it was uh, approved by uh, Gilmore. It was supported by SEPTA. It, it has been previously approved by PennDOT. Um, it, it, it's actually seen in another biomed project in New Jersey where 15%, it, it is the number. But now we brought that back down. Let me revise this number now here for you. Instead of 667 in the AM peak hour for the 0.8, we're at 717. When you say 717. Oh, with the, with the transit reduced with the, from 7% yeah. to 15. That's, that's correct. With the transit reduced from 7% right. so to 15. I, these numbers aren't in the, in, the, in, the, in the spreadsheet here. So the spreadsheet, it's Amy. Um, so the spreadsheet <laughs> is based on the 15% that we had previously agreed upon, that's correct? Right. So what we're seeing there is the maximum reduction we would see, which is far less than what the industry standards show. That's, that's correct. Okay. The, the numbers I'm talking about here are just um, calculations in the back of the room uh, since the meeting started. But and, what, and the buy right has no transit modifier. The, the buy right has this as a 7% transit capture that's seen, uh, that, that's seen in counts at, uh, at the, the high speed line um, that we've done. It's also seen as a general uh, all office use um, throughout the country. But you. Um, you lose the internal capture because there is no internal capture when you have that type of facility based on office workers. You need to have mixed uses to have those internal interactions. Right. So that's why you get a little bit more credit when you move into the mixed use. Right, and, that, and, that, and that's, where, that's, where, that's the difference between what was previously shown as a 7% transit when we jumped up to 15%, um, the residential portion 
um, uses the transit more than the office portion. Uh, those types of uses, the mix of uses is really starting to kind of create that dynamic of what the ordinance is trying to do. Um, the other revised numbers, just to, trying to keep it simple here under the weekday morning peak hour, the 70% uh, with a, a reduced transit based upon the previous conversation at the meeting goes from 590 to 634. So it starts to mirror, again, what the ordinance is, is, is trying to do is having the 50% as a baseline and anything above that triggers those bonuses. Um, and of course, the, the 50% uh, baseline is, is 440 with the uh, approved transit reduction with a less conservative or, or a more conservative transit uh, reduction that, that you were speaking about earlier in the meeting. Uh, that number is 473. So again, 470, 473 trips is significantly less than, than the 620 uh, as by right. So this is it, try, just trying to do a, a micro assessment here that, that basically says, the baseline, um, the, the, the baseline is, is less than by right, and when we start to hit those triggers of the bonus densities, which start to creep past existing, they come with the required off-site improvements, and, I, and I'll get to some of those in a minute here. John, I'm sorry. I, the one piece of information missing off of this, this is what is the existing today? Right. To, to, we, the, and I, recognizing it's not at all fully developed or even leased out. Right. I know that. The, the counts that we have from May of 2012 uh, show approximately 200 trips during the morning peak hour and 200 trips in the afternoon peak hour, uh, which is basically a 40%, probably less than 40% occupancy of that building right now. And the other thing is that um, the ITE trip generation tends to over predict what the trip generation is going to be. So it's really hard to compare the trip generation information that we're pre being presented with tonight and compare it to what's at an existing site. Okay, let's let John wrap up and then we'll have him show up more questions. Let's. So going into what the, some of these bonus uh, densities are going to be required of any parcel that decides to or that chooses to redevelop under this ordinance. Uh, the density bonus program, uh, transportation related requirements, and I know there was a mention about environmental uh, related in, uh, requirements as well. Um, again, just to achieve, uh, in order to achieve additional levels to go above existing trips, it will be required to perform transportation-related off-site improvements. In order to obtain the highest uh, development level of the 80% of the or the 0.8, the way the ordinance is structured right now is that any parcel uh, would be required to perform upwards of 16 different improvements. Um, now, some of them are some lower hanging fruit, um, but again, the way that the ordinance is structured, there's a category one and a category two. Uh, the, the way Kevin wrote the ordinance is that, the, that there are requirements to choose category one improvements, which are costly. Um, they are physical roadway improvements, and those are, are seen by uh, the, the everyday driver. So um, I do want to go into, um, again, by right does not require any offsite improvements, whereas the ordinance does. Um, the other uh, types of improvements that we were talking about, um, adaptive signal control technology and other, other types of, of, of improvements are shown in a post-implementation study. Uh, in fact, over six studies that, that I had received from PennDOT uh, from this district show that a range of 38 to 62 percent improvement or reduced average delay through a system with this type of technology um, uh, with, for the traffic signals. Something that uh, the, in this study area, we're looking at 10, 12 traffic signals. Uh, each, come with a, each come with a price tag and each come with uh, creating that system that has now re, uh, improved travel time through that quarter from th between 38 and 62 percent. I, I do want to try to wrap it up here. I'm going to jump through uh, uh, past a few slides. Benefits of, of the TOD, we can go through you know, the, the theoretical, but I, I do want to talk about um, 
a couple of things in terms of increased uh, transit usage. I know I, I may not convince everyone with 15% with usage, but I know that there were some previous comments uh, from other property owners that say uh, ex existing usage is between 12 and 20 employees on a particular day. You know, we have counts over at uh, the high speed line. Um, you have 455 boardings, th almost f uh, 400 alightings. Um, morning peak hour, 100 people using that, uh, that, that, that train in the morning and, and again in the afternoon. At the Radnor station, uh, almost uh, total over 1,000 um, uh, rides from the transit station. So that, those stations are being used. Um, again, you know, we've seen industry standards greater than 30%, upwards of 50%. 15% has been approved by, by, by Gilmore. We've seen 15% uh, in a real life study um, uh, from Biomed. Other consultants in this room have used uh, 15% at, and, and has been approved by PennDOT. So, uh, and SEPTA approves uh, or supports uh, the use. Um, I wanted to jump through a few other slides. Random photograph at the Norristown high speed line, uh, off peak hours on a Tuesday in August. I, I, five five different individuals uh, in that particular picture using that uh, um, using that station um, interaction again the mix of uses is what really drives um, uh, the the um, the the benefits of this ordinance. Um, I want to I want to jump through. This is again a study area that just shows the the 10 to 12 traffic signals that that could potentially be part of the mitigation. I mean, we talk about you know can an improvement be far off in the township at the discretion of the township? If if that improvement has been a hurdle uh, historically for the township that the, the township decides to use that money for that improvement, that that may be it. But what I would do. Uh, you know, when coordinated with Amy is suggesting improvements very close to the area and, and in my mind, Lancaster Avenue and King of Prussia Road are the ones that, uh, that we would focus on um, through this quarter here. Uh, and again, 75% of the traffic from, uh, from this area that we've seen is heading toward Lancaster Avenue for obvious reasons. So that's where, that's where I would focus the improvements on um, in terms uh, of, of the required offsite improvements. Uh, the shuttle system, it was asked last night at the, at the Board of Commissioners meeting um, uh, to kind of talk about some of the benefits of the shuttle system. Um, one of the things about the shuttle system is that, uh, you know, it really depends upon the design of the shuttle system. Uh, is it frequent enough? Is it stopping at the right locations? Is the bus clean? Um, is the driver courteous? Is, you know, are there incentives to use the bus? Things like that. Um, what we've seen in other places where the, of, of office buildings that are not even close to, to transit, um, shuttle systems actually create, a, uh, in, in the other um, a biomed site in New Jersey, sh the shuttle system itself created a 15% transit usage by, sh by uh, not being in walkable uh, proximity to, to transit, but having to get on that shuttle um, and going to uh, two different transit stops, we've seen 15% usage. Uh, so the shuttle system works, inclement weather. Uh, I, I would have gotten one on one today to, to go 100 feet to my parking space coming out of my uh, office this, uh, this evening. But, uh, and then the other things, you know, we, we start to go beyond, you know, resident to transit, transit back to resident. We, we you know, we have a potential hotel patrons that could go to restaurants in town. We have um, hotel patrons that may not be going to the office building on site, but maybe going to an office building off site. Um, so there's a lot of different uh, dynamics within the district that, that the shuttle system I think is important. And I know I want, I want to wrap things up here. So uh, one of the, the major things here, again, uh, if, 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 if this ordinance doesn't do the improvements and, and the people that choose to, to develop, if they don't do the improvements, we don't see these improvements being done. Uh, based upon the, the, the PennDOT transportation improvement plan, there are, only, there are four projects in the township that have any kind of uh, partial funding over the next four years. Uh, the only project of those four um, in this study area is a closed loop system along uh, Lancaster Avenue at approximately $215,000. That's not going to get the job done. This ordinance creates an opportunity for private funding to uh, fix some of the, the some of the problems of the past and also mitigate 
the impacts of the development legislatively by ordinance um, and, and again something where public funding is not going to come through uh, in this area so um, if you have any questions of me uh, I'll, I can remain here or uh, oh, wait or, a second um, does anybody have questions for John I have just a question with the reductions that you're anticipating there's no way you can reduce your parking you really can't. There's no way. you The parking that you're proposing right now, you really need to have it. You're, you, there's really no way. Because I know from a lot of different locations I've been, if you have the parking restricted, people will carpool. They'll take the train much more readily. Uh, I, th I think what, and, and maybe I'll let Nick speak further, but I think what um, uh, the Biomed team has shown is that there there's a willingness to comply with the current ordinance uh, and with a reduction of some residential parking based upon other, other developments that, that have been seen based on one bedroom, two bedroom, three bedroom apartments. Um, and there's also an opportunity for shared parking when offices is hot and heavy during the day, residential has a less demand. When residents come back to their apartments, uh, the office space, the office spaces are empty. So there's a, a, obviously an opportunity for shared parking there as well. And, and I think as part of, I'm not sure if it's part of the ordinance, but um, I think there can be some reductions um, from a market perspective and from a leasing perspective. I can't, I, I don't know what those leasing requirements are from tenants that want, uh, you know, a certain number of spaces per thousand square feet. Regina, I'd just like to add to that, because John touched on it very briefly, that the parking allowed um, under this mixed-use scenario is less than what would be currently required under the code. Uh, there is a reduction built in and a cap basically for the non-residential component, um, but where we're seeing a general reduction is in the residential component. Um, right now, a single residential unit would require a minimum of two parking spaces. We're at 1.2 spaces. So there is a, a general reduction overall for the entire site over what currently exists. And then there's additional reductions beyond that that are permitted. So there is a reduction from base zoning right now, current zoning. And I appreciate that. And I think a lot of the things that you're pointing out, they make perfect sense, except that we're kind of pushing for the development, the redevelopment of this site by enacting this. And so there's a there's two different scenarios. There's existing and there's allowable. And somewhere in between is what we should probably be comparing the proposed to because the existing is so underdeveloped, but the but the proposed itself wouldn't happen tomorrow without this ordinance. So we're somewhere in the middle. John, could you go back to uh, the slide that said the future development I'm sorry which one was that um, it was it was a trip generation okay. slide so probably pretty close to the beginning that's it new site so again I had asked you what existing was you said it was about roughly 200 that's right so I, I just wanted to see these numbers again to refresh my memory that for me 0.7 as a maximum bonus is the number that seems to make sense because it is less than what the buy right is and would require traffic <coughs> improvements, which would improve the existing traffic, which we, because Amy, my question to you has been, and that's why I was asking about capacity last month and I still ask it, we're struggling to manage capacity of existing. So, do I, I do want to see the site redeveloped. Um, I do want to see traffic improvements and understand the mechanisms that would cause it to kick into place. <clears throat> I, but I were, I mean, and I look at a buy right number like that and say, we, we would choke on King of Prussia Road if the numbers, if the actual numbers went from 220 to 620. No, no two ways about it, but if we can get traffic improvements and have less than what would be the existing buy right, to me, that's the best win-win we can go for. So I just, I, I just wanted to see the 0.7 numbers again. Mm -hmm. So thank you. Um, something else that I wanted to remind you, when we had our discussion last month or just before Thanksgiving, I can't remember when it was, I pointed out the fact that although these numbers are comparable to the buy right, you have to remember that the buy right is office workers, and all of them are coming into the site in the morning 
and all of them are exiting in the afternoon. Whereas when you move into a mixed use, you have a little bit more uh, of a balance, so it could potentially, it, it would appear to be less than what you have by right, because you would have half the trips coming in in the morning and half of them exiting in the morning, because that's just how residential works with an office type of use. Yeah, but Amy, but, do, but the doesn't numbers this, the numbers. Okay, don't we, these numbers those reflect? Number, those numbers represent the total number of trips coming in and out of the entire site. So if you yeah. live in the area, you're Is exiting, and if you work in the area, you're entering. So that would be two trips. So you would look at the whole number. So if it was an office type of use, it would be two trips. But both of them are coming in. Whereas if we have a mixed use where we have residential retail or those other components, one of them would come in and one of them would exit. So if you're sitting at a traffic signal and you had 1,000 trips coming in and now you have 500 coming in and 500 going out, it would appear to you in your flow of traffic that there is less traffic out there. These uh, numbers are one hour numbers, right? Correct, they're the peak hours. This is the maximum that would occur during a typical AM peak hour and a PM peak hour. So the, the dark side of the mixed use development is that at school hour discharge, there'll be more traffic too. There could potentially be because additional it's a because use, the yeah. retail, the you know, the retail tends to peak at a certain point and stay consistent. You know, it peaks in the morning, the afternoon, and in the evening, and there is a little bit of uh, a greater amount of traffic as opposed to what you're looking at with the office use. The office use tends to have those same peaks, but they're not sustained in those in between time periods. And Skip, you bring up a good point, which is uh, why we disagree with the county's comments on the retail that we wanted it to be supportive of the other non-residential uses there and not competitive so that we're drawing people into the area which is why we don't want to go up to a 15,000 square foot and thought capping it at the 10,000 so that's you know things like that where we disagree with the county and there's specific reasons why okay uh, is there any other specific questions for John because yep. I want to go through all the public participation one, John one so Amy's explanation that the 590 represents traffic that was traveling in could potentially be traveling in either direction? That's correct. 590 in that particular scenario is about 50% entering, 50% exiting. So under the 0.7 number, uh, okay, that's, that's you know, fine. 200, you know, 245 entering, 245 exiting. Under the buy right at 620, about 85 percent of that is is entering in the morning peak hour. So you have about 575 entering, you're 575 sitting in that left turn lane on King, on, King of, on Lancaster Avenue, trying to make a left on the King of Prussia Road. Okay. Those kind of things. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, John. Julie, there was a question raised by the board president last evening regarding the eastern portion of the property and whether that should be considered in the lot area requirement. I know you've, we've heard this a lot mm -hmm. already. And Mike Devine would we'll just take a couple minutes just to address that, and then we'll, we would be done. Okay. Did you turn the slide to your I did. But... There you go. Okay, thank you, I'll be brief. Uh, I just wanted to kind of put um, the many questions from many people. Um, in 2004, when Biomed bought this site, um, the yellow line represents what we bought. We bought 26.96 <coughs> acres. It was one parcel, one site, one payment, and that's it. This, everyone seems to be referring to this as our, the right of way. But and actually, this is the southern end of our site, and it's one of it's a very bucolic, beautiful part of the site that has woods. Now, yes, does it have an elevated uh, 476 in it? But uh, that's true. But the re two thirds of the site is is green space, and we are planning. It's an integral part of the site, and I'm going to show you why. I actually it was very cold today, and I went out there and took pictures and my I think I have frostbite in my thumb but um, so if you just look real real quick the yellow line represents the deed line it's 26.96 acres and we own it <clears throat> yes is the 476 uh, right away part of that section bucolic section yes but if you see that blue dash line on the slide that is where 
since our inception of the of this development, we planned on putting a um, nice walkable trail. There's a stream that follows along that blue line, and it connects you right at Route 30 uh, at a sidewalk uh, that goes under the R100 um, train tracks. The reason we want to connect that site is because the sidewalk can continue and come down and enjoy our little bucolic setting, and we can try and make it parkland. It's very, you'll see the pictures, it's very wide and open down there. Uh, the other reason is that we like to connect our residents, our office users, as well as our hotel users to the retail that could use some customers next door. Um, because of the, the retail being in the back, there's nice restaurants in there, but I think our site and our people would like to walk there, uh, maybe not on a cold day like today, but when it's a little warmer and not raining. So with that said, um, I just want to show you my walk real quick. So this is actually, I'm sorry, if I go back here, this is actually the entrance off the existing road. There's a very large access road that takes you under these three bridges. Uh, 476, I guess, south, north, and the entrance ramp going north. Uh, there's a stream that goes under there, and it's very wide open. And this is a picture as we walk this way up to 30. And that's what I'm going to show you very briefly. And thank you for, for listening. So this is the entrance. This is walking down here. This is a, a nice stream um, that runs along there. Um, hold on, let me just get to the next. Can you guys see that okay? Okay, because it's sometimes not. As you go down here, you're still walking under the bridges. There's a nice stream. Uh, again, you're walking up towards Route 30 here. We would have to cross a bridge, but actually there's a beautiful um, stone bridge at the beginning of it that we could uh, get cross on the other side, which I did notice today, which I did not know that that was there. And then lastly, again, walking up to um, Route 30, there's that stone bridge I was talking about, and there's where I would bring my people out, have them get on that sidewalk, and walk to the retail. So <clears throat> the other key thing that I wanted to point out is on this slide, we actually, this is that bucolic setting of wooded area, all here. We've actually sited our building and put a very large outdoor seating area, which this is a very high part of the site, and this, this road is actually below it, to actually sit outside and enjoy the views of this southern part of our site. Um, southern part means sun, and uh, it is a very integral part of our site, and it's a part of our land that we bought. And that's all I wanted to point out, so thank you. Thank you. I have a question on the buildings there marked, RS, HDOB, and OB1. What sort of use are they? What are these? This has been the plan. All these, uh, the use, this is an office building, office building hotel and the apartments. It's been the same for months. That's the same plan we've been looking at. Yes. Okay. The, the oh. pathway that you were pointing out, the yes. end of your pathway where you come out, does that bridge currently have pedestrian um, sidewalks underneath? There, there's a sidewalk underneath. Yes. There is. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. And there's a sidewalk that goes towards, um, there's actually a sidewalk that goes towards King Prussia Road as well. So you'd connect with the sidewalk on, on the, I'd before I'd, the bridge? Before the bridge, yeah. Okay. And then you could walk under and go to the retail. And I think that one building is under redevelopment right now, just on the other side. I don't know what they're building there. But I think it would help that connect the two developments. OK, thank you. Thank you. Uh, additional public comment? Well, I have a done. Are you done, Nick? Yes. Kevin, could I ask you to put your chart on the board, the build out that stated the revised date of 12 4 2013? Good evening. Evening. Don't forget to sign in. <laughs> sure. Thank you. This is Sue's fault, you know. <laughs> he loved that Sue is back. Are you going to put your chart up? I'm yeah. looking for it, Mark. If okay. Give me a minute. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll address a couple of things as quickly as I can.
I'd like to just make these comments about the seven acres that Mike Devine just talked about. Pardon me? Oh, I'm Mark Kaplan, and I represent Brandywine. Thank you. I'm sorry. This is a PennDOT right-of-way plan. Pardon me? Do you prefer a microphone? No, I, I'll, okay, I'll right. try and stand still. Thank you. This is a PennDOT right-of-way plan. It was recorded in the public records. It shows the biomed site. And what it shows. Could you place it down so everyone can see it okay. at home? Thank you. Oh, good. I mean, yeah, please. So you got to, how do we bring that in? He'll, they'll okay. do it in the back, yeah. Okay. So this is a pen dot. This is a pen dot drawing that was recorded. This is a revised version of the PennDOT drawing. It was recorded in 1991 when PennDOT gave back to the prior owners of the biomed site this small portion here. Mark, what, if you use the orange pointer, you can keep your mouth in front of the microphone and point out. I'm things. sorry, say that again? The orange pointer. Use that to point while you're speaking to the Oh, microphone. okay, thanks, Peter. So this is a revised version of a drawing that was made back when PennDOT took, condemned, the se a right-of-way over the seven acres. The base drawing, I believe, is the drawing that showed the original taking. The original taking is the area that Mike Devine just talked about. I don't have... I don't have proof that the prior owners were paid compensation for it, but I believe from my experience with drawings like this that whoever owned that site at the time, and I believe it was Wyatt, there was a condemnation. That's why this kind of drawing is prepared. And then in 1991, this little area was given back to Wyatt. Um, yes, Biomed owns the outside perimeter, as Mike said, but it was subject to a right-of-way, absolutely, was subject to a taking, and I believe it was paid for. So yes, you bought the bare title, but PennDOT's got a right-of-way there. And that's confirmed by this drawing, which is a biomed drawing in 2008. And this drawing is part of what was submitted by Biomed, and it talks about what the, exi the existing and the proposed acreage is 18.73 acres. So I love Mike Devine. He's my dear friend, but I'm sorry. Biomed, when this was bought, bought 18 acres, and that was the usable acreage. And that's what's been presented to the township. So I just want you to have, I just want you to have those facts, and I'll, I'll go on, I'll go on from there, because there are a number of things that we would like to address. Excuse me, Mark. Um, does it show the corner with the blue root and everything? You, we only saw the heart of the drawing. Not that, not that drawing, the um, plan drawing. I'm not sure. It's good. Well, what it... Look up on the screen. You have to move over. Slide it to the left. There's one of these drawings out of this set that said PennDOT right of way, but I'm not sure that this is the one. He's got a deed for it. It shows the location map, but not on the plan. I, I think you've made your point. Let's move on to your next point. I was just trying to answer the question. I appreciate it. Okay. Members of the Planning Commission, I, we don't disagree with 
mark on this issue. Um, that's something that we're going to require the applicant during the land development and conditional use process. Um, it's their burden to bear. Um, but it doesn't apply to our revision of the must it's ordinance, got so to do with the let's ordinance. not deal with it right now. Well, the existing PLO ordinance in calculating the required green space to, for the PLO says you exclude the rights of way. So if you exclude the rights of way and you have to have 45%, I believe it's 45% green space, then you never get to take what is being attempted here to take this seven acres and take the density from that, the 240 or so thousand square feet, that if you had a seven acre standalone parcel, and push it over on the rest of the site and give and have this as the, the green area. And that's, what's, that's why this additional seven acres is trying to be squeezed into the overall site by a change in the ordinance. But I, I just want you to have the facts. You, there, I've got a number of other facts that I'd like to get to. Does, does the proposed ordinance treat the right-of-way areas any differently than the existing ordinance? Yes. yes. Yes, it does. No, it does not. Well, that's, well, I, I, I'm, it, it does in this regard. In an, in, it, in an FAR situation, you take into account the entire site, so you're taking into account 26 acres times 40 some thousand square feet and you get a number. And when you divide it in half by the FAR, the 50% base, you get a bigger number of square feet that's allowable than if you take 18 acres. So that's, that's what this ordinance is trying to do. And what I just said, under the PLO, you don't have an FAR, but you have a 45% um, green area, and you can't count that seven acres in it. So Kevin, you and I disagree. You and I disagree. So I don't- So Kevin, well, could we have the FAR be based on the area that's outside the right of ways only? Yes, you can, but can we, what, what is Mark that a, is something we can change? Is the regulations in the PLO, and he's trying to confuse the issue so that we get away from the issue at hand. The, I'm trying to confuse. Yes. I think yes, we should I, all let Mr. Kaplan continue with his his public participation, and we want to hear all of his comments, and then we'll discuss it afterwards. I'm I'm not trying to confuse. Please move to your next point. We heard you. I, I, okay. All right. I want to go to the mitigation of what can be done and what can't be done. One, we have one of the properties that's now covered, or to be covered. I don't have the traffic study that was, I understand, Amy, you got John Wichner's study when? Yesterday? I didn't get any study from John Wichner. I don't have that study. Oh, so you haven't had a chance to review that study? Not the, what study? The whatever Tonight, he was putting up on the screen. Those have, were just slides. I, and no, I do not have those slides. Okay. And you're right. You should be dis discussing this with the board. Uh, Amy, could Madam you, Chairman, this is public comment. This is public comment. Uh, and okay. Well, I, okay. I'm going to ask not only for the people who are making public comment yes. to restrict their comments to us, but I also want to ask the board and the staff not to jump in. Don't answer questions. Okay. Unless I ask you to, please. Okay. Go ahead. So my point is... We have been asking for Biomed's traffic study since the Thursday, the day before Thanksgiving. You saw a study tonight that we haven't seen, we haven't had a chance to look at. Again, our site is one of the included sites. Um, I understand, I just learned that Peter Nelson gave you some legal memorandum. I haven't seen it. But I, I want to try and make as clear to you my view on what can be done and what can't be done under Act 209 and the case law. Number one, 
the must ordinance is proposed as a conditional use in the, in, in the PLO ordinance. So with a conditional use, you can include specific requirements with regard to traffic. We had proposed months ago a, a, a scheme, a methodology, where if you want to use the must ordinance, you demonstrate what, how much traffic could be generated under the PLO, which would be all office, which is the highest density, most traffic. And we said, OK, use any combination of uses that you want. Just have your traffic engineer say that for a base, you're not going to generate any more traffic that's allowed now. That's the way so that you make it not worse than it is. And we said that if you're going to have a, a density bonus, which we'll get to in a minute, then there have to be objective criteria. I will say to you that what Kevin has said to you is possible. I believe not to be possible. You cannot have a permitted use or even a conditional use where you come and you negotiate what the traffic improvements are. The conditional use law is very simple. Conditional use is a permitted use. If you meet the criteria for conditional use, which is in here, the side yards, the setbacks, et cetera, you can't have undefined traffic improvements. It's absolutely prohibited by Act 209. So this scenario where there's some vague generalization in here that in the conditional use process for additional bonus density that you're going to negotiate and you're going to dictate to the developer what the improvements are, that's a fallacy. And there are plenty of cases on it. Now, I don't know what Peter told you in his memo because I haven't seen it. But please don't buy into that. All right, let me, let me go to the one of the, what I think, one of the most important underlying assumptions of this is. This is your chart, Kevin. I think it would probably be better if you could put it up. Or you sure, Jim, if you could uh, pull it up. I have multiple copies of this if the board would like to have it. We have it. In front of you. You have it? I can't zoom in. If I, if I could, I don't want to throw a lot of numbers at you, but I went back and I very carefully looked at the latest version of the supposed build-out chart. And I would like to walk you through this because I don't agree with the underlying assumption at all about how much can be built out. First of all, here, here, Rich, Rich, I got it. So what this chart does is that now it only includes three properties. 201 King of Prussia Road, which is the building that we own that's, that's a big, successful office building that hasn't got a chance in the world in the foreseeable future of being torn down. Oh, that's good. The second one is 175. It's only seven acres. It's the racket club. It's got a stream running through it. 
What Kevin has told you here in the top column, in the top chart, middle, middle row, 175, he says there is existing 60,984 square feet of space. And when, when he then estimates what could be built there under the existing PLO with reasonable site constraints, it goes to 123,000 square feet. So 60,000 additional square feet under the existing PLO. We're not tearing our building down. If Mr. Goodman redevelops under the PLO, he can go from 60, whatever it is, 61 to 123 or 124. So in my view, these two other sites being included in this and, and, and scaring everybody by saying that 201 and 175 is going to get torn down and you're going to get all this additional traffic, I think is, I think is almost a scare tactic. Now, let's go to the next number. Um, what's on 145 King of Prussia Road right now is supposedly 475,000 square feet. The plan I just showed you has, says it's 427,000 square feet, and more than half of it is lab space, not office space. And lab space you park under your ordinance at one car for every 1,000 square feet. Office you park four, car, four cars because office generates so many more people and cars. So to just put on this chart that there's 475,000 square feet implying how many cars would be there is, in my opinion, misleading. But, and, and then I'll take you through a couple of other things, but I would like to show you what the end result is. If you go over in the center column, and you go over to where we talk about the must ordinance, if you get a 50% bonus, if you go to 50%, you get 587,000 square feet. So you've gone up from what's there now, which is 475,000 square feet, only half of which is office, to a starting point of 587. And then if you do this bonus, I'll say insanity, and you filter it however you want, but then you go to 822,000 square feet, and then 939 with, with the 80% density bonus. So in my view, and in our analysis, this must ordinance is being imposed on three properties, not because 201 is going to be so overbuilt and not because 175 is going to create so much additional space, but this is a mechanism by which the biomed site can be redeveloped at many multiples of what it really could be under I, uh, under the existing ordinance. Now, let's look at those assumptions for a minute. The buy, look at, in the center. Mark, uh, I just wanted to say you've had 20 minutes. I don't want to rush you, well, but you I, can't I, go on all night. I, so just well, give yourself I'm, a few I, more minutes I, and try I, to wrap you, up. You listen to them finish their proposal. I kept track is, of the time. Okay, all right. He, Kevin has said that the approximate square footage that could be built on the biomed site under the existing ordinance is a million fifty six thousand square feet. That's nonsense. We all walk that site. There's nowhere to put anywhere near that additional square footage. 
There's no more parking area. We all walked it. And, it, and, and, and the biomed guy told us it was 475,000 square feet. So when you look at this number, and Kevin assumes that you can get a million, a million 56, and he's saying time and again that under the existing PLO, the developers could tear everything down and get much more space. It's simply not realistic. Look at the, look at the existing square footages that are on, on the site. 201 has got 251,000 square feet. Where would, and he says that under the existing ordinance, it could be more than doubled to 561,000 square feet. Tell me where we put it. We would love to do that. We have no place to put it. We can't go up. We'd have to build structured parking. We simply don't have the area. We wouldn't comply with the open space requirement, which is 45%. This, how did Kevin come up with this FAR on the existing? All he did was he said, you can have 30%, you can have 30 building coverage, and that will give you on the um, uh, 201, 187,000 square feet of building area. Then he said, you can multiply that by three. That gets you to the 0.9 FAR he talked about before. And he says that Brandywine could put 561,000 square feet. But he didn't take into consideration the required 45% open space or all of the additional parking that could be put on there. And if you go through this whole chart, if you carefully go through the whole chart, as opposed to listening to the conclusions, there's a very simple conclusion. This is all for whatever reason for the biomed site. It will not have, it will not generate what people are talking about. I don't even want to get into the traffic, but the last time we were here, the day before Christmas, we heard Wichner and we, talk, we heard Amy vociferously saying that by doing this mixed use, there's, we're going to have 15% reduction in traffic because of the trains there. And you all said to them, that doesn't pass the smell test. So today they come back and Kevin starts out, well, that really wasn't a big part of it. He said, I heard him, we're all hearing on the tape, that was a minor part of it. We well, have taken 15% of the traffic out. And to get to these numbers that John Wichner is talking about, what else did they talk about? What else did they take out? They took out what Two they- Two minutes. Okay, internal capture, meaning that People in the different uses are there, are going to go to each other, each of the other places, and therefore the cars that come are going to stay inside. Well, think about it. People who come to the hotel, where are they going? To the residential? To, to the office building? Or to the 10 or 15,000 square feet of retail? There's no internal capture or a minor, minor internal capture with a hotel. And walk that down. Is there really going to be an internal capture between the office and the residential? 15%? My traffic engineers say that this is, these are, there are no industry standards. You've got to look at each one in the socioeconomic and the geographic area that you're located in. So look, I've taken enough of your time. I'm just telling you that the numbers do not support any of this. And I'll close with this. We have been very vociferous in opposing this. I've never done this before. Brandywine would love the opportunity if it made sense 
to take advantage of all of this. We're developers. But we don't believe that the numbers that you're being given make sense. We don't think that all these buildings other than biomed are going to be torn down. And, and for whatever reason, the township staff is very, very in favor of this. And they want to give these density bonuses without really taking care of the traffic. And I'll close with this. Susan, at the last hearing, I told you or you told me we gave the board two versions of this ordinance where we made suggested changes even to this final ordinance for criteria for um, uh, the traffic component. And nobody's responded to it. Nobody's said yes, no. Kevin's just kept the same stuff that I don't think works. Thank you. Any other public comment? Good evening. I'm Dennis Clack, and, and, and I'll, I'll be very short. And I'm going to focus on the ordinance. Um, because he already used up all Brandywine's time, so. Pardon? This, I'll be really okay, quick, honest. All I want you to do is when you get to the ordinance, I want you to look at the density, the, the bonus provisions. Um, this, and I've been trying to understand how these work because my business is really preparing plans and reading ordinances and trying to interpret what they want. And I'm still trying to figure out how you would get from, say, 0 0.5 to 0 0.6. There's, there's word in here that just is hard to understand and really doesn't make sense. But it, at any rate, I said to myself, all right, what would I have to do to get to 0.7? Well, I have to do one item in Category 1. All right, and Category 1 does talk about um, improvements to intersections and off-site improvements and so forth. But one of the items that you can elect to do is the applicant through coordination with an approval from the appropriate transit authority develop and implement a plan to improve transit stops and stations within the township, including shelter with convenience and comfort features. Not sure what that means. Is it benches? Is it restrooms? Is it a ramp? I don't know. But that's one of the things you, you could elect to do. And then when you go to the next category, category two, and you have to do three additional items, there are items in here that are the applicant shall improve pedestrian, bicycle, and vehicular access to existing to propose public, public transportation stations. So I guess I can build a trail, I can extend the sidewalk, I can do what Mike had talked about perhaps um, under the Blue Route. Um, it's number six talks about the applicant shall establish a program to promote and maintain tenant employee participation in carpooling. I don't know how you ever enforce that. I don't know how you know when an applicant is before you how that's going to work. Um, number Another one is provide opportunities to purchase transit passes. So these are things you can, I can see it up here as an applicant and say, I'm going to do these four things. And then my density jumps from 0.5 to 0.7. So I would just ask you as you get into the bonus provisions, if you're going to have them, make them objective, make them that they're understandable and that everybody knows what it is going into the game. The staff has ideas, the, the developer will have ideas, you'll, you'll have ideas, but they should be objective and very easy to understand in terms of what you have to do or what you can do to get these bonuses, which are fairly substantial. Thank you. Thank you. Public comment, others? No, no, you, no, thank you. Hi, I'm Lloyd Goodman, the uh, owner of the Radnor Aki Club, and also a uh, resident at Harrison Road in Villanova. Um, sure can get confusing listening to all this, and I just want to say off the set that, you know, it's, your concerns are very heartfelt, um, but I feel like uh, this is a, a very good ordinance, 
and I hope at some point you will pass it with some minor changes as, as you deem necessary to pass on to the Board of Commissioners. Um, I feel like it has been revised with many well-meaning and knowledgeable people's advice already. Uh, and last night some commissioners had a few suggestions which seem helpful without minimizing the substantive uh, benefits of this ordinance. Um, since the ordinance now only includes the three properties for just about a half a mile, there is an inherent, <coughs> inherent strong protection from much negative impact to the community. Um, after having heard all the opinions from Brandywine and Biomed and their talented teams of experts, as well as some of the community members that I guess you're here tonight and at previous meetings, uh, I have great confidence that the township staff has conservatively melded these concerns into an excellent compromise. Um, it, it kind of seems strange that uh, you have uh, these staff members that you uh, hire and employ and, and consultants that they then deal with, and it seems like so much of what they say kind of gets disregarded. I mean, Biomed has their point, Brandy Wine, and you have to get a middle ground, which I, what I think is the goal of uh, what your staff does. You know, maybe there are askew in some numbers and, and um, you know, th that's up for you to try to, to work with, I guess, but it doesn't seem like, um, to me, uh, there's been enough uh, consideration for what they've uh, come up with. Um, it seems that only Biomed's site is ripe for development now. Uh, I have a tenant with 13 years left on their lease, so that is when I would consider using this ordinance. Uh, it would be great because I think maybe my site with the seven acres of woods and stream would be good for a hotel or assisted living, uh, especially, which you know would be very good for the traffic situation, as opposed to just building an office building. Um, but you know, it, it, I see doing something with the site at that point in time, not not keeping it as a uh, tennis club necessarily. Um, <clears throat> and as Brandywine has told us. And it's obvious, uh, you know, they have put a big effort into leasing their recently renovated office building and are very wary of too much more development. And because there's not much space left on their site, it's hard to fathom that they will redevelop for a long time. Therefore, if the Biomed site is the only new development for many years, uh, and it were to somehow create some traffic situation, ho however, hopefully, would, if it does happen, it would be small, the township would have many years to analyze this. And, and say, well, now we got to maybe tweak it some to alleviate the situation. I realize this could actually put some additional burden on the capability of me to develop my property to its fullest, but because I really doubt this traffic problem will be, uh, as, as some people are, are predicting, um, I'd support the ordinance pretty much as it is, I, I, you know, assuming it needs some tweaking here and there. Uh, regarding the traffic, at um, one meeting, uh, somebody, an opponent of the ordinance, stated how visually bad it would be to add another lane to Camp Pressure Road. Although this may not even happen, I don't think it would be offensive. It is only for a short distance. Also, it would be visually offset by the high school's fields on one side, and on the development side, there is a required 60 or 75 foot landscape buffer, which would soften the blacktop's negative appearance. I have dealt with the, the immediate neighborhood traffic since 1978 when we developed Radnor Racket. Varying, you know, I don't really haven't paid that much attention how much Biomed or, or Wyeth or, or Chilton or Brandywine, you know, the tenants come and go. We've been there since 1978. Sometimes there's more traffic, sometimes there's less. But to tell you the truth, I don't find it to be a problem. I really don't. Sometimes, you know, you may, it may be stopping and go, but generally it's moving 10 or 15 miles per hour in the worst case scenarios. And to me, there's a lot more bigger issues, you know, of running my life or my business or whatever that I'm thinking about. So you have a little a bit of traffic for like up to a half a mile. In the overall scheme of things in the township, I, I don't really think that that's a big issue. I think too much is really being made to, to try to offset the great potential and even if it is just a biomed site that is developed at this point in time, in the next few years, that whatever it is will be a great asset. It can be downplayed as, oh, just one site, but it's gonna be a lot better than just having a bunch of offices, whether it's this many, 100,000 square feet or that many. It, it, it's a great mixed use. It has great potential. Um, and I feel if you have a little patience, 
you're sitting in some traffic. I know I've sent a lot worse traffic in many other areas around here, and our little bit on King of Prussia Road or Lancaster Avenue is, is to me, negligible. Um, the township staff has said they approach the traffic challenge conservatively, and I believe them. They have also conferred with SEPTA and Delaware County planners and heard from Biomed and Brandywine, so I think pretty much what they're proposing should work. Now there again, you know, there's other, the Brandywine has experts, and I think they also want what's best for the neighborhood, but, you know, pretty much they, uh, you know, want what's best for their site. Um, I also support environmental protection. I think the must ordinance will be beneficial. I would like to share with you an article that I'll give to you folks with what I'm, my comments from the Eco Home Magazine, which um, probably says things that you already believe and, and, and know. Uh, but this particular expert on sustainable communities explains the need for the United States to push for sub sub sustainable, mixed use, walkable neighborhoods. The Wayne Business District and Garrett Hill zoning changes were prime examples of how the township modernized these zoning districts for the benefit of the neighbors as well as the overall community. By adopting the must ordinance, we can also include the King of Prussia Road area as another example, although it's quite different. The article states how much less energy is used in a compact, well-connected, walkable neighborhood with amenities that relieve car usage. This is definitely a characteristic of this must ordinance, and it's promoted as such, uh, and it also creates varied business uses in a multiple mass transit zone. Um, and the energy thing is interesting with today's cold weather, you probably know that the, um, you know, the local utilities are saying we have to cut back our electricity use this afternoon and this evening because uh, they're maxed out. So, of course, we all like to save electricity in this. Uh, and, Mr. And Goodman. Can you wrap up, please? Okay. Uh, the must also reduces the maximum impervious coverage from 55% to 50% with further reductions allowed in the density bonus program. So in conclusion, having been a resident of Villanova my entire life and also building and operating the racket club for 35 years and planning to be around for many more years, I think this must ordinance would be an innovative and wonderful opportunity to update a unique neighborhood in our community. I doubt many places in the Philadelphia suburbs have two train stations and two bus routes within a half mile of an interstate highway. Of course, fulfilling this little area's potential will provide tremendous tax revenues for the township and have an overall beneficial effect on the surrounding community since the traffic issues have been so scrutinized and obviously will be more. Instead of so many commuters just coming in and out of our neighborhood at rush hour, many will become our neighbors and customers and business owners. Instead of our present Monday to Friday, 9 o'clock to 5 o'clock office building scenario with rush hour traffic, we'll have much more various businesses and activities spread over a seven-day week, including evenings. I have high hopes that you will somehow work through all this to improve um, you know, some of the provisions, but uh, I hope you don't cut back on any more on the density and the building requirements with the setbacks and impervious and, and um, those kind of things. Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, okay, thanks. Uh, I'm Dr. John Williams. I, um, I came here to comment on another matter on the list here, but having heard all of this about this ordinance, it's, it's quite distressing to me. Uh, I own a property on uh, Glen Mary, uh, live, lived in the area for 10 years. Um, I'm a, I also own a business uh, over in the Bryn Mawr section of the township and I actually run two businesses in the township and pay business uh, privilege tax. Um, regarding the traffic and what it sounds like could be created by this increased development, I, I can say having spent 10 years in the area, the area around King of Prussia Road and Radnor Chester Road is intolerable in terms of the traffic. It is impassable, and it is the reason why, uh, you know, why I have, uh, you know, moved to another area, <laughs> because it was just so unpleasant. So I just, as a, but still as an owner and as a taxpayer, I'd like to, uh, I'd like to put that in the record. Thank you. Thank you.
Uh, my name is Virginia Hart. I live at 15 Radnor Way, and I have an investment property at 3 Radnor Way. So I'm right at the intersection that all of this is uh, occurring. And I just wanted to go on record to confirm other people's opinion that the traffic there is, is absolutely failing, that those intersections are impassable. And I would just ask that all of you, uh, when you pass this ordinance, make sure to nail down biomed and specifically what will they do to mitigate because as I think it was pointed out before this there is really no way to mitigate it you have a train bridge and even if you widen the road you still have to narrow down to the bridge there's I don't see any way you can practically resolve the traffic issue so you need to take that into consideration thanks thank you Virginia Can I get the overhead, please? <laughs> Can you bring it down some more? Focus closer. Yeah. That's good. Thank you. Rich Booker, Bell Rose Lane. I, what I want to say is my, my business here is, is as a neighbor, and as my business is the neighborhood that's right near this development. You know, I, again, I've said it a hundred times. Biomed, great, and, and Brandywine, great businessmen. Really top-notch developers, top-of-the-line companies. But what I, get, what I have to say is that this ordinance reminds me of something that's very, very recent. If you like your plan, you can keep your plan, right? <laughs> this, is, this, is, this is the epitome. This is, this is where we have uh, the government telling us that we are going to get something for nothing, and we're going to improve things in traffic by building more, okay? Now, this, this particular drawing right here is from Biomed. <laughs> Kevin has said 18 times, it's not more, it's not more. <laughs> it's, if, we do, if we do this ordinance, we're gonna have less density. <laughs> All right, I, I, I absolutely disagree. Absolutely. Now, here's, here's why. This came from Biomed. This is from March 2013. 2013, March 2013. Biomed themselves said this is their buy right plan. That's what it says right here. Buy right. Total buy right, 522,240. Buy right parking, 2,053. This is the massing plan that they have on the buy right. It's not, my, it's not my numbers. This is what the developer said. This is what he gave it. This isn't brandy wine. This is what the developer said. 522,000 square feet. The ordinance today that Kevin has before you at 50% before any bonus would allow them to build 575,000 square feet. It is not less by doing this ordinance. If you get the book, if you get the bonus, it's going to go up to 822,000 at 70 percent, and 939,000 feet at 80 percent. That is not less than 522,000 square feet. Plain and simple. Okay. Now, the other thing I would say is if if this actually was if they actually got more by using the existing PLO than this ordinance, then why would they be asking to do this ordinance? These developers will tell you they would love to build the office space. It can't be true that they get less by doing this ordinance. Can't be. They wouldn't be here asking you for this for the last 18 months 
or two weeks or whatever it's been. This is the first time you've seen this ordinance, actually, so it's, it's actually very new. The next thing that no one has taken it, no, it was right where it was, it was fine. Bring it back, bring it back. Bring it back down. Stop. Okay. Now, the traffic issue here, the key issue is not what is permitted, not what, how many incremental trips over the maximum build out in the PLO we're going to have. What we in the neighborhood care about is what is it going to be different from what it is today? That's plain and simple. It's got to be. Now, what our traffic engineer said is it's going to be 500 trips approximately. Whatever it is, it's 470, it's 670. It's 500 trips in the morning and the evening. At the, at the I'll even give them the low side. It's 70% that Susan pointed out. Now, what we have today, and I'll, I'm going to grant you that the current, there's a lot of vacancy in this, in, this, in this location. It shows it current occupancy at 249,000 square feet for that building, and there's, seven, there's 400,000 square feet approximately. This, is my, this, is, this actually is from Brandywine, but I, I think it's, it's just as accurate as anything else we're seeing here tonight. This says AM peak is 98 trips, PM peak is 122. So no matter what you do with this ordinance, we're going to go from 100 to 500 trips in the morning and 100 to 500 plus trips at night. We know that the intersection at Radnor Chest, at King Pressure Road and Lancaster Avenue is terrible. We know, we know from the many people who have talked about it how bad the traffic is in the area. There's not enough traffic mitigation techniques in the world to fix this without hovering cars and, and, and helicopters. So that's really the key here. It's 100 to 500, 500 plus. And, and, and if you allow more and more density, it's going to be six or 700 trips per, per morning and evening versus the 100 or so we have today. It's going to be a huge difference. I'll give you the 15% in additional riders on the, on, the, on the train, which I don't believe. But even if you give it, it's just not going to make a difference. We're going to be inundated with traffic in my neighborhood. And the consensus in my neighborhood, and I haven't heard anybody really, is that they think that this is going to cause a lot of traffic and a lot more hardship and is going to detract from the quality of life of our neighborhood in the second ward. Finally, what I'll say is the right-of-way area. Okay. And once again, this is Biomed's drawing here. This right-of-way area that we're talking about is right in here. It's, it's not even, and this, and this is Biomed's own drawing. They, they don't show that additional right-of-way as being part of their site. It's absolutely, it would be, <laughs> I would say, absurd, incorrect, improper, implausible um, and, and, not, and not right to allow that this right away should be counted towards the ability of increasing the density on this site. As has been pointed out, it's not shown on this drawing. It's not shown on the site development plan from 2008. It's not part of the site. It was a condemned piece of land that has since been, um, has never been part of the site as far as a tax parcel. And 
there's not taxes paid on it. It was taken, it was probably paid for, and it's not part of the site. And if you, if you look on the Delaware County um, public access, you can look at every parcel in the township, and this particular parcel is folio number 36020123400, and it shows as 18.69 acres. It's not 26 acres. It should not be included in the ordinance. Now, people in my neighborhood, we're against the ordinance. We think it's improper to have an ordinance for this site. We're not against this site being redeveloped. We would love to do a site plan and try to work with the developer to develop the site to what they want it to be. What we think is improper is using spot zoning to have a, in a special conditional use ordinance, and we're seeing this more and more throughout the township, we don't think that that should be used to allow this development or any other. So we're against this ordinance. We are for the redevelopment of this site. We are for the people of Radnor. And thank you very much. Have a good evening. Thank you. Any other public comment? Um, Matt Marshall, 228 Walnut Avenue, and I'll, I'll be very brief because I have to sign in, though. I will sign in. Thank you. Uh, as I'm signing in, I'll just make some comments that I made last night at the commissioner's meeting. I, I think the process, um, however interesting it is uh, from both sides, I think that the development plan um, potentially can work, but I think the process by which we're going forward with this proposed um, this 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 uh, uh, must ordinance is 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 backwards. I I said that at the commissioner's meeting last night. I think it's the responsibility of everybody on this board to provide comments to the existing ordinance, and if things need to change, they need to change within the PLO. Um, this becomes a vehicle by which I heard last night the commissioners are going to vote within 30 days and your comments, however hard and long you work this evening, uh, seem to be minimized by just a few, I think, in, important points, but the points that the commissioners feel they can weigh themselves without the benefit of your experience and your knowledge. And I just think that the planning commission needs to be more assertive for this particular application. This has tremendous impact on the traffic in a very critical part of the township. I can talk about it, no one else can, but there's a big Villanova application coming through at the same time. They will be tied, they will impact one another. Take your time with this plan and give the commissioners your feedback. Because from what I hear, it's going forward, but it's going forward by staff recommendation and not yours. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Hi, I'm Alex Tweedy with Nave Newell. I wanted to speak on two quick points. We're the engineers that did the original deed work for the biomed parcel, and I wanted to speak briefly on the right-of-way. Um, just two points specifically about that. Everyone keeps talking about the property being condemned. The current code, as Kevin stated, defines lot area as the total deed boundary, and in some cases you have frontage on a public street where you give additional right-of-way and can dedicate that to the township. This is no different of a scenario than that. And even if PennDOT condemned it or you dedicate it to a township, your current code allows you to count that area. It's the same situation, except for a current frontage on a street, the way your code is currently drafted with the required roadway width and sidewalk width versus the, the right-of-way width is usually about 20% open space. This is 67% open space. So it's the same situation but much more green. Um, 
and to speak to Kevin's chart, and I think Nick has already highlighted this, without the right of way included and a 50% base density, it's less than could be built now or it exists out there today. So um, just from a table standpoint, that's where we stand. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we can take one more comment and then we're gonna have to close public participation. Uh, good evening, I'm Austin Hepburn from Upper Gulf Road. Uh, I've been a resident for 17 years. I'm disturbed by what I've learned about this ordinance. Um, I have no financial gain from this going forward. I do believe that the developers should be allowed to develop this property. I think it's in the best interest of Radnor to have the property developed in a thoughtful way. But uh, I'm very disturbed by what I've seen, what I've heard, what I've learned. Uh, I don't see balance here. I, th I think it's incumbent upon you to find a way to allow the developers to make money and also preserve our community. Because we live here, we're, we're the residents. We have to live with this after the staff and the developers move on. Let's, let's I hope that you'll protect Radnor as a community. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hepburn. We're gonna take a five minute break and then we'll get back to board discussion.
Okay, are we back? Thank you all for coming back. Um, before we start our board discussion, I want to talk about um, what our product is going to be after this discussion. Um, Kevin, or Steve, or anybody over there. <laughs> um, uh, would it be more helpful, do you think, for us to end up our discussion with a memo to the commissioners to give our recommendations on different points, or to do what we've done in some of the other ordinance reviews where we go through and kind of you know, change spots within the ordinance? What do you think would be more effective? I, I think that the way, um, with a slightly different recommendation of not to approve, but to approve if you're going to have any changes, um, it would be specific bullet points that you recommend approval and then and these then specific the changes. things that are yes. changes that we, we, yeah, we would recommend. That format worked very well, I, I believe, for, for Villanova. Mm -hmm. um, the only difference is that you recommended not to approve that. And right, but the I same format. I would encourage format. you, yes, to recommend approval. Okay, and um, then can, then will one of you write that up and then forward it to us to confirm, maybe to Skip and I? I'll do it. Peter, volunteer. Just, just like in with Villanova, I'll, I'll You'll do that. make the changes, I'll forward it to you guys. Uh, the, you know, you can get back to me if I miss anything okay. or you had questions. And once yeah, it's okay, I'll then forward it to the, uh, the commissioners. Okay. So. Now, are we talking about having him revise the ordinance, or are we just talking no, about just having him come up with a list of, of these our, are the things we want to these change? These are the things that we'd rec we, we would either recommend or not recommend approval of this um, uh, um, blah, adoption of this ordinance amendment with the following changes. That's fine. Okay. That sounds and, and good. I, to be honest, I'll probably do what I did for Villanova or ended up doing is I made a red line, uh, you know, a black line version of the ordinance with your changes and then put a memo kind of explaining them more in English to the commissioners, I'll probably end up doing that same thing for this. Okay. But you did revise the ordinance. Yeah, but you did revise the ordinance. Okay. Okay. Um, before we start, I want to review the memo that we got from uh, staff. I want to review this memo that just says what specific issues the commissioners have asked us to specifically comment on, just so we have that in our mind as we go through our discussion. Okay, so one of the first item is the ability of this ordinance to require off-site mitigation of traffic and implementation of infrastructure improvements. How much discretion does the township have and what improvements are worthy of a bonus? Um, does the vagueness of the language limit the township's ability to get a desired off-site improvement? Um, Review the anti-family restriction on the number of one-bedroom apartments, um, the effectiveness of the ordinance to induce the use of public transit, and um, someone help me out. There was another one I heard last night during were, the meeting. Yes, there were two. Um, the issue of the right-of-way and inclusion of the area of a right-of-way within the calculations for the site. Okay. And the second was the, the van, the carpooling thing. The yeah. shuttle, shuttle uh, the, the shuttle. viability of a, of a shuttle. Okay, thank you. All right. I also have a list of items that we had brought up as a group at our past meeting. Um, we didn't make this list official. It was just my notes and, and some other people's notes on what the topics were. Uh, I'm not going to go over that now, although I, we had talked about going over it, because some of these things have already been taken care of with the revisions. Uh, Kevin's already worked some of our concerns into the current version that we're looking at. But um, I just refer you back to this in case there's anything that you want to remind yourself of. We have that also. Okay. Like I know, for instance, there's something here about the signs. I know that's going to come up. Um, we were also concerned about Okay, it's in the packet. Thank you. In the packet, uh, page three. Um, which is basically in our minutes. There's like 15 uh, different points. Okay, so are we ready to go through page one? Yeah. All right. I don't have anything until page well, does anybody have anything up to the definitions? Up to the definitions? No. Okay, how about in the definitions? Yes. Go ahead. Um, page three. Are we there yet or? 
I'm on page oh, two. On two. Okay, no. Okay. I have something on three. Go ahead, Kathy, I think we're there. Okay. Uh, I had mentioned before that I thought there should be a, additional parking requirements for a medical uh, facility, for example, outpatient surgical center or medical office building. And Delaware uh, County, in their notes, had also said that that's sort of the opposite use you'd be looking for if you want to keep the parking down. Right. Mm -hmm. Anybody else have comments on that? Because it's been a particular issue in Bryn Mawr. They All suggested right. we take it out. We, okay. Um, show of hands, uh, who would like to see number two outpatient surgical center removed from the regulations? Okay, that carries. Anything else on that page? It's stuff before that in the definitions. Go ahead. Um, so it is. Um, it is in the total site area. Just not that we have to have the long conversation now, but it is in the total site area definition that Delaware County said we should put in subtract the area and the streets right of ways and easements. And so I just I don't want to forget that when we have the conversation about the right of way, it would be back at the definition of total site area would be the place to put that back in. That's my only comment okay. about that. Well, let's go ahead and talk about the right of way. Um, my thought is that we would want to handle the rights of way in this zoning district the same way we handle them everywhere. Um, so, yeah, I, I don't agree. I, I, I think yeah. if okay. it's a um, major road like 476, mm -hmm. it should not be. And I don't. I don't even want to be that site specific. So that well, the, why not? This is very site specific. It's the biomed property. I mean, it's one of those three properties. It, it is. I guess all I was going to say was that um, the way our current zoning is written, it, you, you include all of the land in the right of way for, for across the township for your gross lot. And then with regard to impervious, you don't count the impervious that's in the right of way, which is just screwy and it came up at Adelberger's but yeah. mm -hmm. in any event yeah. um, if they're if we're going to go to the time to write in specific definitions in this ordinance this is a place to do what would make sense and what's logical now so one of two things if we're going to include the right of way then we have to include the impervious in the right of way if we're not going to include the right of way, then you well, know, you could uh, then don't. handle it by saying very specifically uh, a major collector, or not a major collector, but uh, something like Lancaster Avenue or 476, an arterial. I have a question for staff. Uh, Kevin, do you know uh, how is the runoff dealt with on the Blue Route? How does PennDOT deal with it? I don't know specifically, um, but if I pull up Errol, I believe that um, all along the the development of the Blue Route that there are stormwater detention basins, and I believe, uh, Jim, if you can pull up the the overhead. Um, so it doesn't it doesn't impact our township? Uh, actually, well, no, it does. I, I'm, I remember. I'm sure, but what I'm saying is that I believe that they had provided areas of mitigation, mm -hmm. um, and if you look down at the intersection of King of Prussia, Lancaster Avenue, and I think that there's some stormwater management that is not part of the biomed site, um, but part of, I believe it's PennDOT property. Um, there's stormwater management in there, and I think that they've done that throughout. Yeah. Um, I know that there was wetland mitigation Also, areas. 320 in Lancaster, that corner there that's just landscape, that was part of it. Does it address to the extent that our ordinances would require it if, if a private developer was coming in? Probably not, um, but there's, there's mitigation in there. Thank you. So could we would we want to consider um, recommending a change that for the purposes of this um, land use that the whole property would count as the site area, but that we would fix that a problem of counting the impervious, of not counting the impervious within the right of way? Would that make sense to you? What defined? How can you count the property that's under the blue route? Because our township code well, know tells us not that. to. So yeah. I, I, yeah. I'm not a proponent of uh, case by case changing the 
township code. I think the code. I think the code doesn't make any sense. I agree with that. But right. But I think we, we all agree that the code it, that we I think have we should just good. change the code and not change it specifically for this project. So. Uh, what okay when it comes to that i mean you don't count the impervious in the right in the dedicated portion of the right away if it's on your property or you don't even include the the dedicated portion well the existing ordinance says our existing ordinance if i'm saying this wrong please jump in um that when you count the impervious surface you don't count the part that's in the right of way which seems illogical to me but that's it the, the, the way it the way it works when you're Fig calculating the ratio, which is the amount of impervious surface on the lot divided by the total lot area, the amount of impervious surface on the lot, you don't include any impervious surface in the, in the right-of-way. However, you do include the right-of-way in the denominator, the lot size. And so you're getting, you're getting the benefit of a larger lot size, but you're, you're, you're discounting the impervious surface in part of that larger lot size, the, the right-of-way. So that, that's the way impervious surface it works in the ordinance for the most part as a whole. But what's unique in PLO, which is unique, and is that in the PLO specifically, for building area, you, you have to exclude those areas that are within the public right-of-way. Now, I actually had the question of whether or not a SEPTA right-of-way or a, a PennDOT right-of-way is in fact a public right-of-way, but... Um, but that is very specific and unique in the PLO. And the beginning part of this um, must ordinance supersedes that. So we are, if we approve this the way it's written, we are actually creating a more liberal interpretation, which the PLO in and of itself is inconsistent with regard to building coverage, which then ultimately drives density. Um, it's different from how the rest of the township is. I don't know why it's different and unique here, but it is. But Susan, we, are, if, are you referring we, to the 45% um, green space calculation? No, I'm re not more than 30% of the area of any lot may, may be occupied by buildings or structures, and not less than 45% of the total lot area exclusive of those areas within the public right-of-way. Shall be devoted to landscaping and planted in accordance with 225. Landscaped areas shall include non-impervious areas devoted to stormwater management that is not dealing with building. It's so dealing with a green area calculation and it is possible to meet your impervious, your building area and the 45% on the same site, including the area within the right of way and then the green 45% not including the right of way. It is possible. It, so it, that, it may be possible. That's not a building regulation. That is a green area regulation. It's what we, and it's not unique to the PLO that's in the PI district. Um, I believe it may be even be in the PB district. We've interpreted that as an impervious coverage requirement, um, but that's because there's not a specific impervious coverage requirement in the district. Um, but when you read it, it says 45% of the lot area exclusive of those areas within the public right of way shall be devoted to landscaping and planted. Landscaped areas can include non impervious areas devoted to stormwater management. So it, it's not a building, it's not an impervious, it's a green area. And it is possible to achieve the building and the impervious and that utilizing the two different areas. I, I guess because it's written under the section about building area, I take the commas differently. But, you know, but I'm not going to litigate it, so it doesn't matter. I'm just saying that the right is it's just something we should just think about. How do we want to handle right away? Because it's going to be addressed one way or the other, affirmatively or not, by virtue of the definitions that we are examining tonight okay so I'm okay with the way it's written if you can do you, would someone like to make an alternative suggestion I just have a I just need some clarification on, on this notion of what the total site area site area is that's determined by the deed that's recorded in in media the deed and, and a survey and that's all subject to review during the conditional use and land development application if any area is not part of the deed and not part of the lot, um, and we determine that, and that's a legal issue, then they're not entitled, and they don't get to count that area in the calculations. So all this back and forth between 18 acres and 26 acres. No, it's it's, it's just not, it hasn't been this. It's, it, it's, it's, it's worthless. It's it's, it's something it's, a sideshow. 
And it's not something we have to deal with. If it ever becomes a real problem, it's a legal problem. It's not our problem. Correct. Okay. The, I do have one other. I do have one other question, though. And I was just. I thought this had been taken care of, but I guess I misread it the first time. <laughs> Under the definition of uh, of gross uh, floor area, why isn't the uh, a, a, a garages, uh, uh, parking garages, included in that? It, it specifically says the calculation of gross floor area shall not include parking structures. Why is that? Parking structures are not part of a are not considered a building um, and historically have not been regulated as such. Um, we took the opportunity to regulate parking structures specifically in this by putting a parking structure um, requirement of 10% in the ordinance. So there's numerous examples of where parking structures have been constructed and don't meet the building coverage requirements. So that is consistent. We've gone a step beyond that in this ordinance and then further regulated those. So we brought the building coverage down and then also regulated um, parking garages, which weren't previously regulated. Can you guys, because this was another thing I've had in my notes for a while. What's unique about in the PLO, again, is that parking structures are, uh, the way I read it is that they are only allowed to be constructed when they are for the purpose of eliminating allowable surface parking. So in PLO, it's actually like the most regulation. You can't put a parking structure unless it's to remove allowable surface parking, which again, because parking is driven, the, the overall development is driven by the parking demands, you know, office use and whatever the calculations are for parking. Um, I, it, it impacts how you're going to meet your required parking. Now we're getting rid, again, this, this would be superseded by the, the must ordinance, but it, parking structures in the PLO are actually more regulated in, in some regard, because you can only put them in if you're removing surface parking or instead of surface parking, Why not in addition to surface parking. Why else would you put a parking, parking garage in unless you didn't want to put surface parking? That, it, there's no definable quantitative regulation for parking structures in our code. Okay. The must now provides that. Okay. I think we need to take a step backwards could be, because I disagree that the, um, the right-of-way area does not impact um, the decision I'm making. If you have that right-of-way area um, deducted and you need 45% of the remaining area to be green, then you change our, um, under our new must, to have higher buildings. It's a lot easier to find that 45% um, in the new uh, configuration. So whether or not they have that right-of-way restriction existing makes a big difference as to the change in the before and after. Is everyone following that? I mean, it's a significant change. Well, how so much if of that property right of way is right isn't a factor now? Say that it, it's it's not really a restriction. Then that's what our numbers are based on, I believe. So if that piece is taken out, coming up with what is buildable now would be a very different number. Do we know what the right of way is? I mean, there's a large. 30%. It's 7.9 acres of the 26. That's 30% of the property. But is that all right of way? Or is that just the area including the greenery and everything? That's a question. I guess that's, that's the, what I'm asking. I don't know. That's, what, I'm that's, what's, that's what's in question right now. That's what's being debated. And without that information. I'm sorry. Of the whole area, I know we're debating whether or not to include that right of way as part of the lot size, whatever. But of that whole area, some of it is, looks like open green space, and I'm wondering if the right-of-way for the highway covers all of that. I'm just, I don't know. I haven't seen a map or anything. We, we just talk, it's over seven acres. No, the, the impervious is not over seven acres, okay. no. correct? You're not saying that. The area right. that needs to be deducted from the entire lot, uh, uh, no. if no. it's considered right-of-way, to come up with your 45% green space. No. So why are we deducting the right of way? Is that an ordinance? We reduct the right of way? Is that, Kevin? No. So As I understood it, no. we, you said that we were deducting the impervious portion of the right of way. You count the entire lot area, but you don't count the impervious coverage within the right of way. So you count the area of the right of way, but you don't count the impervious coverage in the right of way in doing the <coughs> impervious coverage requirement. As to the question about whether this 7.9 acre piece is all right away, the only map we saw was the first Brandywine exhibit that seemed to suggest that it was all right away. Okay. 
But, but it doesn't matter if it's right away. It matters if it's to us if it's green or not, or, or impervious, right? Because if it's right away and they, if they have the deed to it, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but my understanding is if they had the deed to it, it doesn't matter if it's right away or it's not, they're allowed to count it. Based on our current ordinance, if we change it, that's something else. Based on our current ordinance, they can count all seven acres and as though the blue root wasn't there. No, it's exactly Under the opposite. existing ordinance, not less than 45% of the total lot area, exclusive of those areas within the public right-of-way, shall be devoted to, de to landscaping and, and planted. So that's 45% cannot be right-of-way. No, 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 what they're saying is that you have to deduct, they can't use any portion of the 7.9 acres as counting towards their, their open space, their green space on the rest of the property. Actually, Susan, you, Is that it? you and Regina have pointed out the big problem with that language. Okay. There's two different ways to read it. You guys are both reading it a different w way, and there's two different ways to read it. The one problem under this ordinance is because it is nebulous, um, it, when a developer comes in, they're going to read it the way that's going to be to their best advantage. I, I think what you really need to look at is, I mean, you need to look at, it's a policy decision whether or not you think it's appropriate to include the right of way in this calculation of the floor area ratio or not. And you might, you know, if you want to look at the biomed parcel specifically, you know, you might want to kind of think about it, okay, what if that wasn't right of way? What if they truly did have 26 acres that was entirely theirs, how would that have, and, but they're going to keep it all green, is that something we would want? How would that affect the plan? And I think you need to look at, you need to look at the policy decision, um, is, you know, whether or not you think from a policy standpoint, is it appropriate to include this area, which they do own, that, you know, PennDOT probably bought from them. <coughs> But probably when PennDOT bought for it, the price they, play, they paid was based on the existing counter regulations that probably allowed them to count this towards their development of the rest of the site, i.e. PennDOT paid a lot less for them than if it was basically going to be excluded. But, you know, you need, to, you need to look at it as, you know, whether it's appropriate to keep it in there or not keep it in there. Um, I, mean, I think that's the decision you guys need to make. I just think we need to be uh, fair in our comparison. If under our existing code, you need to provide 45% of the lot area as green space in addition to that right of way, that's what we should be basing our total build out on when we compare existing versus proposed. That's, that's, I just want to be fair about how we're comparing so that we know what the the change we're making is. Because every change that we make in favor of the developers um, should be mitigated. Because we, as much as I'd, lo I'd love to see the site redeveloped, it's not fair for us to give things to this developer that we're not giving to other de developers throughout the township. I, I can actually discuss that point specifically. Um, 200 Radnor Chester Road, the strip that had gone up with the restaurants with Jimmy John going in, Estia, they utilize the area within the right of way. Um, and there's other projects that, um, that's a, a Biomed, or I'm sorry, Brandywine project, other projects that um, Mark's office has worked on, um, 615 Newtown Road. Um, if you recall that not only had the right of way of Newtown Road, but the entire road um, right of way width of Sprawl Road, where they had property on both sides of the road. So there's two examples um, that are consistent with the way we've been interpreting the ordinance since the zoning hearing board decision and um, the You're saying that the right of way is their green space no the the area of the right of way was counted in the lot calculation I'm, I'm talking specifically here about calculating that as part of your 45 percent green space is that no, what they that, did there and and we wouldn't allow them to count that here but that's that's but, not but that's why I'm saying when I look at the existing conditions um, it, it matters to me whether or not that right of way is restricted because of that 45%. The 45% calculation, they would not be allowed to include that area of, of their lot as part of that calculation. 
So is that what the number that we know now as our proposed build out? It, uh, I mean, I'm sorry. Under the existing code, the amount we said they are allowed to build, does that factor that in to the decision to, to come up with the, the maximum build out? In other words, did you base the maximum build out on 18 point whatever acres? No, because to, that's not, I based the building coverage consistently the way we've always based building coverage on the site area. But I guess and, the question we all have is, does the PL district, PLO district tell you you shouldn't do that, that you should exclude this seven acres the, to do that calculation? The 45% calculation is not a building coverage calculation. But to the extent did, did when I know that's not, but it's not a building coverage, but it does impact how much ground you have to cover. And was that taken into account when you maxed out the site to let us know what the full build out is? No, I compared um, the site area for the building coverage, for the impervious coverage. Um, the, the must ordinance deals away with the landscape 45 percent no i know that part so. but for like for existing like what they can do by right so you did mm -hmm. a by right calculation and did you take into effect account this seven acres could not could not be used toward the 45 percent green that is required in the plo district no because we don't have that that wouldn't be we wouldn't have anything to compare that to in the must ordinance so when i did the comparison but, i did but, it but, similar but, to similar but so what you're telling me now, if they take into account that 45, or take that seven acres out and they have to do the 45%, we don't really know what the maximum build out is because when you did the calculation, you didn't take that seven acres out, which you need to do in the calculation. Just forget there was a must. Just say they wanted to come in and build max out. We don't really know. Is that? No, what I'm saying is that you could potentially Max out the building coverage, utilizing the area within the right of way, and so still you, and still meet the forty five percent coverage without utilizing the area within the so, right of way. So so you could take you would take eighteen acres times fifty five percent of that. That's your coverage. That's that's your allowable coverage, and then you could max out your four seventy five square foot within that within that envelope, excluding the seven acres and just working with the 18. I believe within the language of the ordinance, the way it's written, there's a possibility. Now, I've not sat down and done detailed sketches on this, but I believe that there are ways that you can include the area of the right-of-way as part of your building coverage and your impervious coverage and still meet the 45% requirement um, of green areas, landscaped areas, uh, without including the right-of-way. I do believe it's possible. I, mean, I, haven't, I haven't done a sketch, nor will I, um, I don't have that, that luxury or the capabilities of doing that, but I do believe it is possible. My concern is that you need to provide 45% of the total lot area, and you can't use the right of way. So it's the total lot area, which is 26. 45% of 26 has to be green. It can't be within the right of way. So 45 of 26, um, and you take out that other, then what are you left with? Then you've also got to provide parking. So I have a feeling that what we're looking at as far as what they can build now is probably less than what is in that chart. Is everybody on the same page? Well, no. can, so can, in, without that information, I am not comfortable making these recommendations to, to go forward. Kevin, you're going to have to give people a better explanation because we seem to be bogged down in this. Well, I think the issue that the commissioners wanted you to look at is not what the 45% landscaped area that is in the current PLO and if that's a legitimate uh, ordinance requirement, is it confusing? Does it create conflicts within the ordinance? I think, and I agree with Peter that it, it does. Um, they're looking for your recommendation as to the bigger picture issue since we're dealing away with a landscape requirement. Do you include the area within a right of way as part of the lot area calculations of the must? That's what the commissioners asked you to look at trying to tie in what can be done under a 45% requirement utilizing a portion of the site or a 30% requirement using other areas of the site is confusing the matter, not dealing with the must ordinance that is in front of you tonight. I, 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 I feel like what's important to me is that I don't say, okay, let's go forward with something that's gonna double the amount of traffic that was permittable today. 
I, I would not be comfortable with that. So if I don't truly know the traffic impact of what's allowable today, how can I say what's allowable tomorrow won't be double? So That's what I'm saying. I have a real uh, problem with not knowing what the true comparables are. You cannot compare something that's, that's so different because what's I, buildable I, I, today I, I, will have an impact. What's buildable tomorrow will have an impact, and they should not be significantly different. So, Regina, what you're saying, it doesn't matter. The, the question of whether or not the open space or the right of way should be allowed in unto itself is, is, is a, a, a moot question. All that matters is whether or not including it or not including it is going to have a traffic impact. Because yeah, I, I as, think, as far I, as I how much I, is built, my on. recommendation is is you need to ignore the impact and look at the more basic question is from a policy standpoint, do you think it's appropriate to uh, account the uh, property in the right of way towards the total lot area or not count it? What is the more appropriate way to look at what's what's the total lot area and and therefore how much density can you build on the site regardless of whether that density leads to more traffic because guess what you could have a very dense site that is used by lavatory space that's going to have a lot less traffic than a much less dense site that is used as office space so because you know even if the, there's 50 percent less office space there since they use 200 percent more you know more traffic you're going to get double the traffic using office than something that, that is twice the size and but is all laboratory yeah but Peter, I, i'm right with you there because i was the one from the beginning who said come back with something that makes sense traffic wise alter the uses but, but i'm I right think, with you but, but, but the I'm thing is if you're comparing these new uses versus the existing um, worst case scenario, the existing worst case, case scenario has to be realistic with what's allowable under our code. But I think as, as you can see between everything that's presented to you, between the township, between Brandywine, between Biomed, you're never going to know what the worst case scenario is. You're never going to be able to figure it out. That's why you shouldn't be focused. I don't think you should focus on that. I think you should need to focus on the question. Is it appropriate to keep to have the right of way as part of the lot area, or is it you know is it something where hey it's not something they can develop, it's not something they can use, therefore it should be kept out, and that we only should look at what is developable on the site in determining how dense the building on the site is going to be. Yeah, but P Peter, I guess the thing that kind of is bugging me a bit. I think we've probably spent about five hours or more at various meetings discussing traffic and basing all our concerns on what we thought the maximum build out was when the, that we don't know that that's the right maximum build out and the, it wasn't calculated according to the existing ordinance. No, I think Kevin has said that he the maximum build out for the PLO he yes. has used the current PLO requirements. Well that, that's not that that's not what my understanding of what this whole 45%. I mean if you take 26 acres exclude 45 percent but but he he's saying that he didn't he did exclude the right away in determining the 45 percent because no, that's what the current that's ordinance what says said. Right? i didn't i did not do a calculation on the 45 percent because i would have nothing to compare that to to look at the traffic studies they looked at the existing square footages of the buildings that exist on those three parcels 475,000 that was approved on the biomed site what exists on 145 King of Prussia and what currently exists. With those uses in place, that's where they derive the existing trip generations. Then they compared that to a worst case maximum build out analysis under the must. So they did look at that analysis, what currently exists, square footage under current approvals versus what could be built out as a worst case scenario under must. And it was minimal increase without getting into the improvements of how we're mitigating those. But you also had the calculation of what the worst case scenario is under our existing ordinances. From a building coverage standpoint, correct. And at, from a building coverage standpoint, so that so the next, which again I think is the calculation Steve's talking about. So, from a traffic standpoint, the calculation of maximum build out under current ordinances. No one ever translated that to maximum. Yes, we saw a chart of it. The, the traffic guide showed us tonight. Uh, of 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 the, the 
John, whatever his name was. Wichner. Wichner. <laughs> yes, it showed was. Showed us it. that in the chart. <laughs> that's what the four, that's yes. what one of the numbers was. Yes, that was by right. And it and was the, the and maximum. And the, the thing you have to do to calculate the buy right um, it is you have to took it, take it all the different ways, not just um, the 30%. You have to look at all the different things that can control and see what is the limiting factor. And the limiting factor here may be that the open space needs to be 45%, and then you have to provide parking, and you have a certain amount for building space. If that's what the controlling factor is, then that's what it is. That's what's in our code. Whether I like it or not, if our code actually says you can include the right-of-way and pretend it's not important, impervious. I don't like that. But if that's what it says, that's what it says. I don't have the power to change that. I'm not on the Board of Commissioners. So what I do have the power to do is enforce what's existing here, or if we're going to change it, compare it at least to what's existing rather than um, a figure that might be an order of magnitude off. We don't have in the must ordinance a landscape requirement. I'm not talking but about the, the, that the landscape requirement. I'm talking about the amount of square footage you can build today in our code versus what we're going to allow under the new code. That's what I'm talking about. What can you build now? What can you build later? And I understand I will allow them to build more later if, if we mitigate the difference. If we mix the use, then they can build more later. But I, I just have to have a very comfortable feeling about what that difference is. That, that chart that was just up a moment ago that showed the buy right traffic, that number, 620 under buy right, that number in some fashion was calculated based on the maximum build out under the existing ordinances. How else could it have been derived? It's not the existing traffic. It's it's not the existing traffic. The existing traffic is is much 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 less because I believe that is based off of and John can correct me, but I believe that is based off of the approved plans for 475,000 square feet of office. That would be correct. And that number came from Kevin. Kevin based those calculations on what's allowed by the ordinance. No, I base those calculations off of an approved land development plan and a plan that showed that they can achieve that square footage of office with parking on the site under current site conditions without any additional approvals. And that that's was based, what that number yeah, is based that's on. That's by right. That's based on the 475,000 square feet of office space, correct? Yes, which utilizes existing buildings and buildings that were approved within the last three years from under a previous land development, converting those to all office and then adding additional underground parking, which they can do. Parking structures are not buildings. They can do it. They don't need land development approval. Land development approval in and of itself does not mean that it's not by right. Right. Well, so th uh, uh, okay. your analysis that you're asking for is there regardless of the 45%. The 45% provision that's in our current code is confusing. It conflicts with other areas of the code. We're writing it out of the must ordinance because it's not an appropriate provision. I believe that you can achieve under current regulations the maximum building coverage requirements at the three stories and still meet the 45% requirement as it's written. I have a question, Kevin. Um, the plan that we're talking about that was approved in 2009, and we, we saw that up on the screen, but it seemed to suggest that the, part, the lot size was the 19. I believe what you saw was not the approved land development plan. Uh, I believe that may have been an exhibit from a zoning hearing board. Um, there is a history um, throughout the township of parcels being calculated a variety of different ways. Um, the zoning hearing board took this issue up on the Attleburger site, um, and it's been in enforced consistently since that point in time. Prior to that, prior to my arrival here at the township, it's been a grab bag of whoever wanted to enforce it a, at, at their leisure. Um, it was done that way. Multiple sites, an individual site has been um, calculated differently. Um, 200 King of Prussia Road, or Radnor Chester Road, um, was done multiple different ways through zoning, through land development, through grading permit. There's three different calculations on those permit plans from one engineer, one property owner. So it, I can't give you an explanation as to why. Um, I look at consistency. Um, since sitting here and board made that determination, that's the way we've been consistently doing it since that point in time. Okay, we're not going to continue with the same discussion. We have got to make a decision or move on. So would you all like to discuss the policy issue of whether or not the right-of-way should be included 
How, if we Peter, included, how do we phrase that, the two different right. policy? What's the best way to phrase the... Uh, well, the, 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 you can keep it the way it is, in which case the right-of-way is included in the total site area. Right. Or you can, you know, add a, sen uh, a second sentence to the definition of total site area that says, uh, shall not include areas of the lot located in a, you know, legal right-of-way or existing right-of-way. I right. would like to not include the right-of-way in uh, the area used to calculate density. I agree with that. All in favor of that? Can I ask a question before we go no. there? No. <laughs> Opposed? On the other side of that right-of-way, there's a piece of property that they own. Is that part of the... Doug, no. They'll have to stop. Let's not talk about that because... When that comes in, they'll prove whether it's right away, whether they own it or whatever. But as a general policy, I don't think we should include Lancaster Avenue, 476, that type of arterial okay. uh, and we just all calculation that, right? of... For, okay. Okay. All, let's do it again. All those in favor? Not including oh, in that the density calculation. Opposed? I, I agree. Yeah. Okay. It's unanimous. That is one of six topics we need to cover just specifically requested by the commissioners. And here we go. Now we're doing, all right, rather than go through page by page, we're going to co cover these six issues. Um, let's talk about the shuttles. The question is, um, since we've made the area smaller and it's right next to the train, are shuttle buses going to be ineffective? Uh, mitigation, or uh, so one one side of that would be they're not as effective because people can walk to the train because the site the overall ordinance change the zoning area change is smaller and and centered on the train stations. Um, the other side to that is that the shuttles serve more than just uh, driving people from the building to the train. They make other connections to other transportations and other areas. So, what are your thoughts on that? I, I've got a question on policing. How is that? No, I'm throwing it open to the staff. No, Anybody policing back? is another issue. If we want to talk about how are we going to police these things in the future, that's a different issue. But in terms of the effectiveness of the shuttles, what do you think? Well, and the reason Elaine asked it, because mm -hmm. she was the one who asked it last night. That was Elaine. It was Elaine. It was in regard to whether or not the shuttle system in such a small area, when the, when the area is, is walkable now, whether or not that's worthy of a category two alternative to get you the bonus density. That's the reason she asked it. Right. Is whether or not it should then, is it going to be effective Is it going to be effective as a mitigation? Well, yeah. it, the effectiveness is going to depend on how reliable, if the traffic is so bad that it's going to take you longer to take a shuttle than it is to walk, then most likely it's not going to help. I mean, is it to get people to take the train or is it to get people to uh, what is it? It could, get, it, it could be to get people to different train stations. It could be to get people to different bus stations. It could be... If they're going to walk or shuttle, then it really shouldn't matter. It could also be for inclement weather. weather. Bad so, weather. So yeah. if, we're, if we're looking at people who might walk or might shuttle, it, it, it would just encourage them to be a regular train rider. Is that what we're looking for? Because then yes. I, think it would, I think it would be effective. Okay. Then our second question is, is it in the right category? Okay. So what page is that on? Thank you. Everybody turn to page 13. Okay, right now that's in category two. Your category two bonuses are your lower threshold. I would not recommend that that's a category one. Um, it's, no, there's no category three. Okay. <laughs> no, the, uh, now, do people think that, that the mitigation that might come from that, do you have a sense that that's worthy of being a category two mitigation? I think, I think it is. I don't think it's worth being a mitigation at all. I, I, I think that I think that the shuttle bus thing is 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 utter nonsense if you're talking about potentially adding 25 percent or 10 percent to the size of a building. I, I just don't think it's worthy of mitigation. Yeah, I agree, the especially air. if it's only going to service the air, just that area where the where the bus is located. If it's going to go maybe over to Radnor and run between Radnor and there and Wayne, you know, and, and there can are, move more people around, maybe get more people out of their cars. That makes sense. But I think I think Doug's got a good point. There's and no parameters as to that it only has to serve the rails. That would be something specifically um, that would be discussed during the conditional use. And if it's 
um, part of something that you say, okay, you know, it can not only, you're providing it for your tenants and for your residents to not only get them from um, the R5 line to the R100 and between the properties, but also to get them to other areas of the township, down to the shopping centers, down into Wayne. Um, those shuttles um, can serve more than just the, the transit. Well, my concern is that they're going to say, oh, yeah, we're going to do this, we're going to do this, and they're going to say six months down the road when nobody's using it, we That's got one policing. person policing. That's policing. That's and we another have, issue. We have protections in the ordinance for that. But my response to which is I don't even think we should consider it because of that possibility. You know, That's my I, opinion. And the other thing I think we should consider is that there's a few of these that seem lighter in, in their mitigation effects than others. Um, and I was wondering if we could combine some of them. Like if we thought it is maybe worthy to have a shuttle system as one of the options, but combine it with one of the other ones, it doesn't seem as meaty, like number four. You know, so one and four, you have to do both of those to count as one. Because they're both a little bit, in my mind, a little bit lightweight compared to some of the others. So I think if they go together and they go together and we put them together, it could be a fairly good mitigation benefit. Julie, Julie I think we should have like six things instead of 16 or eight things maybe eight things the the risk of doing that then is that you then lower the number that you can require because you only have four density bonuses so four density bonuses at three from a category two gives you 12 and we're providing 13 so of the 13 one developer coming in getting all the density bonuses is going to be doing 12 of 13 you start doing that, then we either have to come up with less the, the ratio um, of number of alternatives to put in. Um, that's, we, we, maybe, we did take a look at that. Well, maybe we should have a, you know, fewer things that they have to do, but more important things. More you know, traffic I can related. Speak, I can very briefly speak to the shuttle. We're doing a shuttle out of the business improvement district. The only possible reason we got it off the ground is that we got a five hundred thousand dollar grant over the first three years. Otherwise, it, we, you know, it's financially impossible. And even now, the riders have to pay a dollar to use it uh, from a company that subsidizes it if they work for that company, and everybody else pays too. And we don't break two hundred rides uh, in two weeks. And that's coming and going, and that's with four shuttles. So. Oh, I mean, the other thing about that with regard to Kevin's calculation on the, or his assessment about the bonuses is, um, I would recommend su striking one of them. The, the last one just seems nothing other than sites. Okay, you know. but we're not doing that yet. I know that, but we're All talking right. about the, so you ask him about the shuttle system, I know. I'm just saying, so there might be a way to be able to, to still keep several of these in order to get a bonus. There's, right. there's lots of different ways to approach it. Well, I would recommend for this one that we either take the shuttle system out as an option or that we combine it with number four. I would recommend combining them. I can't see that a shuttle system is a bad thing. I just don't think it's a standalone, ca you know, okay. bonus worthy Who can item. agree with that? I can agree with that. I agree, there's less than 15%. Okay. I don't think the will work. Well, it'd be hopeful. Okay. Um, the next one is the ability of this ordinance to require off-site mitigation of traffic and implementation of infrastructure improvements. I think... Was well, that a legal question? Yeah, I... I don't think we can answer that. Peter answered it, but I don't think we can answer it. Can I ask a quick question? Sure. Now, um, say they provide the shuttle. It's proven um, to be effective. Great. If it's no longer going to be continued because no one's on it. What happens? Do they have to do something different? It costs money, lots of money. They get they get a a, a fee. No, they okay. get a fee in this one scenario. I'm talking Are they given about. the opportunity to to flip it out for some other we, alternative? We, we have three years to make it sort of pay and to encourage no, no. employers to support in it. This scenario. What we happens? we do have provisions oh. for accountability that on an ongoing annual basis, the property owner has to provide documentation to the township that they are fulfilling their requirements and in what manner, um, as well as if they f uh, fail to fulfill an alternative, there's provisions in there um, that spell out what an applicant must do. Um, in essence, they're coming back to the Board of Commissioners and they're readdressing the issue. I want it to make sense. I don't want them to continue a shuttle that no one's on. Uh, no. If page 15, number five in parens, uh, that's the provision that specifically addresses that, that issue. 
What happens when the shuttle is not, be, it's cold weather outside, nobody's riding the shuttle in the non-peak hours, and it's just sitting out there running the motor so the person who's driving it can stay warm for six of the eight hours that it runs? And that's my concern. That's just a lot of sitting time. Some shuttles don't run except at peak times. Peter, the problem with five, uh, the failure to fulfill an alternative, is that if, and Kevin mentioned it, is that if an applicant already utilized all the alternatives to get all four bonuses, what more is there for them they, to do? They, the the, the um, category one alternatives regarding offsite improvements, each location you do an offsite improvement at can be, uh, can be a uh, separate alternative. Therefore, if you come back and say, we don't want to do the shuttle anymore, and the only thing available to them is an offsite improvement somewhere, that's what they're going to end up having to do. Okay. Um, number three on the list also was review the anti-family restriction on the number of one-bedroom apartments. This is appropriate for this use or district. My thought was that it's appropriate because we don't have a lot of, um, well, I could be wrong, so correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, my impression is that most of the um, housing in this township is family oriented, almost all of it. So having some more housing in the family that leans towards families, uh, people without large families or children um, might be appropriate, especially since this is a business area. So the question is more of, uh, uh, is it socially appropriate? Is that what the question is? is it is a pl as a planning thing. Is yeah, it, is it appropriate? Then I agree with you because mm -hmm. I, I think that we are shorter on the, you know, um, people, uh, taxes and we things go up and you want to stay in town, you sell your house and move, you know, retirement place. I don't know. Uh, I'm, 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 well, this is one of the things, the question is why we have a 65% minimum. I think, I, I think establishing what that. What page is? That's on page... Uh, Eight. Thank you. I think that was to keep the impact in the school down. Well, yeah, it's but, a but budget. My response to which is, I would be very much attracted to having a two-bedroom apartment if there's a school right across the street. And the impact on the school district is that the That's revenues right. are inadequate <laughs> if you have children. It's also an issue of parking and traffic. You have kids, you're going to be a lot more trips than a, someone who is single. So for this site, we're trying to keep the traffic down. It's not necessarily a place we want to have a lot of families. Since we have that everywhere else in the township, it might be the best place for it. Didn't, did I read that, maybe it was a memo, maybe it, I don't even know where I read it. The target size for these apartments is 1,000 square feet. Did I, did I read that? I think that was hotel rooms. The, the code does uh, I'm not asking regulate because that, so I, are, I... I'm asking because I'm curious if the percentage about apartments or residential is a percentage based on square footage or a percentage based on the number of apartments. It would be the number of apartments. So if there are smaller apartments, you can juggle, you know, you can put more in there to, that are smaller, to kind of... Is this you, you can only go so small, Susan. I mean, no, no, that's have, why have, I said that. That's yeah. why I'm curious about where I read the 1,000 yeah. square feet. Susan, I think that's too small. I, I think I know. I can clarify. When uh, we were developing the trip generation, the trip generation rates are based on the square footage. That's where so I read So we it. had to come up with a predictable size, and that was something that we agreed to. Okay, so it wasn't a development thing. It was your it's trip not, generation. It's just Thank converting you. the square footage that uh, was provided by Kevin so that we could come up with some kind of a way to determine what the trip generation would be for the site. And we go by the number of dwelling units, so we had to come up with an average size of each of the dwelling units to convert it and come up with some kind of a number of dwelling units so that we could develop the trip generation. So that means that there's 1.2 spaces for a 1,000 square foot apartment, hypothetically? Uh, yes. If but the apartments will probably be half that size, or maybe two thirds. I can't, you know, I can't. I have no idea what the, size apartments. The total. So that would impact the trip generation substantially. It could. I, I don't think a thousand feet is that unreasonable. And also, and that doesn't that's include also, like hallways, stairwells, all that say, kind of stuff. So it is. It's a good number. Storage areas, uh, all that stuff. It's not specific to that apartment. 
So now that we've reviewed the anti-family restriction on the number of one-bedroom apartments, this is appropriate for this use or district. My thought is that it is appropriate for the use, of, use in district. Can I see a show of hands? People who disagree. I, I think also because we're trying to encourage um, people who will ride the train, um, right. it works. Uh, okay. Be a reason that you might have a, have a family because somebody could walk to the train and they only need one car or, or, or no cars at all. Okay, how much discretion does the township have and what improvements are worthy of a bonus? Does the vagueness of the language limit the township's ability to get a desired off site improvement? Kevin, can you address that? I believe Peter's addressed that in his memo, in his memo. Um, to you. And I believe the answer is yes, we can and we do have input and can control what improvements, where they are, and what they look like. Okay, tell me what page this is on. No, but where do we see that in the ordinance? We don't. Um, it's, it was a general concern because okay. we don't get into specific lists per se in the ordinance, although as part of the application process, the sounds would develop a list, provide that to the applicant to okay. uh, implement the phase one alt or category one alternatives. And if, and if you don't have a copy in the memo, I do have copies here for you if you want one. <clears throat> back to the teeth of the, back to your list though, Julia. Yes. The first yes. part of that question was whether or not they are, are relevant and, and applicable for bonuses. Is that right? Actually, I think there's a I bigger elephant in the room than that, and that's the density of this. I think we're getting into very minute details on things. They aren't so minute, but I think, oops. Well, I was just trying to answer these six questions before we got into, these are specific questions the commissioners okay. asked us. I want to make sure that's that we fine, didn't ignore them. That's fine, but I just want to them. make sure we but uh, but then we'll talk about address density because I yeah. think that's the major issue in that because that drives traffic. Okay. I think um, what I'm kind of getting the feeling that people are thinking is that rather than require three um, and give more choices, we'd rather have two and have stronger choices. Is that the kind of thing we're looking at that are more related to the, the transportation issues? Or like, you know, maybe um, coupling up the ones that are a little, what we feel maybe aren't, aren't as strong and doubling them up onto one and maybe only require, what, what's your sense of that? Can we go with um, requiring fewer but making them stronger? We can in category um, two, at, I guess. At the end, you're still getting the same improvements, um, so it, you know, it doesn't really matter. I mean, we, you can combine um, multiple ones and reduce the the choice in the pool, um, but then you, if you require less because of the the number of density bonuses that are built into the ordinance, you still get somebody that's going to utilize all four density bonuses, doing majority of the improvements in the alternatives that are shown in here so in the end you'll if you if you maximize it you'll end up with a similar product yeah. is what you're saying Correct. i guess it is a little bit um it's hard to be in at this point now and envision what's going to be happening later um you know how how these things are going to work out so it is it's a very it's a different kind of thinking um understanding that process when they're going to come and present these ideas to you and whether or not you're going to feel like they were worthwhile and so i guess i mean i could go either way with it i think you're right it, it might just be you know the same either way the meat of the the bonus program is not in the category two it's in the category one that's where we're getting the transportation the offsite improvements those that are in category two are things that are part of best management practices that most of them, some of them have no impact on traffic whatsoever, but they're really good things to incorporate. Um, you can't voluntarily ask somebody to consider a site like Biomed as, as Meadow, but if they want a density bonus, we can require them to do that. So those are things that, no, it's not gonna impact traffic, but it's a really good thing for the community. They can do the one of the category ones and three of these things that don't really, that aren't, you know, not stormwater management. You know, they can do three others, you know, 10% of apartments furnished, you know, come on. What, what if we did like an A and a B in category two and, and the A's being the ones that we really, really want and then the B's being the easier ones to do? Would that make sense to like, have, you know, that's why we did a category one and a category Wait, two. Category one, I understand, is yeah. like a totally different thing because that's those those are costly, but they're also traffic related. But then in 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 the next um, category, um, would we want to? Pro I mean, or would we want to just 
focus on things that are stormwater and things and just require less of them and just chop the other ones off entirely? How, how do we want to? I'd like to hear. Everybody's complaining about traffic. Nobody has mentioned anything here about how we can mitigate it. That, that's the category one issue. So I, I'm, kind of, issues. I'm kind of skipping down. Density. Right, we're going to get to that. But I'm, I'm kind of skipping down to category two just for a second, just because I want to okay. address that comment. And I was wondering, did I read in here that you cut back on the number of categories required? We from took some five of the to category. Um, yes, but the overall total number of alternatives that would be implemented are higher because we took some of the category twos. Um, actually, we took a category one, which was a shuttle, and made it a category two. And we took two of the category twos, um, the charging stations and the car share program, and made those requirements. So in the end, what was previously an applicant only had to do 15, you're getting 18 improvements, 16 from this ordinance plus the two that then are part of the base ordinance. So there's actually more requirements of an applicant because we made two um, that were category two part of the base ordinance that they had to do regardless. Okay. Um, let's take a moment to see where we are. The hour is growing late. Um, I, I, I'd leave Malone. I, 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 don't, I, I feel like personally we're micromanaging a little bit and I think we have bigger fish to fry and I, I think I'd, I'd leave this one alone. But that's just, My question yeah. is, do you want to set a time limit tonight? I mean, it's already 11 o'clock. We could talk about this for hours or do you want to move to just plan to continue at our next meeting? We have a special meeting planned on Thursday. Isn't, I'm sorry, isn't that correct? I'm sorry, I got something wrong. No. Um, the Board of Commissioners no. set a hearing date last night. We don't meet again before the hearing date unless right. we make a specific request, which, uh, you know, I was at the meeting last night, so I did hear Elaine, the Board President, say that, um, you know, if we feel like we needed more time, we should let her know that. Now, it was a really vocal conversation and vocal debate about whether or not the hearing date should have even been set last night. And it, um, w it's not how it's customarily done, but they did what they did. So I, I can't see in all good conscience, I mean, Kevin made a lot of really good changes to this, but we still have not yet had a substantive conversation about what Kathy's saying, the biggest thing about this, which is density. And that's not even beginning to, you know, what do we have, three or four more things on our agenda tonight? Um, I would recommend that we, um, that we would consider tabling this now and send an email and a request to the Board of Commissioners. P please give us a chance to do what you've asked us to do. I mean, we had a whole, not a whole brand new ordinance thrown at us, but a, you know, different concepts, different density, all sorts of things. After our last meeting, we're not getting even two months chance to consider something before something new is thrown at us and we end up kind of starting all over again and listening to a host of new thoughts and comments on it. And I actually appreciate that for the first time we had lots of members of the public tonight and not just simply the, the applicant and, and the other very interested parties. Uh, that was actually great tonight that we finally heard from them, but it's not really fair to us. Now, maybe they'll ignore that too, I don't know, and maybe they'll set the hearing date, but I, I can't, I mean, it's 11 o'clock. How much longer are we gonna go? No, but when my concern too is that, you know, when we get to this point, we're really into it, now we're having a good, I think, a very productive discussion, and we wanna get to the media issues, the ones about the density. Um, I'm worried if we wait a month, we're going to be back at stage. I mean, obviously, you know, we don't need to. Could we meet in between? Well, that's my question. Is the board willing to meet again, as we did with some of the other projects, if it's possible? I'm, I'm willing. I'm willing. Yeah. Generally, I, I'm willing. I think we have to. And what are you going to do about these other poor souls that were on the agenda here? Well, that, uh, it's going to be very interesting. <laughs> um, no, Kevin, I don't think we should go to any more now. I really can't. Kevin, feel. is there a date, do you know, coming up where we can have another meeting? Um, we're checking on that now um, checking to on see it. what the availability of this room would be for that. So I think I, we're making good progress now. I think we're going to get to a. Uh, a is this another point. one of those, no more public comments, we just finished our discussion? No, this would, be the, the, this would be our conversation continuing on. We've already had public comment. Right. The other thing is that meeting should be just on biomed. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Well, they're checking. Um, my other question to staff is, we have several items we obviously did not get to on our agenda for tonight. Is there anything that is like the world will end if we don't do it? Could I, I, I recognize that. Um, Who's here? Come on up. Hang on. I lost my glasses because I'm on top of my head. You're here for what? You're here for, for um, the subdivision. Hang on. Which one? 344 King of Prussia. The 344 King of Prussia. And 613 West Lancaster. At 613 West Lancaster. Um, my suggestion would be that we try to do each of them in 15 minutes and at least try because okay. people have been you know, bravely waiting all this time and that we then table this to continue this discussion, not a new discussion, at, at, a, at another meeting. Okay? Okay. Can I have a motion to table? I move, I move that we table the uh, discussion that we've been having on the must ordinance. Okay. I'm sorry. Second. Second. Continue, continue it, yeah. It. We're going to continue it. Um, all in favor? Aye. 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 So everyone, please just, you know, read it again. <laughs> we won't have any new, hopefully, any new documents before then. Madam Chair, if we, we looking at the um, available dates, we have the 13th, um, which is next Monday, as an available date. There are other dates that um, are after the 27th. Show of hands, who can do the 13th? I cannot. Okay. What else you got? 12th is the 14th. Kevin, was the 14th yeah, an option? The 14th was um, not available. I have another township meeting that night that's just okay. not in this room. Um, and the 29th and 30th, which are We can meet earlier if we need to. Yeah, that's... Okay. Wednesday the 15th. 14th would... Um, Wednesday the 15th. No, it's not available. What about at 4 o'clock? <laughs> unfortunately, I don't have the meeting schedule. I just, you know, okay. usually with the night meetings, um, usually well, during the day. Our um, Thanksgiving meeting was a day meeting. Correct. Um, usually the days are open um, up till about 6.30, 7 o'clock is when the night meetings kick in. So how about the 14th? Sue's going to find out for us right now. Thank you. Yeah, we're going to continue. Um, okay, can we have um, 344 King of Pressure Road, please? We could meet any time on the 14th, so whatever time would be convenient. Um, my meeting starts at 7. I'd be leaving here at 6.30. Um, so prior to that, I mean, if we set at 2 o'clock again. During the day on the 14th? Okay, show of hands, who thinks they could be here the afternoon of the 14th? I understand. Okay, let's shoot for 2 o'clock on the 14th. Thank you. Thank you. 2 o'clock, she said. Um, our, tra uh, I can, our traffic engineer has a conflict, actually, because she has a meeting with me and one of the applicants at 2. So what time can you do? You know, I'm thinking 2.30. 2.30? Uh, Let's do 3. Are, are, I think we could do 2.30. Okay. Okay. That's still good for me. Okay, this is a... Um, <coughs> land development application. <coughs> Excuse me. I've got a frog in my throat. Uh, this is a subdivision um, at 344 King of Pressure Road. It's like this. They put up the map, right? This is the one that's across from St. Martin's Church, right? Yep. Correct. Okay. The floor is yours. Yeah, get, get your calendar in there. <laughs> um, this is a, uh, as you said, a subdivision across from the St. Martin Church. It is a, um, it, it's a ten, there's an existing home, you see lot number one. It is subdivided off, off a uh, parcel indicated here as lot number two. Um, uh, 
nothing really that significant about it. Dave Fiorella, if you want to just address what's going on here. I've shown the vicinity plan. Uh, our existing parcel is on the corner of Glen Mary and King of Prussia. Uh, as Nick said, there's an existing uh, house that was recently renovated on the corner. The proposal is to subdivide the property into uh, two lots, build a second house, or build a new home on the second lot. I'm sorry, we have... Um Roger's letter, um, where I did not notice any serious comments, um, but a question came up that we had seen this site before. I think at the time before that house was renovated, it had come by, and and people complained about the, sh just the shape of the house, so it's nice to hear it's been renovated. Um, the other thing I remember from that, um, application was that there were some serious stormwater issues on that road uh, going downhill and that there were some issues with the size of the lots. So where are we with that? Well, with the lot sizes, uh, the lot sizes are, are measured uh, to the existing right-of-way line. Uh, the existing right-of-way line uh, shown along Glen Mary Road and we have um, the sufficient lot area to meet the requirements of the ordinance uh, for both lots. The, um, I, I just handed Roger, because I have the papers from when this was not yes. passed the first time, and it said the, um, the problem before, three years ago, was that the applicant had requested, the former applicant, so it's not this applicant, Correct. had requested a waiver from Section 255.27.C4 streets, where it says, where a subdivision abut or contains an existing street of inadequate right-of-way width, the Board of Commissioners may require the reservation or dedication of rights of way to conform to the above standards. The center line of the ultimate right of way shall be the same center line as the existing right of way. Susan? Yeah, did uh, that impact it? That, that is actually being provided by the applicant. The 60 foot ultimate right of way is shown on the plan. So then, how did the numbers not end up being enough three years ago? Uh, oh, wait, I, I, I can't speak month. to what hang happened on. three years ago. I can no, only no, no, speak to on. what's on the I plan have, now. All right, well, I'll look, keep talking. And did you look at the stormwater issues there? I know that there had been a problem with the stormwater going down the street, and that was a flood-prone area. And the neighbors had been very concerned about um, any additional construction there uh, exacerbating that flooding. The, the stormwater, any stormwater issues, and the, the, the applicant will be required to conform with the stormwater ordinance when they come in for a grading permit to actually put a structure on that property. At this point, they're just subdividing the land. We, we did prepare uh, plans showing uh, the house that the uh, applicant proposes to build, uh, the driveway and a garage. We do have a stormwater system that was designed. So this uh, plan is approved. These plans will be submitted for the grading permit, which will be reviewed at that time. Was the um, uh, first, the house has just been renovated. Was there any stormwater mitigation on that? Uh, there was a small stone bed uh, added for some of the existing, or from the additional impervious cover that was added to that lot. So that was done. A uh, grading permit had been submitted to um, Roger, uh, which was reviewed, and the stormwater system was designed and installed as part of that work, yes. Okay, so new impervious was picked up. Yes. But the existing structure is, was not. That is correct. Okay. Is there significant stormwater running off that, down the hill to the, to the part you're about to divide off? Uh, right now, the site is vacant, or the lot is vacant. Uh, there is remnants of what appeared to be an old driveway or garage that may have been there at one time. Our stormwater management was designed here as looking as the, as the lot was completely meadow, so we're taking this back to meadow conditions and providing the stormwater in, in accordance with the ordinance. What's not to deal with the, the existing house problem? Um, I'm, not sure, I'm not aware of the problems with the existing house. There's not a whole lot of stormwater running off from that property out of this one that you're mitigating. Correct. All right. In the, um, in the plan we had before, the building area for the house on the 
well, you're calling it lot two. Okay. Um, the 35 foot front yard setback was net of the right of way dedication. Is that typical? In yours, it's part, the 35 foot setback is part of it? It's just different. I'm not sure which one's right, but it's different. Um, I mean, we're going to take the position ours is right. I, I, we're looking through the ordinance, you know, it defines a lot area to the right of way. Uh, and then our setbacks are measured. We have measured uh, our setbacks back from the ultimate right of way. Yeah, it says in, in lot area, it goes through uh, in the ordinance. It talks about the lot area, the area contained within the property lines of a lot. So the D, we've talked about this a lot. Right? Yes. And then it deducts certain things, uh, floodplain, wetlands, steep slopes, none of which apply here. This is the land within an existing public right of way. So what this is measured from is from the existing public right of way, which is the the existing pub, the the existing property runs up to the existing right of way line in Glen Mary, but does extend into the center line of King of Prussia. So we have subtracted the area of the King of Prussia Road right of way out. So our our, our lot areas. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm talking about the the other lot. But the other thing oh, is that in residential districts, in the def, in the Saldo definition for lot area, you took out the right of way, right? Yes. As yes. part of the. Right. Yes. We took out and the. We took that out. And you took that out. Okay. Okay, thank you. Is there any public comment? I don't see that. Susan, as we discussed earlier, there's no right of way to deduct on lot two because the, the description of the property doesn't go into the street. It stops at the right of way line. But so that, so that other waiver that was requested a few years ago where there's an, in, an existing street with in, with, of inadequate right of way and they have to dedicate that right of way to conform to the standards, that, that doesn't apply now, three years later? I don't know what was done three years ago. I can't speak to that. Okay. Uh, the, and then the, 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 the section of the code that you just uh, showed me here, uh, I, I believe is met by where the ultimate right of way is shown on the, on the current plan that was submitted and that's under consideration. Okay. Now, Susan, I think there was something like this with uh, Adelberger. There was a potential to add to the right of way, and I don't think we required it. Or there was a request for a waiver, maybe? Does that there sound familiar? There was a request for a waiver, and I think an easement was granted for the Adelberger for the additional right of way. Okay, public comment? I don't know. <laughs> Okay, I'm uh, Dr. John Williams. Uh, I own the property at 676. Dr. Williams, would you like a microphone? So you oh, um, we give them to tall people. Okay, sure. Um, I'm Dr. John Williams. I own the property uh, at 676 Glen Mary Road. Um, and I wanted to make several uh, points about this. First of all, the uh, the owner of the uh, of that lot there, they did a great job with, uh, you know, with the property at the corner, really appreciate that. Um, but I have a number of uh, concerns about this uh, current plan here, some very significant con concerns. Uh, the first is the, uh, the stormwater runoff, uh, having resided there for a number of years, is very significant. Uh, even with that land completely, you know, currently undeveloped and just you know, with just a hundred percent pervious, um, it, whenever there is a rainstorm, it's like a lake uh, down, uh, you know, next to six seven six Glen Mary, and so uh, that has been a, a concern for a number of years. Flooded basements, uh, you know, just really not a good situation in terms of the. Uh, the stormwater runoff. The second concern I have is um, a plan was put forward, a very similar plan three years ago, and was not passed. And now, uh, you know, we're being told that uh, that this should pass, that something has changed. And I would really ask this board to do uh, extreme due diligence to make sure that. Uh, 
that we really understand uh, whether this, under the current uh, code, is uh, you know is is permissible? Because it just strikes me as very odd that you know uh, the land didn't change; it didn't get bigger, and yet now we're saying that the plan should work. So I want to make sure that we're not we're not just missing uh, you know something here, and that it just kind of slides by and uh, gets developed. The third thing I'd like to bring up is the traffic. Um, Coming up to, uh, you know, coming up to King of Prussia Road on Glen Mary uh, makes you know the whole idea of uh, of having a driveway there, sort of coming out there, make it very difficult. I don't think it's it's safe uh, in terms of, you know, uh, I, first of all, I don't know how someone could actually even pull out of there at certain hours of the day. It's it's an extremely congested uh, area. Um, uh, which is, you know, which is sort of a, which is kind of another concern that I have, and uh, and then the other, you know, another still yet another concern is um, the whole concept of uh, the the school. I'm a, I'm a little bit concerned about what the long term plan is for these properties. Um, some of you may remember uh, that uh, about eight, seven or eight years ago, the, the tenant. Uh, who, who was at the corner building was actually arrested for uh, child pornography, uh, you know, and I was there in the morning when they, they came up, uh, you know, <laughs> the FBI and all that kind of stuff. It's right next to a school. Um, I think uh, I've spoken... We don't really get into pornography issues at the Planning Commission. No, okay, well, I just, <laughs> I just wanted to... It, it did happen, and so, uh, so I, I'm just... I'm concerned about... Uh, you know the the density there, and and having uh, another property which is not going to be a uh, uh, you know an owner occupied property. So, um, so that's uh, you know the, those are those are my concern. But most of all, this whole idea of you know why did this not pass three years ago, and now we're considering it again, and suddenly it fits passes muster. Thank you. Thank you. Does anybody know whether or not any of those properties perk, or if there are any other stormwater systems in any neighboring homes that can help control any of the stormwater? It seems to be one of your concerns. So do we know if the property perks? Do any of the people have stormwater systems nearby? Roger? I think Mr. Friarello can answer that because he perked the other we, lot. We did percolation tests on this lot and got fairly good results for percolation. So our stormwater management is designed with that in mind. I do have a question. Do, um, does this slot slope towards the back? If, if I remember correctly, there were, there were people behind them who were also complaining about stormwater and this, stuff. This lot actually slopes um, towards, I guess, I guess. Yeah, but I mean, does it also slope towards, I mean, away from Glen Mary Lane, or is it? No, it slopes towards Glen Mary Lane. It, it's generally sloping, I, I guess, um, in, in direction. As, as my arrow points. If I can jump here in here also, board. Uh, I'm Matt Lombardi, I'm the owner. The, this property on the bottom of the hill, I also purchased that after we began all this. And this has a basement, and they're real, it's a substantial depth of basement. I'd say the, the floor joists are maybe seven feet high when you're standing down there. And um, there really isn't too much, I've never seen water down there. I've been in the house, you know, 100 times. And on really rainy days in the spring, you can you can tell it's, it's it smells moldy slightly, or you can tell there's moisture down there. But my plan is to renovate this house, do a gut renovation on this, and um, you know if any water comes down that hill, I'm the first house that the water is going to hit. So by building this house and putting a storm uh, you know management system in, if any water does continue to come down that hill, I'm the first person it gets to. So you know I have to take care of it before anybody else would. So. I just wanted to make it clear that I also own this house, and that's well, my okay. What about the to. what about the behind the property line in the back? This right here. No, uh, down a little further. Over here. Yeah, that one where the pool is. Is there water? I mean, is the water running? You Not really, because my this property right here is actually probably the lowest spot. It's the lowest spot is between these two lots right now, where I'm pointing at along here. All right. And um, you know, so that's where kind of the water naturally settles now. 
Um, but this basement doesn't really get much, and if it ever did, you know, at that point I'd address it because I'm hit harder than, any, than anybody else in the town in the, this little cul-de-sac, you know. I do remember when this came before that somebody made mention in very clear tones that, that water was a real problem. I think it was that yeah. was the, that was the property. Apparently so. Yeah, this was the one that sold to us, I guess. <laughs> um, I do have a question about the definitions for side yards and rear yards, if Peter and, and Roger. So if the, for lot one, if King of Prussia is their address and it fronts on King of Prussia, and I, I do say that for front yard setbacks, it has to be a front yard on each street on which the lot abuts. So they do have two front yards. But if the address is King of Prussia Road for this address, why isn't the rear yard the yard between lot one and lot two? Why, why do they get to choose? The, hey, that's the I first can answer part of the that, question. Susan. All right, hang I, on. That's the first part of the question. The second part of the question is, which is weird anyway, it says that every single family detached dwelling has to have, shall be two side yards. I mean, that doesn't really make sense in this case, but. So what was the answer about that? Under the definition of yard in the zoning code, uh -huh. uh, if you go to the very end of that section where uh, it says yard requirements for corner lots, mm -hmm. the very last sentence, the rear lot line shall be designated as the lot line towards which the rear of the principal building is oriented. Oh, and this is oriented so the on existing, Glen Mary? the existing building okay. fronts Glen Mary and the proposed building will front Glen Mary. Okay. Thank you. Additional public comment? Thank you. Rich Booker, Bell Rose Lane. And, and this is in my neighborhood here. I live just around the corner. I'm, I'm also a member of St. Martin's Church. And actually, this is where I was, I was baptized, St. Martin's Church, in 1964. Anybody cares? <laughs> right? But um, this is the first time I'm looking at this plan, but I did get my letter. And I opened it up yesterday, certified letter from the applicant inviting me to come and make comment. So, so here I am. <laughs> okay. Now, my first I, my question is like, is uh, similar to what Susan just said. Why is this permissible right here to have this very small backyard area right here? Isn't that, isn't that too short? Too small? And, and what's, what's, the, what's the zone? So what's the zoning here? Is this R1? And, and why are we able to do this even? I thought this whole neighborhood was R1, which is one acre lots. Um, Rich, the, uh, the zoning is R3 in this area. Okay. This area is zoned R3. Uh, the garage is, is an accessory structure. It is separated from the main building by more than uh, 10 feet. And accessory structures are allowed within 10 feet of the side or rear property lines when they're separated from the main structure. Okay. And uh, Mr. Fiorello is an excellent engineer, and I'm sure that's all complies, but I just am not quite clear on the, on the requirements here. Um, now, is this garage limited in its height? I, I think that you should make a provision that this only be a single story and not a double two story. Is, this, is there any limitation on that? I think under code there is. Yes, I, I believe I. I don't have the code in front of me, but I believe there is a height limitation of 16 feet. Yeah, that's just a one-story garage. And it, it'll be a one-story garage. Can we please have the staff ans answer the code questions just as a from, you know, sure. to keep form correct? <laughs> staff? <laughs> um, Roger, Roger that, that 16 feet you could get. Isn't that two-story? I, I am reading it right now. Give me a second, please. Thank you. <laughs> okay. I can tell you, I know someone who built a two-story garage in the same ancillary structure. What's that? Yes. 
size of the accessory. I think it's okay. Yeah. Can we? Yeah, I don't know if you know them or not. <laughs> it's code. You can do two story. So couldn't would I, I'd recommend that we, we limit this to a one story. I I would I would say also this seems these these are this is is this a uh, was there any zoning that was any waivers or special exceptions or is this permitted under R three? Does it is it is it comply it conforms completely? Completely as far as we know, it, it conforms completely. There's it's, some question about why it didn't meet the size requirements three years ago that we... It, it is permitted under the current zoning, and uh, Section 280.26 of the zoning code is height restriction, and the accessory building is limited to 20 feet in height. 20 feet? 20 feet in height to the midpoint of the roof is the way our building height regulations meet. So it's the average grade around the building to the midpoint of a sloped roof. All right. My view that that the planning commission should specifically limit that. Um, we can't limit that. That's a code. It's existing. My, my view would be to, to ask the applicant to volunteer, voluntarily put a restriction on his property. OK. OK. As far as, as, far as I see on this, they're meeting they're meeting code and um, so what, what we don't other, really have any leverage here what, what other suggestions would you like us to consider um, I would also consider the um, the driveway that's here so here here's the new driveway that's proposed uh, John also referenced the kind of congestion in here this is the driveway to the church here. This is the main driveway, and this is what our main entrance is into the church. You can see the parking area that's right here. So this actually does get quite a bit of use, and there is congestion. There's also another area that's, you know, St. Martin's Church has been there since 1880, and there's a stone wall right here, and it's very difficult for people coming around and making this turn. This is a very small area, and what you see is people will come up the street and they'll pull out and actually lean towards so they can see the cars coming in. King of Pressure Road, cars go very quickly. So there actually is quite a bit of congestion. So look what you have here. Driveway, driveway, um, and then this, this other driveway through the church. And this is utilized quite a bit. I guess, Mike, uh, is this the speed bump? Right? Is that the speed hump right there? Is that shown? Is that what that is? So there's this also a speed hump right there, which huh, it doesn't calm traffic. What it does is it, it makes the landscape trucks, as they fly over it at their same speed, upend the stuff that's in the back of the trucks and make a huge amount of noise. And also they scrape the ground. Any other suggestions? Um, I would also suggest that um, the stormwater actually be looked at carefully. I guess the applicant here, I, there's nobody living in this house. You don't live there right now, right? So this, is, this house has been vacant for some time. And you don't plan on living there. Do you plan on? You kind of said it's going to be your basement you care about. But are you going to, are you going to, you, you want to, you want to move into the neighborhood? I guess, I, you know, I would like to come and welcome you. <laughs> is this really appropriate? You, you could, could, anything else? We, we need to well, wrap it up. Well, I, I think it is appropriate. Listen. I, I, is it's one of the things that Mr. One of the things that Mr. Williams referenced are these rental properties. I, I would like to know. Now think about this. This this property right now is a rental property. This property so that's is not vacant. The, that's not, that's within not the purview, purview of us. We don't tell people who can rent out their houses and who can't. We are only here to see how the township code applies to what they're proposing. And then if we have any creative ideas, like asking them for a voluntary thing, we can, we can certainly do that. But we don't, I mean, anyone who's living in a house can then rent it out. We don't, we can't control that. I, I, I'm not saying that you can't. I'm merely bringing it up. It is a concern of one of the residents who got a letter about this who's within, what's, what's the rule that you have to send a letter? I got a letter to come and, and, and could you, comment. This could you please give us your comments? This I, isn't I, the I, forum. I, and I, I am giving, here's the comment. Three rental properties in a row I think is a concern. I, I would like to know if these are going to be rentals, if that's the plan. And if it's not the plan, I would like to know that as well. 
Well, no, I'm not. I have the, I have the owner right here. But you're speaking to us. You got the forum for that. You should know that. I, I, and it's 1130 at night, and you're really just taking up a lot of time I, I think for I, no I, valid purpose. So will you just make your comments like that are appropriate? Multiple ways. Is it business privilege, real estate, or multiple properties? I'd like to know. Uh, Okay. Peter, uh, we could do uh, some this, help this, here. This, this, this is not a question and answer session. He's not under oath. He's not having to answer your questions. It's, it's a time for the public to make comment to the Planning Commission regarding their concerns. I think, Mr. Booker, you, you, you've made your concerns known to the Planning Commission regarding the rentals. I, I think it's time, to, if you have another issue, to, just to make that you know, concern known. <clears throat> That, that definitely is a concern. Stormwater is also a concern. There is quite a bit of stormwater issues nearby. Now, if you look over, this, this lot travels, it goes downhill right through here. There is a creek that's approximately in this area. And it seems to be, maybe there's a spring or there might be a, a fed by just stormwater, but the creek goes in the property over here. We have a great deal of problems right now with containing the stormwater in this area. There's also an area that's down the road that's uncovered right now, and we get water that goes over top of the, of the driveway. It doesn't, doesn't st uh, of the parking lot. It does not stay within the, the creek area there. So this also would, would uh, exacerbate um, that issue as well. So is, is, uh, am I saying that this is underground stormwater structure right here? Is that what the, that is? And, and, and is that um, a baffled? What kind of system is that? Can you give me any kind of an explanation on that or briefly? Oh, uh, we have. Go ahead, talking, Mike. We have 80 lineal feet of 36-inch fully perforated uh, pipe within a, within a stone bed, uh, promoting uh, groundwater recharge and rate control in accordance with the ordinances. So is this, what's the design? Is that for a five-year storm, a two-year storm? Would you please like direct that? your comments to the board? Uh, Mr. Booker, that's, that's designed in accordance with the Stormwater Management Ordinance of, the, of Radnor Township. So what does the Stormwater Management Ordinance require as far as the storm? Is it a two-year storm is required to design to? It's, it's varied. In, in this instance, do, what, are we, what are we designing? It's, it's varied, and it's designed for different storms under different scenarios. Okay. Um, I think that, that that about covers my, my comments. I, I, again, I think that it's a perfectly legitimate thing to talk, think about how many rental properties we're going to have in the neighborhood. And it is, is an appropriate time to kind of discuss this with people who are here from the neighborhood. And it's, it's not, it doesn't need to be adversarial. And I know we're here late. I'm here late, too. And I, I, I do feel for you. And I, I wish we didn't have to do this. So. Um, uh, those are my comments. Thank you. Okay. What um, concerns does the board have? Two, two quick questions. Um, what are we doing about the sidewalk that is supposed to be required? I uh, spoke to the applicant, or the applicant's engineer this afternoon. And Dave, if you want to address what was decided. The code does require the placement of sidewalks uh, for this subdivision. I hate I'm to just get saying into it's just an there. argument this evening over sidewalks. No. Um, it, sidewalks, it says under Section 51 in the code, refers to sidewalks shall be constructed as required by 27C. But before we even get there, before I even refer to 27C, I don't think there's sidewalks anywhere in this area, so it'd be a sidewalk to nowhere, you know, as far as I know. I don't, there may be some across the street um, where the church is, you know. Um, I don't think there's anything on this side of the street on Glen Mary. I know I'm sure that Rich or someone can answer that. But I don't, you know. I think there's a sidewalk. Yeah, there's no, a sidewalk by St. Mary's. Yeah. yeah. 
Okay, I know there's none on this side, on the other side of the street. And just referring to 27, in, in my 37? impression, I'm sure the, the gentleman across will not agree with me, but um, 27 deals with streets, that's if you're constructing streets. And if you're constructing a street, then it says, you know, you have to put a sidewalk in. That's my view of the code on it. But again, whatever the board decides, we'll live with. We don't think it's necessary. You know, there's no sidewalks on this side of the street. It's really a sidewalk to nowhere. Nick, it's uh, 255.37K applies to this. It says sidewalks will be required in developments of less than 20,000 square feet. Well, it does say developments. So that, that would be, I guess, Roger, I would say this isn't a development. It's one lot. I'll, I'll I, would, I just I'll, didn't know I'll, if you were going to submit for a waiver. That's all. That was my, yeah, you know. Did, um, is there, we, we would request a waiver on it. And then, so the math on the table, Mr. Fiorella, can you just tell me real quick, why does lot one show the math for the reduction of um, area for right-of-way, but lot two does not? Uh, I tried to explain before. Yeah, that's why I'm still trying to get my head around. The deed for the property describes the property from the center of King of Prussia Road, but only to the right of way of Glen Mary. It does not include, it is not titled into Glen Mary, so there's no need to reduce, to subtract the right of way out, because there's no right of way to subtract out. You yeah, know, I see the, the that. The property so line only comes to the right of way line. It is not deeded to the center of the road. Where I it is that. deeded to the center of King of Prussia, since it's deeded to the center of King of Prussia, we subtracted out the King of Prussia road right of way. So where you said that you were providing the 30-foot right of way, what did you mean by that? We have the, there's the existing 30-foot right of way on Glen Mary Road. And we're providing the ultimate right of way line sh shown here as uh, the dashed ultimate right of way line uh, depicted on, as depicted on here. But because it wasn't already existing, you don't have to deduct it from the lot. That's that's, okay. that's I correct. think that that's, that's the correct. difference of what happened three years ago. I think, it I was think that they they took Mr. Malloy took the interpretation that in dedicating that right of way. I don't know if it was Mr. Malloy. Oh no, I, I went through. Notes. Yeah, I, I I went through some of the notes and tried to read that, and I don't know if it was the engineer who prepared the plan or Mr. Malloy. Personally, when I went through it, I didn't understand it either. I had sat down and met with Roger prior to submitting this plan and going through it and make sure that we were on the same page when before we submitted this. So then that's the, that's the difference, is, the, is that you're providing it, but in this case, because it wasn't already existing, you don't have to deduct it, and that's how you're able to stay over the 10,000 square feet for lot two. That's the way I'm And three it. years ago, we got a different interpretation of that, where in deducting that right of way, it brought them below the 10,000 square, uh, 10, square foot lot, and that's why the plan was denied, because we weren't willing to grant that was waiver. Was the plan denied or was it withdrawn? Well, it was withdrawn because we, we, were not, we took a vote and we're not going to grant the waiver. Okay. For, they wanted to provide a 25-foot right away instead because that was going to give them, keep them over the 10,000, and we okay. were going to. I think, yeah. yeah. So okay. That's why. So that's why. All right. Is there any other board comment? Can I have a motion? I move that we grant the waiver. I assume you'll submit it. That we grant the waiver to not provide sidewalks and that we... Uh, approve the plan. I second that. All in favor? I would, be, uh, before uh, you vote, I would approve, amend that to contingent upon uh, uh, yes. addressing the one comment that's in my letter, which is the standard grading permit comment. Uh, contingent upon meeting staff's requirements. Do we want to request? And also, also it says that um, yeah. in um, Amy's uh, memo of January 6th, it says provide dimensions for all radii along the driveway. We can do that. I, I hadn't seen Amy's uh, memo, but we will include them also. Can you second again? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, next on our agenda. This is 613 West Lancaster Avenue.
Yeah, do you have it on? Can you open it up? What should be higher? Okay. Yeah. Okay, this is coming in as a preliminary final land development plan for the um, uh, redevelopment of a restaurant, I believe. Yes, good evening. Thank you very much for staying so late. Uh, it's been a long night. We'll make sure that we move uh, promptly through this. My name is Sean McCluskey. I'm one of the founders of Penn Real Estate Group. Uh, my wife and I founded that company back in 1985. Can, can, can you hear me, by the way? Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Yeah, and we've been active uh, in real estate development, including uh, in Radnor Township. Uh, since 1985, and this evening I'd like to walk you through. I have a PowerPoint slide, a uh, presentation that I could walk you through that will really give you the background information about this project uh, and tell you what we're proposing. It's actually a very simple project. Ultimately, we are uh, improving and renovating an existing building in the township. We're replacing uh, a 3,700 square foot building with a 2,800 square foot building. We're taking a parking lot that has 40 spaces in it and reducing it to 37. Uh, and we are substantially upgrading a, um, uh, a property in the township that's uh, derelict. So if you, uh, I have if this PowerPoint on the uh, screen. We'll show you an aerial just to orient you. I, I suspect everybody here has been in these buildings. Uh, on the right here, you'll see the Bertucci's restaurant. Uh, immediately to the left of it is Curry Spa. And the property that is the subject of the application is uh, what was formerly known as Coos's Corner. It was a bar of ill repute. Uh, it's located here. Uh, it's the, the outlines of the property are white here. It's about a half an acre lot. It has curb cut on Route 30 and has an access driveway that leads out to Old Eagle School Road. This access driveway serves four other adjoining lots. This is like where Capelli's Taylor is and the, uh, the karate studio. And there's actually a total of eight businesses and residences in these four adjoining properties. Uh, those four properties, uh, for the most part, don't have their own parking. And the owners of Coos's had, uh, over the course of time, uh, given oral permission to those parties to use the parking lot that we have. So essentially, this parking lot that's on our lot has been providing historically parking for um, the, this entire. Uh, Could you, excuse me, I'm sorry. Yes. Could you use the mouse? Because yes. the folks at home yes. and us okay. looking at the others, mouse. thank you sure. very much. Okay, uh, where's the cursor? That's really hard to see. Can you, can you see it? Okay, how about I'll just describe it and I won't use the pointer. Would that work? Just so everybody can see the same. Uh, if I... In reference your capital letters on the map. Okay, so capital letters. Um, uh, the subject property is A, B, C, D, and E are the adjoining properties. Uh, the Curry Spa and the Bertucci's are labeled. Okay, so uh, this is a picture of what these properties looked like in 1993 when we started working here. This photo is taken uh, looking east on Lancaster Avenue from right in front of the Coozes. And the building immediately to your left is what used to be known as Eagle Antiques. That's where the spa is today. And the building with the orange and white striped awning in the background was a restaurant called Chattanooga's, which used to be before that the Conestoga Crossing and before that the Conest Ale House, uh, and that is today Bertucci's. On your right, you'll see a Dunkin' Donuts. That's where uh, currently today is Meltdown. I'm bringing up those three buildings because our company redeveloped all three of those, and we're really seeking to redevelop this property to complement the others and upgrade that corner of the town. Uh, this is the Eagle Antiques building prior to uh, our renovations, uh, and this is the Curry Spa. Uh, uh, upon I'm sorry. Its recent rebuilding. We, we know the area. Okay. We don't need to see all the wonderful things you've okay. done. We believe so, you, and we've all appreciated it. We've seen good. it. We've been Thank there. Thank you very much. So we did this. Let's we turned ahead. this lousy thing into, um, well, some Bertucci's. Uh, here's Coos's Corner. Um, I, I will skip reading you the details of the Pennsylvania <laughs> Liquor Control Board violations which relate to uh, lewd conduct and serving alcohol. This is what the Coos's building looks like today from the exterior. 
I'm going to page through these very fairly quickly, but I would like to point out while we're here that you'll see that, that this picture was taken with the Coos's business closed, and yet the parking lot is full of cars because this parking is almost a communal parking lot. Um, and that continues. This is the back of the property. There's an inch, this, is a, this is a photograph of the alley that runs behind the uh, stores leading out to Old Eagle School, uh, subject to one of the comments in the review letter. Uh, and, and this is, I'm going to just flip through these. This is the current interior of the Coos's building. It's a 3,700 square foot building. Uh, it was used uh, upstairs and downstairs for part of the business and the basement. Uh, you'll see it's essentially in shell condition today. Uh, and the purpose of uh, this application is to raise the existing building and replace it with a new one-story uh, 2,800 square foot restaurant, which is just a little bigger than the existing footprint. Uh, the existing footprint's in the 1,881 square feet, I believe, uh, and the proposed is 2,800. So this is a rendering, <coughs> excuse me, of the proposed uh, new building. Uh, we have a, a proposed tenant that we hope will conclude transaction with. It's called Zoe's Kitchen. You may be familiar with them. They're in Bryn Mawr. Um, this is, this is the, uh, the architect's design. And this perspective drawing is shown uh, from Route 30. Uh, and you'll see the person in yellow is walking down a sidewalk. I'll show you that on a side, a side plan, because that sidewalk doesn't exist today. It would be created as part of the redevelopment. Uh, this is uh, elevation more if you were standing in front of Bertucci's in the parking lot looking west. Uh, and this is one if you were standing, say, at Cody Lighting and looking across the street. Okay, we're going to, um, th the existing site plan, I'm just going to very quickly summarize. This lot is a, essentially 100% uh, impervious. It ties into the conversations you were having earlier tonight because when you net out the right-of-way, it's somehow magically only 77% impervious, and yet you can't find a blade of grass on this thing. So um, this, is, this is a close-up. I'd like to direct your attention on this drawing to the two sort of slightly uh, peach-colored lines. One is a sidewalk that exists today in front of Coos's, and the other is the sidewalk that exists in front of the Bertucci's. And uh, one of our goals in this redesign is to create a continuous pedestrian pathway across both of the properties where they don't line up today. Uh, okay, so this is a, uh, let's find a, okay, this is a close up of the proposed site plan. And um, as you will see, uh, this property was originally, uh, you know, is 100% impervious. We are creating um, parking islands where we can and green space where we can. Um, we're going, uh, so there's some green space being created in, in front of the store uh, at each parking lot island in the corner behind the spa. You'll see that we took out one of the park, we're proposing to take out one of the parking spaces on Route 30 uh, so that we can create a safe um, entrance uh, to this facility. So by removing one of the parking spaces, we're able to uh, create that island that you see sort of on the uh, bottom part of the plan to the left. Uh, this protects the parking spaces that currently exist on Route 30 and also makes for a safe entrance uh, in and out of the lot. Currently that entrance does not line up, the sidewalk doesn't line up, and this configuration changes that. We're reducing the number of parking spaces from 40 to 37. We're creating a loading zone uh, behind the building, um, and we're, re we're improving circulation substantially here. We're creating a 22-foot lane that goes through the lot, um, and by creating spaces on the back of the spa, um, those spaces can access off a 22-foot lane, which is code. Currently, um, uh, the, the current dimensions on this parking lot do not, for the most part, meet code. Um, you'll see from that first aerial I showed and some of the photographs that's, in fact, all these spaces being used um, and they function. They do not uh, meet the code. We're seeking to essentially maintain uh, the existing nonconformities and, in most cases, um, in nearly every case, decrease the nonconformities a little bit uh, improving the situation, but still not, not to code. Uh, okay, that's a pretty fast presentation, but that's, that's the gist of it. One of the nonconformities that you're going to continue is a matter of my interest. Uh, what what nonconformities do you plan to continue? You say you're going to, okay, yes, they're going to get uh, better, but they're not going to be perfect? Yes. They're, so, they're, uh, uh, most of them are listed in my review letter. 
Do you want to go through your review letter? Is that what we should do next, Julia? Um, well, does anybody have any questions on the review letter? We'll ask Roger. Roger, did you, is there anything particular you wanted to bring to our attention? Uh, the major item is that they uh, initially were not uh, addressing stormwater on the site. Uh, we've discussed with the applicant. Uh, our interpretation of the code is that there's a reconstruction of the building and they need to address the, the at least addressing the stormwater of the proposed building. And they can follow up, I believe, with what they intend to do. Um, you developed the, you said the property next door? Yes. The salon and Bertucci's. Do you own those? Our, our firm owns them. Yes. Your can we get this down to one driveway? No. Why not? Uh, well, there's multiple reasons. Let's start with this. Uh, if I can get back to the very beginning of this presentation, I'd like to show you that original aerial. Uh, when we started here, we had three curb cuts. We had one for the spa, we had one for Bertucci's. Uh, and um, we didn't have this property. But there was originally uh, three curb cuts on here, and you'll see that what we did is we consolidated two into one with the Curry and the Bertucci's. And I will tell you that everybody I've ever met that's discussed this topic thinks it was a big mistake. The traffic movements have never been as good as they were originally. Um, and one of the primary motivators, I haven't really gotten to our motivations for this, but why are we doing this? I'll tell you now. This is not an economic development project for our company. We do not make money on this deal. We're doing this to improve traffic safety, keep cars off Route 30, get the cars out to Old Eagle School Road, uh, improve the parking, improve the cross access between these lots. There's no way that we're going to um, make that mistake again. So, you know, if you look at this, this, <laughs> This is maybe one of the worst properties in the town. It's completely blighted. And um, if, if you knew the owners of that property, or if you knew the process, you know, they wanted a fortune for this, and it didn't work. And the property is now sat, sat vacant for about a decade. I think um, our motivations for this work were such that um, the improvements we were seeking to make, we would never make if we did not have the investments in the community, if we didn't live here, my wife and I and our three children. We live about a mile and a quarter from this site. And if you looked at what was happening at this property and to look at the history of what was going on there, none of, us, none of us wanted that in our community. So, you know, the goal here, we're spending a tremendous amount of money. We're going to get a reasonably small, small amount of rent from the smallest possible building that we could put on here to justify this development. And we're still subsidizing it. So um, the goal is to improve the traffic and safety. This gets cars off of Route 30 gets cars in and out of the Petucci's and in and out of the spa, which is a terrible, terrible design. We felt that we were stuck with that design in the beginning. So um, if we cannot improve uh, the ingress and egress uh, on this piece, which we're proposing to do, we think we'll be failing to achieve one of the primary objectives. I have a question for you. Um, over here, Elizabeth. Uh, when you are saying to improve the traffic, I, I actually use the, those the Capelli Taylors regularly. Great. So I'm in that parking lot and trying to get out. And I've tried the spaces and the parking lot. And I found that the parking lot's better because people won't let you back out on Route 30. And I'd love to see something happen to that corner piece because you're right, it's in shambles. But I even have problems getting out on the back side there because I can't make a left hand turn on to the on, on to Old Eagle School Road. I have to turn right, drive down a few residences or driveways and then turn left into a, somebody's either driveway or parking lot back up and then come back to the intersection. Do you, so how do you, what kind of improvements do you think uh, this will be? Uh, understood. So, so, so working backwards, I would assume that uh, if you were looking, you know, previously, if you were looking to make a right from say the spa or the Bertucci's, um, or, or left, you would have had the, we would have also had difficulties there. So what, one of the things that occurred along the way is that the Coos's uh, operator concluded it would be a good idea to put a curb between these two lots, um, which really curtailed the traffic flow there. So we removed the curb uh, when we purchased when we purchased this property, which has improved the traffic flow some. I don't disagree with you that movements on Old Eagle School are difficult, but the, the left-hand turn onto Old Eagle School might be easier than the left-hand turn from um, the driveways on Route 30. So you can go, if you're in that parking lot, you can come up to Bertucci's entrance just to get a little further distance from the stoplight and you can get out there. Exactly. 
Um, could you put the plan back up? Plan? So, so the improvement coming from the tailors, per se, is that you can now go exit, go past Curry and out Bertucci's and try to make a left there. It's really a difficult situation all around just to go east from any of those locations, right? We agree. So um, I think it, from what I'm seeing, it's an improvement. It's not ideal, but I don't, I don't really have a recommendation for anything better. Yeah, we've given, we've given a lot of thought to trying to work with this. It's, it's quite constrained. This lot's only a half an acre. Um, and, you know, all the various property. If you, if you look at this, there's uh, 11 businesses all together located and operating here on something less than two acres of land with a relatively unusual configuration. But, you know, if it, our company is essentially over-invested in, the, in these properties. We've really done first-class uh, renovations and restorations of these buildings, particularly if you look back uh, early, early in the day, we've won Radnor Design Review Board uh, um, awards for these projects, and you did, know, did we, you, we are um, committed to making good. Have you, um, obviously, you've had a chance to look at Roger's comments. Did you yes. have any, are you going to agree with those? Is there any issues there? I think we're in good shape. I think the primary issue with Roger's comments was stormwater management, and our engineer and Roger have agreed to work out a uh, infiltration system in a parking lot. We don't have, have existing non-conformities on the size of the parking spaces and on the aisle widths, as Roger points out. And actually, we're, to some extent, decreasing those non-conformities. We're not increasing them, but we're requesting either, I don't know if, if a waiver was requested on it, but we're requesting that uh, they continue uh, as they currently exist on the property. The, um, uh, can I just address uh, that point? Um, it's it's my opinion where they if they are you know as to the uh, parking lot the spaces that they're taking out for or repaving I don't believe okay to continue as a non as a nonconformity um, and as to all the saldo requirements they're not meeting they definitely have to ask for a waiver to each and every one of those I think Roger listed those saldo requirements in his letter. Uh, in his review letter where he kind of says that they're uh, nonconformities and the applicant wishes to continue them. Uh, you can't have a nonconformity under a saldo requirement. You only can have a nonconformity to a zoning requirement. Um, so they need to ask for waivers to each of those requirements. And as to the zoning requirements regarding parking space sizes, where they're, you know, taking out those spaces and repaving and repainting, um, it's my opinion um, that I think you know, that, that action is going to lo lose them that particular nonconformity. Um, I don't necessarily agree with Peter on that, but certainly we can ask for waivers on it. But um, it's a lot of things. It's the size of the parking spaces. It's the aisle width. It's the, um, the, the handicap so, spaces. Mm -hmm. I mean, and, and you're saying the problem here is, you know, getting in and out of there and by making everything smaller. We're not making them smaller, it's existing. Yeah, well, maybe, yeah this, we're not making anything smaller. This, this By leaving everything non-conforming and smaller than we would normally we're, recommend, we're actually, I think it makes it harder to move around. We're reducing the non-conformities. This, this layout you see, the dimensions are better than what exists out there today. I, I, These aren't built things. These are parking spaces. It's not a situation where you have a non-conforming building and you're allowed to keep it because it's non-conforming. You're going to paint the parking spaces. so. Right. I, yeah. I, I, am, I am asking the members of the commission to really step back and move perhaps outside of the ordinance and look at this holistically. This is a situation in the township where you have, we are providing parking to business owners who are contiguous to our lot. We do not own their buildings. They're not tenants of ours. They do not pay any revenue to us. And this is an existing condition that's been this way for 40 or more years. All we're seeking to do is improve the building we're putting up a building that's smaller than the existing building. We are bringing as many things into compliance as we possibly can in this. And if you go for a compliant parking plan, you're going to wind up with about 20 some, 20 some parking spaces. And what's that going to do to the business community in that location? 
Well, that's what I was actually going to ask you is how many seats were in this restaurant because it, it occurred to me that it's way more parking than you need for your restaurant. So this is a situation where without increasing impervious, and in fact, I guess you're decreasing it because you're adding some We green, are decreasing yeah, impervious, yes. Without increasing impervious, which is impossible. Well, they're decreasing it, right. They are providing sufficient parking for their restaurant needs. And I guess, to some extent, providing a service to adjacent properties. adjacent properties. But I guess the one question I have about that is, are they, is Bertucci's benefiting from this? Is the spa benefiting from this? Or is it the? Yeah, the yeah, yes, the, the, the answer is that what we're trying to head off are these sort of internecine wars about parking spaces. So it, you know, our, our experience is that um, whenever a merchant believes they don't have enough parking, they believe the solution is to put up a no parking sign. But since that doesn't actually create any more parking spaces, it doesn't really solve the problems. And all you wind up with are unhappy customers that are getting towed. So we are not proposing to um, limit the parking. There is a direct connection between this lot and the Bertucci's lot and the spa lot and Capelli's lot and everybody else's lot. And we're going to have this parking lot open and we're, really it's our intention to only be enforcing this lot at, uh, in terms of towing in the event that something becomes a, an egregious violation and prevents the lot from functioning for the purposes intended. Otherwise, we're envisioning trying to essentially create a communal parking lot that is serving all the businesses. All right, so I'm going to walk away from that for a second because the other thing that I noticed on the back plan is that the lighting that you're either new lighting or existing lighting that you're proposing to provide seems to be spilling over into the properties behind you. Are those all residential behind? Uh, yeah, they're townhomes there. Uh, correct. So do we have I don't a, know if you can see. Um, do we have a lighting standard about that, Peter or Kevin or, or, or um, Roger? The standards uh, for zoning ordinance provisions such as this fall under the nuisance standards, and there's no specific light requirement. It is very subjective, um, and we, in essence, will respond to a complaint, uh, look at it, use my best judgment, and generally notify a property owner to come into compliance. Um, but okay. there's not specific light standard um, foot candle measurements. It's more um, something that creates a hazard or is objectionable in the surrounding area. So I, I guess the one that I would ask you about is the one that is on the um, north, the, the furthest northwest. Yes, understood. If you could try to do, I mean, I understand if you so, want to spill light onto your own other commercial properties, well, but the one that in particular seems to be spilling onto the residential, like they probably already get enough light pollution. Let's well, try to I'm, not make it worse. I'm, I'm very glad you brought that up. So that particular light you're referring to is a Pico light on a Pico pole. Uh, oh, that, then you can't do it. That exists today. The, the other three, which are, are proposed, are, are new. But my suggestion would be, since you have raised this topic, and I think you have a good one, that we um, replace the Pico pole with a private pole in that location that has less light spill. I think it's a good suggestion. Is that something that can happen? Sure. Okay. Um, all right. You can, also, you can also put shields around it to, to direct light. I mean, yes. I sort of used to do that. Yeah. Any other board comment? I'm not sure Amy? if you received my review letter. I know it came in rather late, and I believe it was sent out to everybody yesterday. Give me the highlights, just in case I didn't read it. I think it's on, it was on our desk tonight. I thought. Uh, some of the highlights? <laughs> the whole thing is delightful. I mean, Oh, excellent. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think... Um, one of the things that I think was already discussed oh, was the diagonal parking on Lancaster Avenue, and I don't know if that's something that you would be able to help out with, but um, having that backing up into the traffic as it heads westbound on Lancaster Avenue, I think is not the best situation. And I think that if, if we need the parking, maybe we could go to a parallel parking in there where, because there, it looks like there's about 16 feet between the travel lane and the curb, it would give you the opportunity to pull in at the eight feet adjacent to the um, parallel facilities, and I see somebody coming up, so it looks like it may not be <laughs> it's something that can be done. It was a suggestion. Right. So, so there's 11 parking spaces um, on Route 30 today. Uh, we're proposing to remove one of them to create 
you know, the safe entrance, uh, and that creates a curb that does, in fact, protect the side of the, uh, the remaining 10. Not but when I they're maneuvering in and out of the spaces. I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I quite understand, but just to continue, if you'll see the plan, about five or six of those spaces are in front of our lot, and the rest are in front of lots that are owned I, by our neighbors. I know. I do understand what you're saying. Okay. What I'm saying is, it sounds like you're concerned about safety, and one of my concerns would be that uh, motorists are backing up into moving traffic in a very congested area. And I'm asking. I was just. It was a suggestion and something that I would recommend discussing. I, if, if we had parking spaces to spare, those would be the first we would take out. But I don't think there are parking spaces to spare in this area. And I look at downtown Wayne, you know, right at uh, you know, North Wayne Avenue and the spaces in front of Wayne Sporting Goods, and those are perpendicular, uh, pulling out into Route 30, and it's maybe one of the most successful locations for merchants in the town. Okay, I'm just, this is something that I think is a safety issue. Right, we're, we're trying to, we, all, we are in fact improving it, but I don't think that we can completely eliminate it. Kevin, Peter, Roger, what are, you, what are your feelings about the parking lot, the, the size of the stalls, balancing out, you know, the, the, what this lot is providing for more than just this particular property owner versus it's not a conform, you know, they're not conforming standards? I think you have a, a site that uh, something needs to happen with. Um, there's only so much room on there um, that then draws into question, are they doing too much? Um, from what I saw, it seemed like it was a reasonable proposal. Um, you try to make the best of the situation that you're dealt with and you know, ultimately, I think relief is gonna be needed in order to move in that direction. I guess the one thing I'm wondering about it is, it, um, are you maintaining the configuration of the lot because you don't want to lose the existing nonconformity of the size of the lots. Would you, if, if we had, this, this, was some, this is somewhat similar, actually, to the micro center, St. David's uh, KMO plan, in that there were some existing nonconforming uh, parking stalls there, and they came in with the bank development. And what were we gonna have them do about the existing, the existing nonconforming sizes, and there was a whole, prior court case. The point of the story was, I think we actually ended up letting them move the non-conforming parking space sizes to a spot that made more sense um, for the betterment of the overall project. And I don't know if that's why you've kept the configuration of this lot this way. Uh, we, did, we didn't quite have enough flexibility to even pursue it that way. If you look at this aerial, this aerial was taken in 2010 or 2011 in the spring, and the significance of that date is that Coos's has been closed. So the cars that are parked in that lot you'll, are, are, are really from, from users other than the property that we're redeveloping. And if you see how they're laid out, they're parked on the existing striping. And it's not perfect, but it works. There's There's the three parking rows being utilized as striped, as they have been striped for well, so long as I know. Um, the, the challenge would be we, we, we have improved the size of these spaces a little bit, and some of them were down as low as 15 feet three long, and I think our plan shows them up to 17 feet, if I'm not mistaken, and that was by just you know shaving a little here and, and pushing a little bit there, but we're kind of out of room to do that. And if you try to go any larger, you have to take out an entire row. That that's really would be the loss of an entire row of parking. So if you lose uh, you know eight or nine spaces out of a lot that has 37, uh, it's, four, it's a lot. Yeah, it's 40 today. We're taking out three. The bar operated. It didn't even have a loading zone. We're creating a loading zone in, in, in the rear as well. Um, you know, we, we've really given a lot of thought to this. Um, even those five spaces behind the spa, we, those were put in so that we could reduce the length of the non-conforming aisles. And, you know, it, that reduced uh, two or three off the length of those that are currently, I think, 13 today, and we got them down to eight and nine. Um, okay. uh, we've, I've had this plan on my desk. Okay. Our architect's had it on his desk. I'm going to ask for a motion in 30 seconds. Does anybody have anything they have to know before that? <laughs> Has there been any discussion with PennDOT about this driveway access? Um, have we talked to them yet? 
We, we know we need to talk to them. I'm just going to find out if we have spoken to them. Yeah, we, we spoke to them a long time ago, but we'll come back. Yeah. All right. We Rob Lambert, uh, civil engineer. Um, we, we spoke to them a long time ago uh, about various configurations. We haven't formally gone to them. We know that that's going to be required as part of this process. Julia, there, there, from a time standpoint, there is no requirement that you reach a decision tonight. No, but there's a requirement that we finish the meeting because I'm tired. Yes, I know, <laughs> I know okay. that, but you, you don't feel... You, you, this is not a case where... This is not an emergency, you, yes. You have to Understand. reach a decision tonight. So, my own comment is I don't see why we wouldn't allow them to have somewhat smaller parking spaces if it, if it, if it facilitates overall project. My, my request to the board would be if you're okay with the 17 foot spots behind the spa, I'd like to see that one aisle width get closer to 22 if possible. And those spots are. 1767, 17, 8. Um, maybe go for a consistent 17 foot spot and you gain a foot and a half because the aisle width is much more important than the length of the spot. That's what gets people in and out of the spots and can reduce accidents. Agreed. I don't see those Okay. Well, my feeling is that. Uh, this is an <clears throat> excuse me. This is an example of uh, not letting the uh, the perfect stand in the way of the good. It'd be nice if we uh, <laughs> could uh, have everything done ex according to code, and if there's no legal impediments, and they uh, file the appropriate waivers, I I think we should allow it to go forward. I think he's doing a wonderful thing by letting his the tenants next to him or the owners next to him use that parking space. And I mean, I know that I wouldn't be able to frequent the tailor without that parking space and he would lose my business. So I think it's, I think we should consider that. My only concern is that there are a lot of little things here and waivers you need to ask for. And, you know, Steve's comment about the width of the aisles. Um, yeah, so I, I would rather see, um, you lose one or two more spots if needed for safety purposes. If it makes it a safer parking lot and a little more difficult to get a spot in, um, you know what I'm saying? Like if, if just moving one more parking spot makes right. opens it up for safer travel. Right, I, I, we, we concur with you completely. So we did, you know, we, we, we lost the one on Route 30 to try to make that safer. We lost one at the entrance to make the entrance uh, wider. Uh, we've lost two others in the lot for for access configurations at this point I don't know that there's a if there was one we could take out that would make it better I think we would do that that's fine but I'm not sure what it what it would look like uh, can, can I make a suggestion please do why doesn't the applicant what, revise the plans to try to address as many of the comments raised by Amy and Roger and resubmit those and have the Planning Commission looked at the re resubmitted plans at the February meeting. Um, also maybe address Steve's comments on increasing the aisle width. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, we should have a much shorter meeting in February and you, get, you can give okay. a, a recommendation then. All right. I so think somebody that we are going to be table? very friendly about it. I mean, yes. I, I think we're really very close and I-, I, I But we I, can't I, rush, we have to- it is final, and and really, yeah. but, and I'm usually the toughest critic up here. Ask Nick, so and I and I really appreciate how you've how you've worked this to to try to benefit yourself, but but the neighbors as well. Can I get a motion to table? Motion to table. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Thank you very much for staying late. Thank, Thank you. you. Motion to adjourn. Second. What? Yeah. So can we please put him first on the February agenda? Um, we are adjourned. No, you're not. We're, we're not adjourned. You still have one more item. Yeah, we're not doing it. Okay. He's oh, okay. That, that, is, that is your option. Um, it would go to zoning without your opinion. When does it go to zoning? On the 16th, I believe. Okay, we're going to look at it on the 13th when we have our meeting. 14th. With the first item on our meeting. Thank you. Good night.